the pre-intern training program. Uh, so today we have organized session uh, medicine. So we line the topic that is very important. So consultant, a physician, a teaching hospital, Karapitya, is a president of the college. Will uh, address the gathering, so we'll play. Uh, so it's on, uh, joined on the Zoom, but uh, have sent the video to play. So we will play that uh, message for you, right? You all couldn't hear, is it? Uh, so let me play it again.
Thank you, Roshan. Good morning all, to all of you. Dr. G. Vijay Surya, Deputy Director General of uh, Medical Services. Um, Dr. Ayantika Naratna, Director Medical Services. Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra, Immediate Past President of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. My dear SLC members who are joining as the faculty today and my dear pre-intern medical doctors. You all are very welcome for this teaching program co-organized by Ministry of Health and Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. In fact, if you, you all know that the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine have been running a series of lectures called Future the, right throughout this year to help medical students to become competent, confident and compassionate medical professionals. So those medical students are now at their doorstep to become such a person, such an intermedical officer. So I believe this program today would further strengthen their uh, clinical excellence and their attitudes to become such a medical professional. I would like to thank immensely Dr. G. Vijay Surya and Dr. Antika Naratna and Dr. Roshan for arranging all these teaching programs for these pre intern medical officers from the Ministry of, side of the Ministry of Health. And special appreciation goes to Dr. Tushara Mathias, a senior lecturer in medicine and our own council, medicine, council member, who is passionately leading this training program from the college perspective. And I should sincerely appreciate the time and commitment of our SLC members uh, who are joining today as the faculty. In par with our theme of the year, enhancing clinical excellence, capacity building, and human care. All the very best. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> there was a small uh, issue, but bear with us. Uh, so that was Dr. Kanaka Senaratna, consultant physician and the president of College of Internal Medicine, uh, delivering this message. So actually, we can start the ses session uh, in the sense uh, lecture series. Uh, I would coordinate invite uh, Dr. Madhuvanti Tiarachi, consultant physician to start the lecture on uh, topic of poisoning. Madam is online. Uh, Madam, can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Give me a minute. I uh, hope you all can hear me. Yes, Madam, can see. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning uh, to you all. Uh, I'll uh, start my talk uh, with uh, how to approach a patient with poisoning. Actually, on day-to-day -day practices, we are seeing uh, many patients with poisoning, and uh, it's very important to deal with these patients, uh, thinking about the timeline and um, the initial uh, resuscitation is very important when you are dealing a patient with poisoning that saves a patient's life. So without further ado, let me start with a case scenario. So I'm going to talk about a patient, a 45-year-old farmer who has been admitted to your unit with a history of uh, the patient was found unconscious in the field, which has happened about one hour back. Now, he can treat illness, but relatives are unknown about the medicines. Now, how are you going to approach this patient? Uh, definitely to uh, apply the ADE approach. How way you check whether there are session, uh, say adequate lung uh, movements are there, and uh, look for such and see whether the pulse is adequate. Uh, the rate is adequate, the volume is adequate, and see whether there's any life-threatening bleeding. 
Now, when you move on to the disability, where you assess your uh, Glasgow Coma Scale and have a look at the pupil size and check for the RBS, and then use any injuries and uh, take precautions to avoid the patient having hypothermia. So you assess all this. Can you all hear me? Yes, madam, your slides went off. <laughs> madam, I'm going to off, switch off your... Uh... Video, yeah. Now, uh, all right, so it's better now. So I'll, I'll stop my video. Yeah, now, uh, the, now let us assess the ABCD of this patient. Um, uh, what happens is when you uh, check the airways. Uh, it's not patent. There are a lot of secretions there, and the saturation is 91% on room air with a respiratory rate of 10 per minute. The examination lungs reveal there are a lot of uh, VCN bilateral palpitations, and the pulse is about 50 with a blood pressure of 80 by 60. His GC uh, is 5 out of 15. Now, pupils are 1 millimeter in size. They are small, and the CBS is actually fairly okay. But he sweats with the, it's difficult to elicit other uh, uh, logical functions. And there were no obvious bite marks, and the, uh, there's no evidence of bleeding also. So, what are the uh, evidences? The, uh, differential diagnosis that you would like to consider in this sort of pain. There are uh, differential diagnosis such as spontane hemorrhage, can be a lithium overdose also, OP poisoning, create bite or post ictus state of epilepsy in the small depressed respiration. Yeah, but the other things are a little difficult to uh, sort of extension and the rest of the things it's difficult. So, There are small pupils. Um, sorry, there are small pupils, bradycardia, hypotension, crackles, and uh, visas in the lungs with depressed uh, respiration and excessive sweating. So, in this case, you know the organophosphate ingestion is a possibility. And the create bite is also a possibility in this sort of a scenario, but you can only explain the respiratory depression at this moment. Uh, with the, the, the clinical symptoms and signs that you have got. The post ictal stage of epilepsy is actually, you again can explain the uh, uh, crackles um, uh, in case of aspiration, but uh, not the other things. So, so you treat the uh, sort of... Uh, so you're... Answers, uh, uh, diagnosis is organophosphate ingestion. So, what is the next step in the immediate management? Would you do the induction committee? Would you go for the gastric lavage or give activated or atropine or pyridoxamine uh, therapy? Now, you have to uh, whether to induce vomiting or not, you need to uh, think. Never in any patient of toxicological uh, case, okay? So you should never induce vomiting, uh, you know, decontamination that has to be a gastric. Gastric lavage is important, but here in this particular patient, because there are a lot of secretions and all, you might have to consider the antidote and intubation before you consider the gastric lavage. You know, the GCC is 5 out of 15. So in any toxicology patient, especially if the patient's GCS is less than 10, you should uh, um, uh, electively intubate these patients because they can uh, get into aspiration and a lot of problems if you keep on resuscitation with a low GCS. Okay, so then what about the uh, activated charcoal? It's important, uh, but then you have to again consider after the antidote because in here it's very important to give atropine. I will, I will explain to you why. Now, atropine IV is the correct answer. So it's a life-saving measure. 
because there's a bradycardia and there's a lot of secretion. So even to put a, put a ET tube, you need to get, uh, get the secretions out of your way. So giving atropine is the first choice in this organophosphate poisoning patient. So the PAM is again, you can uh, try and once the life-saving measures are com uh, completed. So the, what are the indications to start atropine? You can uh, start uh, atropine if the systolic blood pressure is uh, less than 80, pulse rate is less than 80. There are visas and crackers on auscultation. There are small pupils and excessive sweating in the axilla. So in this patient, we are having all the things, but uh, having said these things, all the things are not, not necessary. If there's a clear indication, the patient has taken OP and then uh, you have got these, uh, one of these signs that would be enough to, uh, for you to start the patient on atropine. So how are we going to administer atropine? Uh, it's uh, one mile is about point six milligrams. So uh, you might have to start with three to five, five vials, depending on the clinical situation of the patient. If the patient does not have many clinical symptoms or signs, you might start the patient on a smaller dose or else if the patient is, has taken a large amount, then you decide to start on a bigger dose of atropine. Now uh, you need to double the uh, boluses, four vials, eight vials, 16 vials, checking every five minutes, the patient's vitals until the patient is fully atropinized. So how are you going to elicit full atropinization? You need to listen to the chest, see whether the chest is clear, if the heart rate is more than 80 beats per minute, pupils are no longer pinpoint and there's dry axillary and systolic blood pressure is more than 80 millimeters of mercury. Then again, uh, uh, pupils will take longer time to dilate. So you just take it as pupils no longer pinpoint. And sometimes, um, the clear chest and heart rate is enough to uh, sort of come to an understanding that the patient is atropinized. Now, uh, once atropinization is achieved, please do not stop atropine. Now, why you have to uh, uh, continue as an infusion. So how are we going to determine what, we, what amount to give as an infusion? You calculate what was given as boluses before. Now, say for an instance, you have given 300 milligrams of IV atropine uh, during those, you know, uh, push, push, bol pushing boluses period. So uh, that amount, you take one fifth of that. So that means uh, uh, 60 milligram IC. So 60 milligram you will give every hour as an infusion. So you need to keep reducing the rate every half an hour, depending on three vital parameters, lungs, heart rate, and blood pressure. See, look at those things. And if these things are all right, then you can reduce the Rate. Uh, review the parameters at uh, two minutes for three hours and then six hourly, sorry, hourly for six hours and then three to six hourly for the next 24 to 48 hours. Now, if the atropinization lasts at any point, for, an, for example, bronchospasm has developed, bradycardia has developed, then you need to give a bolus dose until these uh, uh, gain disappear. Now, say the patient has been on 60 milligram per hour infusion, now you have to give another, you know, 100 milligram uh, infusion uh, boluses at the top of it. The patient was already on 60, and because the atropinization lost, you have to you have to give another, so from that, you take another 20 and add to that 60 million infusion for the rest of the period. So that's how you, uh, you know, uh, add the atropine if the atropinization is lost at any point. So while this is happening, you need to intubate the patient and put Hello, the connection is, uh, is, Hello, can you all yes, hear me? Yes, yes, can hear me. Your presentation went off. Ah, oh, yes, okay. Sorry. So there's a connection problem. I can see that's why. So my internet connection is a little unstable here. The signal is a problem. Anyway, now you all can see the screen now, no? Can you all see the screen? Yes, can see, madam. Yeah. Hello. Yes, madam, can see here. Yeah. 
okay now what are the important things to note in uh, in a uh, what are the important things to note in the poison history now these things are uh, very important you have to take the history from relatives or patients because the patient is not in a position to tell whether the patient has taken or he might be not like to tell you also so what you have to do is uh, take a collateral history uh, uh, see uh, see in the past relatives by after uh, patients is taken it because that uh, the rate on the management depends on that and ask for any remaining tablets poisons uh, blister packs and ask for any clinic notes of patients or relatives and get the labels of poisons uh, the patient has taken and with that ask whether the patient has vomited at home and uh, look at the color of the contents and the vomitus of any poison particles or tablets and see whether there's any uh, time lapses for the patient to reach the hospital and what was done at the peripheral hospital if he was transferred from another hospital now please understand when you go and work in the peripheries it's important for you all to attend to these patients if they come within time to do a proper gastric lavage through an ng and do the uh, the initial resuscitation like you know giving a charcoal doing the gastric decontamination that saves a patient's life and please make sure that you note it in the uh, relevant form transfer form also and if you have not done anything please mention the reasons also and send as soon as possible for the tertiary care hospital and uh, sometimes uh, uh, you might have to uh, secure the airway when you're sending the patient please make sure if the gcs is less than five to intubate the patient and send otherwise the patient will die uh, halfway through the transfer procedure okay now this is how you usually uh, approach a suspected poisoning patient uh, when the patient comes to you within one to two hours you can consider gastric lavage but having said that if the patient has consumed large amounts of gases you might have to consider giving gastric lavage even if the patient has come within say six to eight hours sometimes depending on the patient factors the the way the patient uh, empty their gut, um, stomach and all that the, the patient what patient has con, uh, consumed must be uh, remaining in the stomach so you need to uh, give it a try because we have experienced this in uh, our clinical practice and if there's any uh, skin decontamination wash the patient's uh, body and uh, take out the clothes also so i have said this earlier so you have need to con uh, consider gastric lavage and activated charcoal so when the patient uh, comes within first one to two hours of poison, poisoning, the so national guideline has to patient has to be fully conscious. If not fully con conscious, do it only after cup TT tube is inserted, as I said earlier. So before the gastric lavage, you need to take the consent from the patient on the relatives. And uh, uh, if the patient is uh, drowsy, the ET tube, and there's a NG tube 18 gauge or IS tube oral orogastric tube, then you need to measure the distance from uh, mouth to uh, sort of, you know, um, CP sternum area, and then using a mouth cap to prevent patient from biting the tube, you in, uh, insert it. And you need to confirm the correct placement of the tube by aspirating fluid or injecting air with 50 ml syringe while auscultating over the epigastrium. Then uh, uh, you need to siphon off the gastric contents before lavage. Please make sure you do this and collect the first 50 ml of lavage fluid for toxicological analysis or medical legal purposes. Otherwise, you will be in trouble when the JMO comes and asks you what uh, you have, where have the, you have uh, sort of you know collected the first sample because this is important for their purposes can be a homicide even. So you need to do that. And then make sure when you're taking blood, also preserve a sample for toxicological analysis uh, for GMO purposes. And then you uh, take uh, normal saline uh, in repeatedly and then introduce it and take it back. So the each aliquot is about 200 ml for adults. The lavage can be stopped when a total of three liters of lavage will be seen.
things settled and the return is clear. So how are you going to use the activated charcoal within two hours of admission? Up to four hours, you can. Dose is, uh, dose is one gram per kilogram body weight and you dissolve it in 50 gram of activated charcoal in 200 ml of water and get the patient to drink it. If unconscious, secure the airway with a cough DT tube and give via the NG. Uh, so if, you are, if the multiple doses are need to, to be given, you have to give it 50 gram every four hourly. So when uh, gastric lavage is not indicated, where uh, more than two hours have passed since poisoning, except in some cases, as I have told you or earlier. So you need to consider even if it is less, uh, sort of more than two hours, the, uh, the indications I have told you earlier. It's contraindicated when the patient is struggling or very uncooperative and the patients who are at high risk of, very higher risk of aspiration or the, if the patient has taken strong caustics, uh, corrosives and volatile hydrocarbons such as kerosene and turpentine. Uh, so the bedside investigations are very important in every poison patient. ABG is a must. You can take understanding what are the problems the patient is having by doing an ABG. You can do an ECG, see the arrhythmias, RBS, electrolytes, ionized calcium and magnesium. Now, especially these have to uh, give calcium and magnesium. So it is important, have a look at the creatinine, full blood count. Uh, sometimes you need to do the CPK also, liver function test and whooping and DT is also important. Uh, now, in an OP pa uh, poisoning patients, uh, just uh, to refresh your mind, it happens usually between day two and four. It causes neck and proxy proximal limb weakness and they can die from respiratory paralysis. So you need to keep an uh, eye and you need to incubate and ventilate for as the treatment of choice. Now, these patients, these common poisons, uh, antidotes are available, OP, atropine and PAM, carbamate, atropine only. Usually we give paracetamol, n acetine or methionine and uh, benzodiazepine, clumacinil and digoxin, panero, anti-digoxin antibodies. Actually, they are not available in Sri Lanka. Just for your information, this I am telling you. Propanil poisoning, that's why methylene blue. For methanol, ethylene glycol poisoning, that's alcohol and formipisol. Formipisol is not available in Sri Lanka. Calcium channel blockers, calcium gluconate and insulin dextrose infusion you have to use. Beta blockers, glucagon and insulin dextrose you can try. Iron, this for perioxamine and opioids, naloxone. So just go through these things also be familiar with these antidotes. So in the paracetamol poisoning, which is again one of the common um, uh, poisonings in uh, our uh, setup, a uh, single overdose of more than 10 grams that accounts for 200 milligrams per kg can be potentially fatal. Having said that, we actually give the antidote when the patient has taken more than 150 milligram per kg because it is toxic. This is fatal, more than 150 milligram per kg is toxic. So if the levels are available, you can plot it in what you call the rheumatic nomogram. You need to check it after four hours of ingestion. And uh, if, if the, the level is uh, in the toxicity range, you need to consider giving NAC. But if it is in the safe level, uh, you uh, can just watch and see. Uh, but uh, now there are a certain group uh, in toxic in high risk category. You can see the uh, yellow colored uh, you know, area here. So this is, uh, this is where your patients who, has, who are prone alcoholics who are very malnourished, who is having a, uh, as already on uh, liver inducing uh, medication. So all these patients are more at risk uh, for uh, toxicity. So therefore, so even they are in this area, you need to uh, start thinking, uh, giving the antidote. So antidotes are oral methionine, IV oral neck. Um, if the, usually the levels are not available in Sri Lanka, you need to go for 
uh, per dose and body weight. Uh, so uh, whether to give neck or methionine is again controversial, little controversial because there are no head to head trials which have compared neck or methionine. Superior to neck or methionine is not very poor. Methionine can be as effective as neck according to the available researchers, but neck is very expensive, mind you, so it's a clinical decision. If the patient presents within eight hours, you can give methionine. And again, methionine is recommended for asymptomatic patients with a toxic dose. Um, but uh, if the patient has been vomiting, you know, even if the patient has presented within eight hours, the patient is having vomiting, you might not be able to give it orally. So methionine is not recommended to be started later than 10 to 12 hours after the overdose. Or if that's established during where you might have to give uh, IV neck. But having said that, please remember NAC is also very effective if the patient is given NAC within eight hours. So um, NAC is indicated uh, if the patient presents eight hours after the ingestion and has ingested more than the toxic dose when you compare it with your methionine. Uh, if the patient is found to have elevated transaminases so evidence of hepatotoxicity, you need to continue NAC and uh, consider NAC even earlier than eight hours if there's severe vomiting or cannot tolerate methionine, as it's, I have told uh, earlier. So the antidote oral methionine adult and children weighing over 20 kilograms, 2.5 gram initially, followed by three or more doses of 2.5 given four hourly. Children weighing less than 20 kilograms, methionine one gram oral initially, followed by three doses of one gram four hourly. The total dose is four. Uh, if the PCM level is available, you plot it in the normogram. If about treatment, you continue next. If time of ingestion is not known or more than 24 hours gone, give neck if clinically symptomatic only. Check ALT and INR. Continue neck if ALT and INR is increased. If ALT and INR are normal, you can discontinue. Then again, these are you have to uh, discuss with your superiors. So there are two bag methods to give neck. Usually in our uh, setup, we give three bag, but this is the this is what the the newest guideline says because you know uh, we usually give a 50 minutes infusion which is which has proven to be giving a lot of anaphylactoid reactions to avoid that we start with 200 mg per kg which should be given over 4 hours and the second one is 100 mg per kg you have to give it over 16 hour in essence 16 hour infusion so a little bit about the plant poisonings so which one of the poisonous plants is study shown in the photograph? So let's have a quick look at the answers. Is it Kaneri, Deer Kadru, Water Kadru, or Lindo Niangala? So this is actually a plant of Deer Kadru. You have to be familiar with the plants also. So this one, of course, you all know, I think. So what is the, the plant? Kaneru, Deer Kadru, Water Kadru, or Lindo Niangala? It's a plant of uh, Kaneru. So again, Kaneru. Whole bowel irrigation, you need to consider gastric clavage and multiple doses of activated charcoal. Antidigoxin fab, which is the antidote, is not available in Sri Lanka. You need to monitor serum electrolytes for hourly in these patients because hypokalemia is a very fatal uh, problem in digoxin poisoning. And it can cause hyperkalemia as well as hypokalemia due to um, severe vomiting and diarrhea. So you have to balance the potassium level in patients with um, Kaneru poisoning. And uh, cardiac pacing will be needed if second degree to third degree heart block is with unstable BP. If BP is normal, then atropine is not needed unless the pulse rate falls less than 40 per minute, but we'll need continuous CCG monitoring. You know hyperkalemia, if there's any distributional hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia should be corrected because it can worsen the toxic gas, as I said earlier, but do not give calcium gluconate when you give insulin dextrose in a case of hypokalemia because this, this can be uh, dysrhythmias and there can be uh, what you call the stone heart. Okay, So uh, never give calcium gluconate. You usually uh, give hyper, um, in, in a case of hypokalemia, you usually give calcium gluconate, but not in this case. So in summary, uh, first do the ABCD assessment to stabilize the patient. If antidote is available, use it before activated charcoal and gastric lavage. Induction of emesis should not be done. Uh, only in life-threatening conditions, uh, you do the 
uh, gastric lavage when there's sorry uh, you you need to do the gastric lavage when the patient has presented within two hours of ingestion having said that i have told you there are few other uh, indications for gastric lavage even if the patient uh, is presented little late in patients whose airway is secured. So make sure that you have secured the airways, otherwise you'll be doing more harm to the patient than good. So activated charcoal only in selected patients because there's no point of giving activated charcoal uh, if the poison is not kept absorbed by the, um, the charcoal. So it has to be again uh, rationally given. So you have to get your seniors involved early in this sort of patient because it's important to make the patient survive with the correct uh, action of management. Thank you. If there's any uh, uh, questions, please forward it to the chat. I will try to answer. Hello? Yes, madam, yes. Yeah. Sorry. We, uh, we have about 15 minutes extra time. So anyone's having questions, we can use this time to answer those questions. Uh, <clears throat> Everything is understood by them, I suppose. <laughs> yes, madam. <laughs> Anybody else is having any problems? You all can ask, this is the best time because we have got some extra time. Is it because we have started early, no? Yes, madam. We have started uh, 15 minutes earlier. The next speaker is not online still, no? Not yet. Is, is he here? Because you can start it if uh, you know. No questions. Don't know whether they were able to uh, grasp because I was a little quick, you know. I thought that the next speaker might be online. Uh, Roshan, was there any problem with the, the flow? Because, you know, there was a lot of interruptions in between. Eh? Uh, there was a connection issue, madam, I think from, uh, you are connected from where, madam? I'm me, me, making a connection, what do you call this uh, dialogue uh, broadband? My, uh, I'm in the hospital. The, the, actually, it's not good at all. The signals, that must be the reason. Yes, ma'am. There are some uh, band issues, so that's what we have a uh, connection uh, stability problem. There's a one question on the chat box, ma'am. Uh, uh, it's asking why the calcium gluconate is not given in this case. Now, what happens in uh, this uh, hyperkalemia, you usually give to uh, protect the uh, cardiac cells. No? Now, here, uh, the patients can have issues with again uh, the cardiac myocytes, the action potentials of uh, the cardiac myocytes. So the patient will uh, have a, the, there will be asystolase, you know, the patient can uh, develop uh, problems in the, uh, what you call this, uh, due to uh, the calcium influx mechanisms in the heart that the patient can uh, have stone heart, what you call, you can have, you can go and read it. Uh, so there will, be, there will be arrhythmias again due to that. So you shouldn't be now that we usually give it to protect the uh, cardiac myocyte, no? the membranes uh, stability and all, all that. So the membrane stability is a problem. No? It's, a, it's not going to be a problem here, but uh, here that the patient can have uh, what you call uh, the heart stopped in diastole. So there will be a stone heart. Uh, that's why. Somebody is asking, Madam, can you repeat the management when atropinization is lost at any point? Okay. Now, what you have to do is, uh, atropinization is lost at any point, then the, just imagine the patient has uh, was on a 60 milligram per hour infusion. Now, you have atropinized the patient fully, 
and you have started on a 60 milligram per hour infusion. And then at uh, some point, uh, when uh, you see the patient is having a lot of secretions and there are a lot of crackers in the, um, in the lungs. And the, again, there's pericardia. So you might have to push, give some boluses again. So you again, you know, give some boluses as in the first time. And then uh, uh, again, you achieve a trypanization. Now, for that purpose, you have used, say, about, you know, uh, another 100 milligram of uh, uh, atropine. So from that, you take another one-fifth. So from 100, it's 20, you know. So you add that 20 to that 60 milligram. You have already been giving 60, and you have now uh, calculated and added another 20. So you next for the next uh, Hour, you start with an 80 milligram power infusion. Understood? I think that I have explained it. Uh, so, if a patient present with uh, OP poisoning after six hours of poison intake, do we need to take gastric lavage for JMO? Now, uh, if the patient uh, is uh, uh, this has to be done now. Is this a sort of you know problematic thing that you are asking? Uh, what you have to do is, if you are suspecting any homicidal activity, then you need to take the lavage. Put an NG. Anyway, you will be putting an NG, you know, understood? Because uh, you might not be giving the gastric lavage in some situations, but anyway, you need to put an NG in, in this sort of patients because the patient's conscious level is not so good. So when you are giving, uh, you know, put in the NG, so take some. Uh, uh, sample and keep it so it saves your skin. I think I have answered that. Uh, again, uh, anything else? I think that's it. No, madam, Kaneru and uh, some people consume uh, sugar together. Is there a relationship? It's uh, because you know, should they, uh, they take sugar because it's very, very bitter. Okay. Very, very bitter. That's why. So when you take sugar, I think that's that my. Now we have not done any sort of researches on this. Yeah. But what I feel is that the patient is able to swallow the whole whole lot at one gulp with sugar. So the absorption is good. I think that's what I feel. But maybe there are some other reasons. We might have to do some research and say, and see. Very familiar. Very frequent. Had Atropine high doses causes fever. Now, what you call is atropinization. They can have uh, features as suggestive of what you call the now. What we have here is anticholinergic uh, crisis. No? So, when you give more and more atropine, they will have a uh, cholinergic crisis, which, uh, which is actually uh, like, you know, I don't know whether you have heard this uh, hot as a hair. Huh? Blind as a bat. Have you all heard ab about it? I'm not sure whether you have heard. Probably you might have heard it in your, you know, first year or second year. Hmm? So that uh, there's a, there's some mnemonic also. Right? Blind as a bat, hot as a hair, dry as a bone. I mean, everything is like you know the secretions have dried out. Now when the patient is atropinized, they will be very uh, restless, very dry. And that's why and very hot. That means the temperature has gone up. So you're right. Uh, the high doses of atropine can cause uh, temperature. So the, the remember the features of cholinergic syndrome uh, from that uh, mnemonic I have told you. You can go and refer that, you know, the whole lot. So that's it. Yeah. Anything else? You, you were asking about something, eh, Roshan? There are a lot of cases on the East Coast and you know, those areas very very frequent cases of canary poisoning, Ampar and all yes. that. Yes. Most of them come with, uh, they consume sugar and canary to, uh, canary to get there. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's, what, that's what we, we thought. Now, when the patient has taken, now this is by clinical experience, when the patient has taken more seeds, more likely to for them to vomit. Another. So that's why they said one, uh, one uh, seed with uh, sugar is enough to kill Kiala. 
That's because the, the absorption is more because you know the, the patient has taken it with the sugar and all sort of you know they might not vomit it all so that some bitter in the they will vomit no so when they when they have taken a lot usually we have experiences they will not get more complication sometimes they do uh, but sometimes one seed is enough to give a lot of problems so that again you can explain by the way i have told you so these actually sort of observations that we have done And I have to tell you about these anaphylactoid reactions in par par uh, paracetamol poisoning. They do get flushing, uh, itching, and uh, increased vomiting. So when you're running the neck infusion, if the patients get these things, you might have to consider whether this is due to anaphylactoid reaction uh, of uh, n acetylcysteine So you might have to stop the infusion for a small while uh, in this scenario and then uh, give some you know pre uh, antihistamines and some uh, medications to settle this and restart the uh, neck infusion again sometimes you might have to now if the patient say that for an example if the patient has uh, uh, sort of uh, we, have, we haven't started the patient on uh, neck because the patient was asymptomatic and the level is low all right sometimes that it also happens now, level is low, patients toxic uh, dose according to the body weight is 100, less than 150 milligrams per kilogram body weight. But uh, when you repeat the uh, liver function test that you have noted, it has gone up, gone up and the IN is, INR is more than 1.3. So in that situation, you might have to start the patient on a neck infusion. Uh, maintenance infusion again maintenance infusion is 100 milligrams per kilogram body weight Madam, what is the earliest uh, indicator to go to go with inr or uh, proton meantime inr inr proton mean it's the same no yeah okay some yeah. but the other thing is uh, some countries now uh, normally we prescribe panadol every six hourly so yeah. Like with four doses, so can you take four doses in a shorter uh, short interval within twenty four hours? Like, not no, not six hourly, but three hourly, but number of doses per day is four. Can you do that? I think so because uh, it's it, the total dose is not more than the toxic dose. That's fine, no? Yeah. Yeah, they, they have actually given that, I think. Uh, that should be all right. Now, there's another question. Hey, please explain us what is the rationale behind avoiding induction of MECC in poisoning. Now, because there are, uh, there are instances where you have, you know, done more harm by doing, inducing MECC than good. Now, the thing is, when you induce vomiting, there can be, now, you don't know, there can be multiple, medi uh, the, uh, multiple toxic agents the patient has consumed. It can cause now the, if the patient has consumed corrosive with something, uh, you might not know by doing the induction, it might do more uh, harm to the patient. And there can be aspiration also. There's no protection at all. So, and you have put a cuff T ED tube or a NG tube, at least there's some protection. All right. Do you have the, the authority over what you are doing? Understood. So that's why we said to never induce vomiting. And I've seen actually, I've told you several times the peripheral hospital people, they induce vomiting by giving water or whatever so don't do that so put an ng or a orogastric tube and do it safely that's good for the patient but in case of uh, dual poisoning kaneru and uh, kerosene then you have to go with gastric lavage or not uh, that sort of situation you can't you can't do you can't do because the, the it's, in, it's contraindicated now so you shouldn't be doing that. So you might have to go with activated charcoal multiple doses in the, that sort of situation. Because uh, as per the guidelines, the, the benefit of the uh, gastric lavage is within two hours. So I said that, you know, you can consider it even after that in multiple doses, with large doses and uh, extended release tablets. So that's it, you know. So most of the time when the patient comes to the hospital, that one hour has gone. So that's why. I think Saroj sir has joined. Uh, probably he can start the talk now. I will leave it here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, madam. That was uh, Dr. Dr. Madhuvanti Hittiyaraji uh, on the detailed lecture and um, taking the time to ask the questions also. So uh, thank you, madam, once again. Uh, next up is uh, another very important lecture by Professor Saroja Singh, Professor of Medicine from Teaching Hospital Karapitya. Uh, very important topic. Uh, sir, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Yes. Uh, please keep your mics uh, muted. Uh, video section, sir, will give a time to answer your questions. The topic is why humane and kind to your patients. Right. Over to you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, get the slide. I need share of slides, please. Right. Okay. Can you all see the slides? And can yes. you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I'm actually from Colombo. I'm a uh, I'm an emeritus professor. I've retired. So, okay. no, no, no issue. No issue. Yeah. So, um, firstly, I mean, thank you very much once again for inviting me. And uh, the topic I'm going to handle is uh, something slightly different from what others are doing, uh, because I feel quite uh, I, I am a firm firm believer that uh, we have to be competent and kind. It's not competent in technical terms or being kind. Your part of your training is to be kind and competent in your technical aspects. So I think uh, uh, that's the beginning, the first ball of the over. Uh, and uh, we will now go through uh, why it, you should be competent and get some, ex, uh, give you some, uh, sorry, why you should be kind, define what kindness is, a few examples, then try to find why people are unkind and how we can make, become a kinder person. Now, this links with uh, one of the lectures given in, to you all, I think it was uh, through the GMOA. Uh, program on the Vaishnav doctor, right? Let me start to, uh, can I record this? Are you recording this? Yes, sir. We are uh, sharing on the YouTube. So it's like... All right. Okay. Okay. So there. okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is the outline of the presentation. I'm trying to link it with us. Uh, Previous presentation also, so that uh, you get the idea uh, in a in that context. So, being uh, kind or kindness is uh, to be sympathetic, helpful, and wanted wanting to bring relief or happiness to others, and expecting little in return. You're kind to your patients not because you expect uh, something in return from them. They might not even thank you, okay? And uh, even then you do it. And this is a wonderful prof profession where you will be interacting with human beings all the time. And you will, if you get that joy of being happy when another person is relieved of pain or when another person is happy, you're in the correct profession. Okay, you're in the correct profession. And consider yourself as very lucky to be in this profession because this is one, one job where you can help others without ever wanting anything in return. This is not what a person, like an accountant who is handling shares or another engineer who is looking at a machine, right? You'll be interacting with human beings. And if you get that joy, you are in the correct profession. And uh, some of us are still at it, loving every day of our work simply because we, like, we get a pleasure of helping people. It's not just a job. There is something more than a job in this. 
So what do we mean by kind? We've asked this from our patients uh, in a study which, which was done. Uh, these are some of the things they mentioned. So in your speech, if you're a person who listens, if you are a person who takes time to explain, and if you speak in a comforting and kind way, you see, not fast, not in a rough voice, you have to look at it from, you know, you have to introspect, you have to actually see or record sometimes yourself and you will see what you, how rough sometimes we are. When we are stressed, we tend to raise our voice. When we are busy, we speak without looking at the person. When we are busy, we start writing without looking at the person or fire off questions without looking at the person. And patients sense it. They know that you are busy. They know that you are ignoring them. And that's not on. That's not on, right? Even if you have 30 seconds, spend 10 seconds looking at the face, speaking to them nicely, slowly, and then get on with your work. Okay, right. So speech. And they look at your actions. They know. So during your ward rounds, during your ward rounds, the patients see what you're doing. And they form impressions about you, whether you're a kind doctor the way you are dedicated to your job. They see you. Okay? And if they see your dedication and the way you speak to others, your patience, uh, the way you try to help people, not only prescribing and finding out the symptoms and writing the medicines and checking on the urine output. Okay? It's not only that. Just a few questions. How do you feel today? Gathering Did people come from home to see you? The humane part of it. Very important for patients. Because all no one likes to be in hospital. This idea that people come to hospital to spend time or to get a meal. I mean, that must be happening uh, 0.1%. 1, 1 and people remember that 0.1%. No one wants to be in hospital. When they come to hospital, they're frightened because they don't know. When you go close to a patient with a, with a knee hammer, they don't know whether you're trying to hit the knee or use that pointer to poke it somewhere. You see, they won't know. They're absolutely ignorant in a new environment. Okay, so you have to help them. You have to speak to them nicely and explain what's going to happen. So they watch you. And it's your speech and your actions are crucial. And, you know, you will be in a busy place like this. They will see what's happening. When you're talking to one patient, the other one knows what's happening. He, she will be listening to what you say. Okay? So... You have to be aware of that fact also when you're working in a busy ward. Now we will take a small example so that you will, you will uh, understand this in depth. I want you to read this, please. Right, so you're doing a ward round, and from the patient's perspective, right, see that son is with the mother, anxious to find out. And he asks Dr. Amata Kohomad, How is my mother? And the junior doctor, hopefully, not one of you, 
He rudely replied without looking at the face. Dang ho dai. Without looking at the face, just answered that and went off. And the you know, mother asks, the mother asks the child, you know, what, what did that doctor say? So now this it might be a very simple episode, but uh, for the patient and for that son, it's that's about the mother's life. Okay, so it's very important for that person. Even though for you, it's a ward round, a busy ward round, and you might have been looking after a patient with dengue, and you might have been staying up the whole night. Right? That's from your point of view. But from the patient's point of view, I am ill. I want to know what's happening. And it's important that each patient is treated like a human being, like a person. And you spend a bit of time. So even though you are having to say this, you have to train yourself. Look at the face. Instead of saying, Dang hondai, you can say it in a nicer way. Were you worried about that? Now, did I take much time? No. Right? With, I might have taken 20 seconds extra, extra. Okay? But I have conveyed what I have to convey even though I was busy. Right? And that's part of your training. Another example. Now, unfortunately, these are real life examples. Imagine a mother who has been struggling. She's a single mother, no husband to help her, working in day in, day out in a garment factory, and didn't get leave because they didn't give leave, and had to wait until the night, in the night. The daughter develops a fit, takes out the bit of money she has, gets into a three-wheeler and comes to the hospital in desperation because now the girl is having a fit. And the response you get is, why did you delay? I Okay, now imagine yourself in that mother's shoes. Okay. What the question you ask, why did you delay, is reasonable. She would have died in a few minutes. That is also true. Right? But you don't say that to your, that mother. You don't say that to your mother. Don't worry about why did she delay and blah, blah. No point. You have to help that child at that time. You have to control your own emotions. You can't respond and hit back. It's again real life story. Wife takes the husband to see an oncologist. She had taken this patient repeatedly to different consultants for three months. And when I saw him from the history and the fact that the basic investigations had been done, I thought a pancreatic cancer has to be ruled out and got a CT done. And she used her money, whatever she had to get that uh, the CT done. It was a pancreatic tumor. Next day itself, she went to see the oncologist. Now, it's not her fault. She, in fact, told me, I went all over trying to find out. And then she started to cry when after meeting the oncologist. Because the oncologist scolded her. Okay, uncalled for. And trying to say that he will die because of your fault. And in fact, actually, just a few weeks ago, he died and she gave me a call. And to tell, she was from far away from Matara side. So, you see, this is why it is important to be kind. Because what you say and do affects the life of a, another human being. So you must control your mouth. You must train yourself to be kind. Even when you are irritated, you don't express your irritation. And you do whatever you can for your patients. 
So it's interesting to find out why doctors are unkind. And there are several reasons for this. And there's a lot of research on this. Why doctors, you know, at the beginning, they are kind. And later on, they become unkind. Medical students at the beginning, they're like this. Very happy. Filled with love. Right? Goes through medical school. Some medical schools are like this, okay, with, uh, with very strict staff who try to instill certain things in you. And I can assure you, you can get brainwashed. Don't allow them to brainwash you. Do not allow them to brainwash you. And when you, are, when you come out of the medical school, you have become a technical expert. And you are not, you have become less humane. You begin to look at your, some of the uh, role models you have and you start to worship money. And you start to do prior practice even during student days and during internship, which is illegal. No question about it. No compromises. That is illegal. Doctors who employ you are aiding and abetting an illegal act because you are not trained. You are not trained to practice and to practice your skills on patients. Okay? So there's no compromise on that. So we see this decline in empathy or kindness especially after the third year, right? When you start working in the hospitals, you start to lose your human. You are so human, but in medical school also you lose. And they say that anatomy dissections is one thing which actually makes you less human. There is some data on that. But later on, you start to lose more and more um, your human qualities. And at when you are studying for a postgraduate exam, it's an all-time low. So you don't mind waking up patients at 10 o'clock in the night just to listen to a good murmur. But you go overseas and everything changes. Because if you're, if you're inhumane overseas, you will be in the next plane back in Sri Lanka. You will be struck off the register and you will be here. So they don't want to take chances. Okay. So overseas, suddenly people become very human, at least act human. On their return, they are tend to come towards the mean, but they are still they learn how to be kind and how important it is. And some of them really change. See, this is not this happens almost unconsciously because of the stressors of studying and the way we teach you and the way we ask questions at exams. So you don't have much control to some extent. You have control, but sometimes it, this can happen to anyone. Okay, But here, once you see a different set of values, a different environment, you tend to change. But some actually, there are a few bad eggs. When they come back, after they land from the plane, at Katunayaka Airport, they come back to their baseline. Very arrogant, a lot of cerebral edema, and then they're very critical about their patients. So this has been shown. This Certainly the first part has been shown. The second part is anecdotes, and we see anecdotal reports of it. And what is important is not to allow this to happen. Right, And the reasons are numerous. And there are studies which have been done. This is one study which was done in the academic medicine, a very prestigious journal. It did a systematic review. And they found that in most medical schools, physiotherapy students, nursing students, there is this decline in empathy, declining in feeling for others. So it's part of the training, the way we train you, unfortunately. And the reasons are many. 
So if you have if you are bullied by seniors, if you don't have support, if you have excess workload, all these make you become less human. When you come, you have idealistic ideas. Oh, I'm going to help. I am going to find the cure for cancer. But reality hits you. You know, you can't do much in this environment. People are mistreating you. You have so much work. And patients come and go like a photograph. They come and then next day they are gone. You don't develop a relationship with them. And then everybody is shouting at the patients. You know, there are a lot of people are shouting and they are getting away with it. So why not me? I'll also shout at them. So all these factors have been identified as to as reasons why people become less kind. But there's one interesting one called empathic distress. You see, these are most of these are not directly under your control. Empathic distress is an empathic distress, interesting neurophysiological basis, because from evolution itself, we have developed what we call mirror neurons. That is, I feel when another person feels pain. When another person is distressed, I feel for that person. It's, it's important uh, evolution-wise because the mother has to feel like that when the child is in distress. That's why you look after the child. So it's, it's hardwired into us. Right? We feel that. And that can be distressing. So this was identified to be due to mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is the neurons mirror some activity even when you're not doing it. So it was first seen with these experimental monkeys in laboratories. You give them a banana, a plantain, and there is some activity, e.g. activity in the brain. The technician takes the banana, still there is similar activity in the brain. So as if there are neurons to mirror what's happening. Okay, so that's the neurophysiological basis of why we feel fathers. Now, if this goes on and on, and on. What happens is you become, it, it's very distressing. So the first death in the ward of a patient under my care, I almost cried. But now I don't cry. I feel, but I don't cry. Right? Because it was at that stage, it was very dis distressing. And that distress you have to recognize that distress. And you should not become insensitive to it. You should not start to react to it. So when a patient is distressed, you don't shut yourself from that distress. You feel for that distress. You share with that person that distress and you try to help the person. Not to just distress and cry with that person. Okay? You try to help that person to overcome the distress. And that's what that's one way of reducing empathic distress. So because we have empathy, we have it because of our mirror neurons. And when we have empathic distress repeatedly, we can, can react. Unless we are careful, unless we are aware of it, we can react. And that's those are some of the examples we see of doctors react. Because they can't handle that distress. They can't handle that distress. So this takes us on why we should be kind. And of course, it's an evil, it's there are so many reasons, right? It's a it's a, there is definite evidence that if you are kind, you will promote rapid recovery, mortality rates are less. And certainly, if you are kind, you will have less burnout you will less be less depressed. You will be happy in your work. Because the moment you become kind, the, the others reciprocate. They are also kind to you. They are kind to you. Okay? So it's important why you should be kind. So first, I define what kindness is, what we mean by kindness and what patients expect. Then I gave you this, uh, this uh, some data on why 
data on how kindness did you, you know people become less kind as they go no? and looked at some reasons and now i'm trying to tell you that there is a it, it, it's important you know we can't allow you to be unkind because it's important in clinical care right uh, it, it uh, patient satisfaction is there patient compliance is better and they recover rapidly so finally how do you become a kinder person? Now, these I told you are areas which are less under your, not so much under your control. Okay. Um, those have to be handled in a different way. Uh, as for role models, there's one thing you, you all are not kindergarten children anymore. Don't follow bad examples, follow good examples. Or oh, there are people who say, oh, we don't have good role models now. So you find good role models. You find the good part of everybody and learn from the good. You are not a zombie or a computer program. You know what is good. You look at the way a peace person is handling, uh, how a consultant is caring and breaking news about a cancer. Learn from that. But if you see a person who is shouting at patients and chasing them from the clinic and throwing BHTs, don't learn from that. Critique on your own. If you can't go and do anything within you, you say, oh, what a fellow that chap is. Why is he behaving like this? If I were, I will never do this. He should have handled it in this way. This is how he should have handled the situation, not throwing a BHT and chasing off patients, right? So that's about role models. But let's look about let's look at empathic distress because you are going to face this. When the first patient under your care dies, right? Most of you will really feel bad. You will feel guilty and you will feel bad. You will start feeling the same way that the relatives are. Relatives are crying and you will also feel, oh, they're crying because they're lost. Their father, what would I feel if my father is, uh, dies? I must, I feel the same way. I would feel the same way and so on. So you have to, to do this, you have to cultivate kindness, right? But you have to also tackle empathic distress, that distress, that distress you feel. Now, this is something which you must you should try to practice. The moment you feel that it's heartbreaking for you, you will realize it, right? That's the time you will have this flight, fright response. Just focusing on a few deep breaths will help you. And right? if you're feeling bad, you be silent, don't try to run away from that situation. Take a few deep breaths. Right? Speak to that person. Comfort the person. But you'll be burning inside. And that burning inside can be reduced if you go and share your experience with the team. So once it is over, share it. If you want, you cry with your colleagues about that patient. And you could discuss even with your consultant. You can say, I felt very bad about this. Right? And you shouldn't try to block those emotions and say, I'm going to be an unemotional robot. No. It is just that you handle your emotions. There was a time when consultants used to teach their students, keep your emotions at home when you come to the ward. No, you can't do that. Human beings are always emotional. You have to handle your emotions. So one way of handling it is to share that experience. Share that with your colleagues. Nurses are very good at sharing experiences. And as interns, rely on them. Some of them are like, will be like your sisters, your elder sisters, and your aunts or mothers. And when you try to do that, you have to cultivate compassion. You see, instead of just having, feeling the pain, 
you try to help them. Right? You try to help them. That's the important way of circumventing this. And there are ways of learning this, how you cultivate what we call compassion, karuna. Right? So when you are feeling this, you respond by helping that person. And these there are lots of traditions in this. And in one of your previous lectures, you would have heard about this on, on, uh, on what our own cultures talk about. And this was this lecture on uh, Vaishnava uh, doctor. And uh, I think Dr. Fernando did this. And these are features of a kind doctor who understands the pain of others, helps others. Okay? That's the crucial part I was trying to tell you, how you become kind. Okay? Right. So, let me end by summarizing. Firstly, we tried to tackle what kindness was, and I gave you a few examples. Right? And secondly, I gave you why it is necessary to be kind, because there are clinical reasons also. And of course, as a human being, you have to be kind, but biologically as well as clinical reasons also, right? Compliance is better, uh, patient satisfaction is better, recovery rates are better, mortality is less. Then I tried to show you why some are unkind. Certain environmental factors, bullying, uh, you know, very busy schedules, overwork and so on. But there's something which is under your control and that is this, how you tackle your own emotions without allowing you to become desensitized. And then finally, we tr I tried to show you simple ways of trying to, how you can become a kinder person. That is, you share the burden and you try to address empathic distress. And it is in this situation that we find that not only would mindfulness and meditation and things help, but also the arts. You know, people who are artists, who are into arts, who appreciate arts, music, uh, poetry, and so on, they tend to become kinder human beings because the artists are our emotional, uh, our emotional souls, as it were. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? I've just one minute more. Any questions? You can send it the chat box. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your appreciating it. It's a journey you're going to start. It's a journey you will start from the day you start internship. And I can tell you, this is one of the most wonderful, wonderful professions you ever get on earth. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sarojas. I think right. it's a very interesting lecture. I think it's a good eye opener for everyone. Uh, before they start on their career. So if you all have any questions, please ask the professor. Uh, so we'll be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. I'm so glad that you all liked it. And I hope you will all be uh, kinder, more kind. You know, you can always be more and more kind. And if you are if you are reflecting on what you do, you will find little little things where you can improve further. Yeah, uh, patients can have they have attitude and they can make us angry. How to deal with them? So that's part of the training. Part of your training is not to express anger. So sometimes we can't control our emotions. But we can control 
our actions. So if, if the patient is irritating you, sometimes patients scold you, and then you have to, you don't respond. You stay silent. You stay silent. And if it is impossible, you move away without responding, without attacking. Now, in, that's something which you have to train yourself. And that's part of the training, to control your emotions and your actions and your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I have tried to tackle difficult situations. Yes, sometimes immediate seniors can harass you. True. And that's a problem. Now, this, uh, you see, that's where your consultant should actually intervene uh, because your consultant is your supervisor and they should intervene. And, um, you know, again, you can, if uh, you can speak nicely, assertively to your senior and say, you know, I'm, uh, please don't do this. I'm, it's difficult for me. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I can't, uh, if you're shouting at me in front of patients, it's, it's difficult. I can't function in this world. Try to explain. Uh, all these negotiations should happen in private, in the sense, if the person is shouting at you in the middle of the ward, you don't try to do something there, then and there in front of everybody else. The good thing to do is to listen to it. But as soon as you go, you then say, you know, don't do that. It's, it was in front of everybody. I don't like that. It's not correct. And I didn't want to respond to you in the middle of the ward. And try to see. Sometimes they see sense when you do that. You see, they're also under stress. And they haven't had this training. They don't know about kindness. They don't know about communication. So it might be a momentary failure. Okay. So you be calm. If it fails, if those negotiations fail, you have to tell your consultant. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, I think that's all then, no? Okay. Shall we stop then? Roshan? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, problem. Okay. Righto, oh, thank you very much. Thank thank you very much. And thank wish you, you all the very best, uh, children. Well, I shouldn't be telling you children, but anyway, wish you all the very best. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. And, uh, so next up is uh, another interesting lecture by Dr. Chaminda Kaur Tegada, the uh, consultant physician, uh, uh, on the topic of anaphylaxis. So are you there? Yes, Roshan, I'm there. Yeah, good morning, Roshan. I'm just trying to share my presentation. Prashan? Can see, need to make it full screen. That's be okay. Right. Is that all right, Prashan? Yes, you can start. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, with a nice talk from the Prof. Saroj Jai Singh, now we are moving to the, the topic called anaphylaxis. So I know that you are going to start your internship in your future and you, you will be fine in various wards you are going to work like a medicine ward or the surgical ward or the pediatric ward and the gynecological or genops ward. So wherever you are, the, you might come across a patient with anaphylaxis. So therefore, you, you, you should have some knowledge in managing anaphylaxis because it is a clinical diagnosis and you have to act promptly, otherwise uh, you will miss the patient. Therefore, please learn this anaphylaxis and uh, save the patient's life. Right. So this is the outline of my presentation. So I will briefly discuss about the definition and the common causes and the pathophysiology and how to diagnose and manage a patient with anaphylaxis. And I will discuss a few case scenarios which are relevant to your career. Right. 
in Restoration Council UK, the anaphylaxis they have defined as a serious systemic hypersensitive reaction that is usually rapid in onset and may cause death. The in a CK anaphylaxis is characterized by potentially life threatening compromise in airway, breathing, and or circulation and may occur without typical skin features or circulatory collapse. So therefore, in a severe anaphylaxis, always you have to look for the life-threatening complications such as AIV, breathing, circulation issues. In the absence of those things, we are not going to take it as anaphylaxis. Please remember that anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis. What are the common causes of anaphylaxis? So when you look at this uh, table, you can see on, on your left hand side, the main causes are like food and the medicines and the insect stings. And there are, there are some more, but the common are out of the uh, three is the foods and the, the, out of them is the peanuts and the tree nuts are the most common allergy, allergenic agents. And the medicines like various antibiotics, which include the penicillin, cephalosporin and the uh, steroid, non uh, NSIDs, diclofenac and silicoxid like that. So these are common causes for uh, anaphylaxis. So what is the pathophysiology behind this anaphylaxis? What will happen in the uh, anaphylaxis? There will be an activation of multiple inflammatory pathways. There will be multiple inflammatory pathways activation which cause AIV, breathing and circulation problems. As a result of this uh, activation of multiple internal pathways they, that can cause AIV, breathing and circulation problems. So with that activation of inflammatory pathways, there will be a, either IgE or non-IgE mediated mechanism, which is usually responsible for this anaphylaxis. So, what will happen there? There will be a degranulation of mast cells and basophils. So they will release various histamines and the type of cyto uh, cytokines and the lipotriones. So they, they, these, uh, they, they will release is histamine and newly generated leukotrienes and the prostaglandins and these have various effects on your body. So as a result, patient will develop the clinical symptoms. Then you, the, with anaphylaxis. So we, in this diagram, you can see that uh, well, it will affect upper respiratory and the resp uh, digestive system on a cardiovascular system and the skin. So when you look at the respiratory system, they can have a rhinorrhea, the, the sneezing and the angioedema, the strido, as a result of histamine action. And uh, the digestive, you can have a nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain and even diarrhea. When you look at the cardiovascular system, they can have a hypotension and the tachycardia and uh, uh, they can have a tachycardia and uh, vas uh, vasodilatation. So as a result, you can have a low blood pressure and a tachycardic patient. Uh, further, in the skin, uh, you, uh, in the skin, you can have a flushing and urticaria and angioedema. Therefore, the, the, the release leukotriones and the histamine has a lot of actions. And as a result of this action, you will get uh, this much of clinical signs and symptoms. Right. On uh, this diagram, you can see on your left hand side, this is the spectrum of allergy symptoms in the left side left hand side the mild symptoms on the right hand side the severe symptoms so in the middle you can see you can divide into two and on the right hand side there will be a airway breathing circulation problems plus or minus skin symptoms when you have abc involvement that is that is we call it as anaphylaxis on the left hand side they might have just a skin manifestations so that is not anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is airway breathing circulation problems plus or minus skin symptoms. Right. 
So, as I mentioned earlier, when you make a diagnosis of anaphylaxis, the, always you have to look for sudden onset of airway and of breathing and of circulation problems. Usually, they can have a skin and of mucosal changes like flushing, urticaria, and angioedema. But 80, 20% they do not have uh, skin manifestations. Sometimes there will be confusion may arise because some patients have a systemic reactions that are not anaphylaxis. For example, generalized urticaria, angioedema, and rhinitis are not considered to be as anaphylaxis because they do not have a life threatening features such as ARV and breathing circulation problems are not there. However, when you come across that type of patients in a gray areas, in a doubt, so you give IA metrally, IA metrally, and you can seek some expert help because IA metrally is very much safe. If you are not giving the correct treatment and correct time, patient might go into cardiorespiratory arrest. Therefore, in, in your doubt, you can give this IA metrally. It is a clinical diagnosis. Anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis. Right. Anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis. So, wh wh what are these airway breathing circulation problems? In the airway, you can have uh, airway swelling, like throat and uh, uh, throat and tongue swelling and causing difficulty in breathing. There are swallowing problems and the hoarse voice and the strido. And the breathing, you can have increased work of breathing and the bronchospasm, which causing wheezing attack. And the patient becoming tired with effort, the fatigue, and the saturation is dropping. And they can go into the respiratory arrest. In the, regard to the circulation, they can have a pale, pale clammy peripheries with significant tachycardia and uh, hypotension. And the patient can have a dizziness. That is because the patient is having uh, low cerebral perfusion. Uh, and arrhythmias, at, and at the end, they can have a uh, cardiac arrest. So those are the airway breathing circulation problem. Further, they can have a neurological status because of decreased brain perfusion. So they can present as a confusion and agitation or maybe loss of consciousness. Further, they can have a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms like abdominal pain, incontinence, vomiting. So these are most likely indicate that anaphylaxis is going to be happening. Usually when you get uh, some patient with a snake bite, this abdominal pain and incontinence vomiting or uh, more towards the patient will have anaphylaxis. So you have to manage very quickly. So when you talk about this skin and mucosal changes, that they can present in a, over 80% of patients. Please remember that 20% of patients will not uh, show us the skin manifestation. It can be subtle like a patchy erythema or maybe dramatic generalized rash and may not skin or mucosal membrane like lips or both and maybe urticaria or heels and the rash and the wheels which can appear anywhere in the body right angioedema involves the uh, swelling of the deeper tissues most likely in the eyelids and the lips uh, Please remember, although skin changes can be worrying, most of the time when you see a patient with a lot of urticaria and redness, you might be a bit worried and distressing for the patients. And those treat them, they please remember that skin changes without life-threatening airway, breathing, circulation problems are not an anaphylaxis. So you can just reassure the patient about the, and this is not the anaphylaxis, this is some skin reaction following the uh, exposure to you exposure to allergen right this is the diagram you are going to uh, when you see a patient when you make a diagnosis of anaphylaxis from the beginning the sudden onset airway and breathing circulation problems and uh, there will be skin changes so you can make a diagnosis of anaphylaxis so now you need some help if you're managing that type of critical patients you need help and you call for help if possible remove the trigger if possible then you position the patient especially lie down position with or without raising the leg and if the pregnant woman is there you have to left lateral keep in the left lateral position otherwise keep in the uh, lie down position and you take the IM adrenaline 0.5 ml you give it to the 
लेटरल एंट्रल लेटरल एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द थाई एस आई एम इंजेक्शन आई एम एड्रली सो आफ्टर गिव इन द एड्रली एंड विद द एट द टाइम ऑफ द एड्रली after uh, then you have to assess the airway how is the airway the airway is, is compromised you may have to give some oxygen and the fluid so when you look at this uh, uh, slide you can see that i am adrenally you have to give as soon as possible patient should be positioning and the remote trigger is possible right in this table you can see the dose of adrenally in adult the age about 12 years uh, 0.5 ml 0.5 ml of i 1 gram in 1 ml at end that is 1 in 1000 0.5 ml 1 in 1000 you are not going to dilute so you use 1 in 10000 in the cardio respiratory arrest this is anaphylaxis please use 1 in 1000 0.5 ml i so now we already now we have uh, completed uh, now we have given the uh, adrenaline and you can repeat it adrenaline after 5 minutes if the patient is net not responding further patient need oxygen because patient had lot of respiratory problems and you have to give highest concentration of oxygen to achieve the target of around 94 to 98 in a anaphylaxis patient you have to give high highest concentration of oxygen uh, to achieve the 94 to 98 of saturation you can give it the face mask or non nrbm non breathing non breathing bags like so you give highest uh, concentration of oxygen and if you if you have doubt about the uh, type 2 respiratory failure in a patient with copd that your target might be lower than the uh, normal person like uh, 88 to 92 Right. Uh, so, the, 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 regarding the IV fluid, the, in a very uh, low blood pressure patient, always you have to give the IV fluid boluses like ten ml per kilogram, and followed by patient needs some continuous uh, maintenance fluid recovery. It might go up to three to five liters in a dark patient with the anaphylaxis. So, the ideal uh, fluid would be. Uh, 0.9 percent uh, sodium chloride. That is normal saline or heart mark. Right. This is the fluid. So, what about this antihistamine? Uh, you might see in your medical student type. Uh, time most of the time we used to give pyrimidine and uh, various things, hydrocodone, either from the beginning. But antihistamines are not recommended as part of the initial emergency treatment for anaphylaxis. Antihistamine has no role in treating the respiratory cardiovascular symptoms of anaphylaxis. That's why we are not giving the antihistamines from the beginning. But an antihistamine has a place when you are uh, antihistamine has a role when you are playing with the uh, skin symptoms. So antihistamine can be used to treat skin symptoms that often occurs as part of allergic reaction, including anaphylaxis. So therefore, their use must not delay the Treatment for adrenaline in the anaphylaxis patient. First adrenaline, then you you can consider the antihistamines. Same thing will apply to steroids as well. The routine use of corticosteroids to treat uh, anaphylaxis is not advised. But considering uh, consider you can you can consider the steroids after initial resuscitation for refractory reactions uh, or ongoing asthma shock. If the patient has asthma or ongoing shock. Not responding to our adrenaline and the fluid, then there's a uh, there's a place for steroids. Right. So, what are the problems you might encounter in managing anaphylaxis? There will be refractory anaphylaxis. So, not respond to your normal management. Patient might need HDU, ICU care. Then you have to call your seniors as well as get some senior involvement. And patient might go into the Cardio respiratory arrest during your anaphylaxis. Then you have to start advanced life support. What you learn from the advanced life support. So you have to start CPR as early as possible, and you act accordingly. Right. Uh, and what is what do you mean by biphasic reactions? Anaphylaxis can appear to resolve, but then cause recurrence of symptoms several hours later in the absence of further allergen exposure. This is known as biphasic reactions. 
usually 50% of these biphasic reactions have occurred within 12 hours of exposure. Right, when you are discharging that type of patient, please uh, keep in your mind that uh, there is a possibility of biphasic reaction in about 5% of patients within uh, 50, uh, within 12 hours. Right. So regarding anaphylaxis in pregnancy, same management, except regarding the positioning, you have to position the patient fully lateral to improve the venous return to the uh, uh, heart. On discharge, most importantly, you have to educate the patient and you have to issue a diagnosis card saying that you are allergic to this thing. Otherwise, patient will not know about the allergy and they will go and take the same thing and can, can, can come with the severe anaphylaxis ne next time. Therefore, please educate the patients and issue a diagnosis card. And you have to correctly mention the allerg aller allergen. Otherwise, if you mention just in ideas or uh, antibiotic, and all the antibiotic will be there, and no one is. The, then the patient might come with a huge number of allergen. Then we can't give any medicines. Therefore, please identify the which is which are the uh, allergen and please document. I will discuss a few case scenarios. So this is a 37-year-old patient admitted with a three-hour history of itchy rash, which was worsening over time. So. 37 year old patient admitted with a three hour history of itchy rash, which was worsening over time. So, patient might be in wheels and then geoedema, like an oxide on examination, patient has an urticarial rash, but, but blood pressure is 138, pulse rate all right, and respiratory rate 50, lungs vesicular breathing, no added sound. Saturation is 97. So, what I'm going to do with this patient is that anaphylaxis. How do you feel? So I told you from the beginning that for you to have anaphylaxis, there should be an airway breathing circulation problem. In this patient, you can see blood pressure is all right, respiratory is all right, saturation is all right. So that means airway breathing circulations are not compromised. That means this is not the anaphylaxis, but patient having skin manifestations. So this is not the anaphylaxis. What you can do, you have to just Man, you can get, manage with some antihistamine. So, in case number two, the, the during your internship, the, you might get a call from your nursing officer, inform you that big three patient is confused after giving his medicine. So, at that time, you might be in the canteen, or you might be in the hostel, or you might be in the uh, some other place. So this type of thing, so you should not ask various, now the patient is confused. You should not ask various histories and spend your time. So without asking various histories from the, over the phone, please rush to the patient because so patient got confused after giving some medications until prone otherwise, it's going to be something very, very, very urgent thing. You need to attend very quickly. If you spend time asking various unnecessary things and the nurses might not be able to give the answers for that. You might ask, give me a blood pressure, blood pressure, but that will take some time and patient will lose the golden time. Therefore, please rush to the patient and you see the patient. Any critical patient, A, B, C, D approach is very important. The A, inspiratory sound. When you, are, when you assist in the ARV, you can hear some inspiratory sound. So there's increased work of breathing. Respiratory is very high, saturation is dropping. Blood pressure is almost, blood pressure is still like 70, but that's why you can't measure. So this uh, severe AIV breathing circulation problem. So what is the diagnosis here? Patient who has had an anaphylaxis following some medicine. So what you have to do? You lie down the patient and give IM at 0.5 ml lateral aspect of the thigh and you start on some IV fluid and you bolus depending on the other clinical problems whether the patient is in heart failure or not so you look at the other comorbidities and you give adequate fluid and you give highest concentration of oxygen to achieve the target saturation of oxygen so what are the things please 
I will repeat again. I am adrenaline, highest concentration of oxygen, and you give IV fluid to maintain the blood pressure. Right. This is the last case of a case. And the 32 year old patient brought to hospital after attending the wedding ceremony. So he's a diagnosed patient of bronchial asthma and had many food allergies. So when you when you when you assess in the patient, you can see that the patient is in a mild angioedema. There are some noisy sounds. And respiratory rate is 25, and the bilateral ronchi is there. Saturation is 75 to 80. And the blood pressure is 80 and 50 with a pulse rate of 101. And the patient bit anxious and agitated. There were some few articular lesions. So when you look at this history, so what are your differential diagnosis? So when you see the type, this type of patient, some might say this is just an exacerbation of bronchial asthma because they have a bilateral ronchi and saturation bit drop and the respiratory rate is high. So some might say that uh, anaphylaxis. So I agree with that anaphylaxis because there is some airway problems and there is some skin manifestations, airway breathing and the skin manifestations are there. Therefore, they, this may be an overlapping of both conditions, maybe a anaphylaxis plus or minus exacerbation of bronchial asthma. Therefore, you have to manage all those two at the same time. Otherwise, you will not be able to save the patient's life. I think uh, with that, I'm coming to the end of the presentations. Always any critically ill patient, ABCD approach is very important. Then only you can come to a reasonable diagnosis and manage the patient. Please remember that anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis and the dose of adrenaline is 0.5 ml, 1 in 1000. As you can repeat in 5 minutes if not responding and uh, you use high flow oxygen to achieve the 94 to 98 of saturation. IV fluid, you have to give adequate IV fluid, you have to look for other comorbidities as well. On discharge, please educate the patient and issue a diagnosis card. I think uh, with that, I will conclude my presentation. If you have any problems, please just let me know. Roshan? Yes, sir. Um, Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, on that detailed lecture on anaphylaxis. Uh, that was Dr. Shamin the court take a consult the physician. So we are going for a tea break, but if you have any questions, please ask, sir, because anaphylaxis is a very prominent case uh, in medical wards. So not uh, Rosha, not even in the medical wards. If you have a yeah, surgical yeah. ward, the yeah. nurses might give a wrong uh, antibiotic. Or even yes. in a pediatric, even in a genomes. Anyway, yes. Yes. you can you will face this type of critical situation. If you not make a clinical diagnosis of anaphylaxis from the beginning, patient might die. And the later on, you might see this patient got arrested because of uh, uh, myocardial infarction. That is not the case of that patient. It was an anaphylaxis which led to the cardiorespiratory arrest. If you if you if you diagnose the clinically. So you manage from the anaphylaxis from the beginning, you can save the patient. Uh, there are a few questions on the chat box. One is shock anaphylaxis. So what, what about shock of anaphylaxis? What, yes, what about shock of So the, uh, shock, we have uh, five types of shock. One is anaphylactic shock. Shock means when the blood pressure is less than 90. So in this anaphylaxis, that's what I'm saying from the beginning, and a uh, patient should have airway breathing circulation problem. So when someone is having the circulation problem, that means less than 90 of systolic blood pressure. So that means shock, so anaphylactic shock. That's what I was telling from the beginning. The anaphylactic shock management is IM medicine and the oxygen and the fluid. Did I answer Roshan for that? Time? I hope so, sir. <laughs> well, a lot of people encounter after COVID vaccination, the change in uh, 
perception for this uh, some previously not allergens now getting allergy is there a relationship uh, always you, know, you you can have some experience from your uh, relatives or whoever the thing you know you do not have much allergy from your childhood but later on in your body there will be a lot of allergy that is because of this our immunity humoral immunity so when you export some uh, agents with that there will be a expo uh, uh, developing of various antibodies i agree with that statement you can have a allergy which was not there from the beginning but now that is because of our immune reactions when you expose to more allergen later on the, the, the number of uh, an, an uh, allergen uh, substance will be more is there a relationship with the covid vaccinations sir? could be uh, um, i can't say exactly what is that but uh, you have to do some research and see i don't have <laughs> much <laughs> experience on that thing everyone is trying yeah, to sir, but, but, uh, roshan uh, here everyone is trying to blame the uh, covid vaccine i don't think there's issue with that thing but anyway i am not going to i am not going to give a correct answer for that thing we need some do research yeah I understand <laughs> yes right interesting topics right so we'll break for tea name tea now uh, so we'll have uh, 20 minutes tea break so we start at uh, 10 to 20 so thank you once again sir thank you very much thank you very much all the best thank you
So uh, we have one or two minutes. So next lecture is by so we'll start session by Hello, Prashan. Yes, can you, can you hear me? Even the introduction, sir. Can Sorry, there's yes, a slight yes, disturbance. I've given the introduction. Right, okay, fine. Something to yeah. Roshan? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, yeah may, can I start? Or I didn't get, get you. I've given the introduction, so you can start. Oh, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. Right, okay. Screen again. Roshan? Yes, sir. Can see, need to make it full screen, sir. Right, okay, fine. I'll do that, yeah. Can you see the slides? Prashant? Yes, can see, sir. Can see. Yeah, okay. Can I start, Prashant? Sorry, I just said it was a technical problem. No, no, it's okay, sir. Can, we can start, sir. Yes. But okay, so my to talk today is on fluid therapy basics and advanced. And uh, we'll start with a case scenario. Uh, a 54-year-old hypertensive male admitted with four days history of headache, body aches, nausea, and poor intake. On admission, he has signs of mild dehydration. His a febrile pulse is 98 per minute. And his uh, blood pressure is 110 by 75. And his weight is 60 kilos and he had this routine blood test done on admission. Uh, now, this sort of a patient, first question is, would you prescribe intravenous fluids? Next question, if so, what is the fluid and what rate and what is the duration of fluid? And thirdly, how would you assess response and further fluid needs? So my talk today will be based on the fluid management of a patient who is being admitted under your care. Now, intravenous fluid therapy, decision to start intravenous fluid should always be justified because merely by starting uh, fluids, you might fall into trouble. 
So deciding on the optimal amount, the composition, the rate of administration is in at times difficult. And the other thing is assessment, prescribing and monitoring of IV fluids in wards is often left to junior doctors. So when you become house officers, the first thing that you would do to an admitted patient is to give fluids, but you should justify yourself. And these have been, uh, there should, and also these have been executed by nurses and they both need a little bit of training on fluid administration. And also, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that mismanagement of fluid is common and that can lead to detrimental effects. Can, you know, fluid overloads, can cause uh, electrolyte imbalances, can introduce infection. So you have to be careful when you give fluids. So there are a few principles involved in fluid prescribing. One, where you need to know the physiology of fluid balance in health. Second is pathophysiological effects of fluid balance during illness. What happens to fluid balance during illness? Physiology and pathophysiology. Next thing, you need a clinical approach to assessing IV with how should you assess the need of IV fluids. Lastly, the properties of available IV fluids. So these should be actually fulfilled before prescribing IV fluids. Now, Fluid distribution, I will not uh, waste much of a time. So 60% of the fluids, body weight is in fluids and out of that two third is intracellular. And of the one third intracellular, it's just a 20% is in the plasma and 80% again is in interstream. So you need to have a fine balance between uh, intravascular and interstitial fluid. And from interstitial to the uh, uh, then intracellular, intracellular, so there should be fine balance of fluid. So now this is the physiology of, uh, at a physiological state, this is, that is fluid, this is electrolytes. So it, if you take the cations, now you ch check uh, ECF and ICF where there is a equilibrium, the major cation is going to be always sodium in extracellular fluid and it is potassium that is going to be in the intracellular fluid. So if you take the anions, the main major anions in extracellular fluid is chloride, whereas in the intracellular, it should be phosphates and other proteins. So this is a physiological state. And then, so if you look at summary of uh, electrolytes during physiological states, the sodium is the major uh, plasma or interstitial fluid uh, cation and potassium is the major intracellular cation. Chloride is the major uh, interstitial and uh, plasma uh, uh, anion. And then the bicarbonate is more or less more in uh, extracellular rather than intracellular. So this is the usual thing what happens during physiology. So what happens to these uh, fluid and electrolytes during illness. Illness and injury alter fluid and electrolyte balance and distribution in many ways. Firstly, it changes the fluid and electrolyte handling by the body. So there are main, the main fluid handling organ in the body is kidney. Then there is non-specific metabolic response to stress. Then there, it could be directly attributed to specific organ or system dysfunction such as renal, acute renal disease. Right? And also during illness, a patient might not take adequate fluid orally or maybe electrolytes adequately as what is being recommended for a daily intake. And also there could be due, during pathological illness, uh, there could be uh, changes in insensible losses due to illness or environment. Now, so in... Now, so what we now this is one thing that is going to be very important when you become house officers to be mindful of the insensible losses. Usually, it's about you know uh, about fifty to twenty mL per kg of uh, that is six hundred to nine hundred sorry 15, 10, ten to fifteen mL per kg, uh, and then uh, it might change a, a, in certain instances with fever. Each degree of uh, about 37, there is a 2.5 ml per kg rise. 
and burns and desquamation, there will be a lot of fluid losses. And diarrheal illness, you need to count the diarrheal episodes because each episode will have about 200 ml of insensible losses, right? So insensible losses are decreased if a patient undergo mechanical ventilation as well. So these things, because of the environment, the you know the cold environment in, in, inside the uh, intensive care, there could be few changes in your insensible losses. So this is one thing that we need to count upon when you calculate the fluid requirement of a patient. Now, you assess IV fluid rates. Now, first thing, what is the patient's current fluid and electrolyte status? What are my patient's routine maintenance needs for fluid and electrolytes? Can my patient meet fluid and electrolytes by oral or enteral route? Does my patient need IV fluid resuscitation? Or does my patient have existing fluid or electrolyte deficits or abnormal ongoing losses? So these are the questions we need to answer before starting fluids. So patient's current fluid and electrolyte status, and what is his usual maintenance? What is the fluid need uh, need of for 24 hours? Whether the patient is in a state of hemodynamic compromise needing fluid resuscitation, and whether there are ongoing losses, insensible losses, right? And be, whether we can give li fluid liberally, whether there are any comorbidities uh, for, for your own patient. Now, fourth thing. Be, you this, before giving intravenous fluids, you need to know a little bit about the composition of commonly used intravenous fluid types. It's commonest we use is isotonic saline, and then what we what we call have balanced crystalloids. Uh, what the preparation available commonly with us is Hartmann's, and also plasmalite is the more sort of ideal for the plasma. And we have glucose and glucose saline as another crystalloid. And then we move on to the colloids, right? Colloids could be synthetic colloids or albumin solutions, right? So, uh, so your, your prop properties of crystalloids and commonly used colloids, you need to know. Now, this is a composition, uh, electrolyte composition of uh, commonly used. Now, you look at the, now on your left, you have the plasma. And on your right, first line, you have the, what we call the isotonic saline. Then we have the balanced crystalloid, ringus lactate or plasmalite. Now, if you take uh, sodium, the plasmalite has a more or less equivalent, whereas if you give uh, uh, saline, it's a, so, the sodium uh, amount that you give is higher than what should be ideally. Then, if you take the, there's a huge discrepancy in chloride. If you now, if you give us, if you got isotonic saline, it has a one and a half times of chloride from plasma, whereas it is very much equivalent to plasma in uh, the balanced crystalloid. So there are a few changes that might happen if you give inadequate, so inadvertent fluids. If you give too much of saline, they might have a hypochloremia leading to hypochloremic acidosis, right? Then if you look at the crystal colloids on your right, they also have some, you know, uh, uh, now if you take uh, uh, isotonic compositions in plasma, and compare some of the components might have very high sodium levels, especially you know gel of fusins, uh, starches if you give, and chloride also the same, right? Some of these preparations have very high chloride rates, which might be detrimental to some patients. So you need to know a little bit about the chemical composition of uh, this electrolyte composition of these preparations that you use. Now, now when you now you decided to start fluids so you have assessed and then there are four principles that four hours involved in administration of fluid one is resuscitation whether the patient needs immediate resuscitation number two is routine maintenance number three replacement number four redistribution so i will add another one which is reassessments so each and after each and every phase you need to reassess the patient so we'll go back to our cases back again. Uh, this is a 54-year-old male, which I have told you, right? So then we had 
routine blood test done on admission and then how would would you prescribe intravenous fluid what is a fluid what right so this patient is uh, has some mild dehydration is not taking adequately orally so you decided to give iv fluids so this patient should ideally be, get fluids under number two category that is routine maintenance so routine maintenance what are the principles right Patients who simply cannot meet their normal fluid electrolyte needs by oral or enteral routes. Or they are otherwise well and in terms of fluid and electrolyte balance and handling and need to meet the patient's routine maintenance requirements of fluid and electrolytes and has the patient got any significant comorbidities or insensible losses. Right? So if the patient needs IV fluid routine maintenance, restrict the initial prescription to total of 25 to 30 ml kg per day and see whether the patient is taking in addition oral as well, that might sometimes be cause a little bit of fluid overload. And rate that you give is one to two ml, that is 50 to 100 ml for a 50 kilogram per hour. And you need to give at least one, at approximately one millimole per kg per day of potassium, sodium. So each electrolyte about one millimole per kg per day. And also 50 to 100, if, you're not, if the patient is not taking any, uh, you know, glucose orally, then you need to give uh, 50 to 100 grams of glucose every day as well. For patients who are obese, suggest the IV fluid prescription to their ideal body weight. And also, if there is a, uh, there are any pathologies, you might change the uh, fluid quota to 20 to 25 ml rather than 25 to 30 if the patient has significant comorbidities. So the take-home message is that you take 25 to 30 ml of per kg, uh, and then you re replace, you know, of, uh, one millimole per kg of the electrolytes and 50 to 100 grams of dextrose, right? So, for if you consider for a 60 kilogram, the total uh, recommended fluid is 1,500 to 1,800. So you give 60 millimoles of sodium potassium chloride and you give 50 to 100 grams of glucose. So if you go through on your right, if you go through these things, what you would see is that there is, uh, so if you give a, a two, two packs of saline, you might, uh, you know, uh, give 154 mLs, right? Okay. So, and uh, that is then you, if you give a, uh, Electrolytes, so you you tend to give too much of. Uh, now, for instance, if you are giving chloride, you are giving excess of chloride. If you give more than you more than a liter of, and then if you give dextrose, you can come uh, usually a, a one pack of 500 ml bag of dextrose will contain 50 grams of glucose. So you can give about two. So my recommendation is to give two pint two pints of. Uh, is one liter of saline and one liter of dextrose for this patient, but still there can be some excess of chloride and sodium if you give this, even, even if you give this. Right, so this is the message. Give maintenance weights, 25 to 30, one minimal per kg, and so 5%, so usually 5% dextrose will contain about 50 grams of uh, one pack will contain 500 ml, this thing. So you give about, so for this patient, two packs of saline and two packs of dextrose will cover up the fluid and electrolyte needs of a patient. Day two, he remains a febrile, hemodynamic is stable, hydration is normal, and now you are able to take few sips orally, right? So you, do you need to give IV fluids? If so. so usually reassessment, from fluid, so when you want to do, you reassess. The fifth hour is involved with after each and every phase, that is reassessment, clinical history, clinical examination, measure output and fluid balance, make and make count of the insensible losses and serial body weight measurements will also tell what the patient's fluid status is. So right? this you need to do after your initial fluid management to decide on whether the patient needs further fluids, right? And then case scenario two, a 54-year-old lady with poorly controlled diabetes was admitted with three-day history of dysuria, fever, chills, right flowing pain, and altered level of consciousness. So obviously, this patient is in a sort of a hemodynamic compromise. Blood pressure is low, tachycardic, capillary refill time is uh, less than two seconds though, tachypnic, uh, but uh, looks like in a sort of a um, metabolic acidosis, lactate is high, 
and then there are ketone bodies. So this is probably a sepsis with ketoacidosis. So what is your initial fluid management? So I will, these are the problems, uh, high fever, tachycardic, hemodynamic compromise, tachypnic, low GCS, high hyperglycemia, lactic acidosis, neutrophil leukocytosis, ICRP. So this definitely the patient is septic. So what is your fluid management? So this patient needs resuscitation. So who are the patients who would need resuscitation? The presence of two or more of the following is likely to indicate the patient is shocked and would need fluid resuscitation, right? The pulse rate of more than 20 beats per minute. Then you have a systolic blood pressure less than 20 from the baseline. Capillary refill time more than two. So there are a few criteria that you lay down and if the patient fulfills more than two or more of these, the patient is a candidate for fluid needing fluid resuscitation, right? The type of fluid, whether you give crystalloid or colloid for resuscitation. Uh, if you are decided to give crystalloid, is it a isotonic saline or is it a balanced, balanced solution? If you are going to colloid, is it gelatin starch, right? What is the volume? You give 10 ml per kg bolus or you give 30 ml per kg? Do you give fast or control? Uh, okay, so now we go back to the scientific evidence, right? Colloids, crystalloids for fluid dissertation in critical ill. Now they have they have got, done a lot. There's a Cochrane uh, review, which has definitely shown that crystalloids are far better than colloids for initial fluid resuscitation, right? And then you had another, now you decided you go for crystalloids, whether you give uh, isotonic saline or balanced crystalloids. So balanced crystalloids are far superior to isotonic saline. In, so you can, you should use Hartmann rather than normal saline and have a circumstance for fluid resuscitation of critical yield, right? So then you decide to go for crystalloids and then 500 ml bolus given less than 50 minutes and then usually you don't use starch and if you can give 5% albumin solution uh, only in patient with severe sepsis but of course we do have what we got in the wards is 8.4% should never be used as for resuscitation in any patient. So the take-home message you give crystalloids 10 you can start 10 you can go up to 30 ml then balance balanced crystalloids are superior to isotonic saline, right? So once you resuscitate, you then go to, re, then you can, you reassess the patient and you can go to either routine maintenance, replacement, which I will go take you through. So then there are various phases of fluid resuscitation, which is called rescue, optimization, stabilization, evacuation. I think this might be out of my scope. Uh, so, but uh, anyway, so I will have a just quick, uh, recap on what is actually meant during fluid resuscitation. It might, there are four phases of fluid resuscitation, fluid, initial fluid therapy. It could rescue is usually resuscitation. Then once you give, then optimization, stabilization, and de-escalation, right? Rescue phases within minutes. You give uh, the, during the resuscitation phase, you give within 15 minutes, you give a fluid bolus, right? Should be initiated using a combination of clinical and hemodynamic parameters in and you might reassess the patient after fluid bolus and re-challenge the patient with uh, either another bolus or you step down. Then your patient had two 10 ml crystalloid boluses. Three hours later, patient was clinically improving. Now the pulse is 100, blood pressure 100 by 70. Now respiratory rate is 24, GCS is now 15. So it's actually resuscitated well after two boluses of uh, crystalloids and it has taken three hours. Now, what is your fluid management now? Rescue, optimization, stabilization, evacuation, right? So optimization, now we have within minutes, we have resuscitated. Then optimization is where the patient is no longer in immediate life-threatening danger. And this sort of a compensated shock and you, you, might, you might look, look for reassess the patient and you might give fluid challenges. Fluid challenges, uh, fluid, fluid boluses is you give something like, you know, a 10 ml to 30 ml. Challenges is something very low volume. So the difference is now in your on your left, you have the fluid resuscitation, which we have done before. And fluid challenges is you give about, you know, two, two to five ml uh, over five to 10 minutes with reassessment. So half of the fluid 
resuscitation, you give and reassess, right? This is what we call optimization phase. So, so this is the basic concept of a fluid challenge. You give 100 or 10, this is called uh, troll, T-R-O-L, troll mechanism, right? So type, you give crystalloid rate, 100 to 200 ml, objective to normalization of macro and micro circulation and limits. You need to be careful about the fluid status, check the patient's uh, CVP and other things or whether there is evidence of fluid overload by appearance of crepitations, right? So you give this uh, fluid challenges for during the uh, uh, optimization phase, right? Then after 24 hours, the patient has become hemodynamically stable now. Could, uh, you, still, there is a residual of about 1,600, sorry, the positive balance. And the creatinine record now comes as 204. What is your recommended fluid intake? What is your route of administration? Now, this patient will need uh, uh, it's a, what we call a stabilization phase. This phase might last for a few days where you give only the maintenance amount of fluid, right? Patient is in a steady state. Fluid therapy is now used for ongoing maintenance, either in setting up normal fluid doses or unresolved pathology. And the, this patient should not be in shock. Actually, you need to reassess the patient is definitely not in shock. And you give according to the patient's daily needs. If there's an insensible loss, you might need to increase the amount of fluid that you give during stabilization phase. Finally, uh, Evacuation de and de-escalation, if the patient has got excessive fluid, you might de-evacuate with either dialysis or sometimes patient might respond to diuretics. So depending on the patients, this is, this is after a few days, the patients after you are, so you have gone through four phases, the fourth phase after a few days to weeks, and then depending on the patient's kidney functions, you might either get a dialysis, pharmacological dialysis, or if not a renal replacement to get rid of the fluids, right? Right, so I move to case scenario three. It's a 54-year-old known patient with child B cirrhosis. Now, these are the things that you will see in a medical ward. Presence with uh, low-grade fever, abdominal pain, loose stools, altered level of consciousness, and poor oral intake. The patient is obese. Patient is icteric. There is edema. Blood pressure is 11070, acceptable. GCS is 14 and there is moderate ascites. On your initial evaluation, the hemoglobin is 9.8, platelet low, WBC high, CRP is high, creatinine is high, urea is elevated in parallel to creatinine, sodium is low, albumin is low. So these, there are a lot of, at this point, there are a lot of fluid problems because there is fluid overload. Patient has, uh, patient is, uh, Oh, the patient has got edema and there is a electrolyte problem. The sodium is low and the albumin is low. So this is going to be a little complex. So what is your fluid management? Now this is this patient is not hemodynamically unstable, so does not need resuscitation. Routine may, is not definitely a candidate for routine maintenance. The patient is sick and patient should be falling into replacement redistribution type of a fluid therapy criteria. So now the problems you identified, if you look, list the problems, child B, C, L, C, D, fever, diarrhea, outer level of consciousness, everything is there. So the questions to be answered, what would you start IV fluids? This patient had a bit of a diarrhea and patient is edematous. Should we give or not? What, if you decide to give, what type? What rate? Right. So we'll take go through this. If intravenous fluid therapy replacement and redistribution is sometimes this is going to be a little complex. This is the thing that is usually complex. So replacement is easy. Resuscitation is somewhat easy if the patient is responding well. The initial phase is easy. but replacement and redistribution are going to be a little complex, right? So replacement. Now, this patient's IV fluid treat loses losses from intravascular or other fluid coma, which are not needed urgently for resuscitation. Required to correct existing water and electrolyte deficits and ongoing external losses. Sometimes these deficits have developed slowly with associated compensatory adaptation of tissues and electrolytes. So now, the, for instance, this patient is edematous, patient is hyponatremic, hypervolumic, 
So you need to be a little mindful when you give fluid and you, you, you should not enthusiastically correct the sodium also because the, it's, it's a chronic process, right? When it comes to redistribution, some patients have marked internal fluid distribution changes and normal fluid changes. So this, uh, this, this is usually a, of patients um, whom I'm talking about is major cardiac or liver or renal comorbidities, right? So if you if the patient has got any of those things, then the patient's got redistributed fluid in the interstitial spaces that you might need to gradually take them in and you have to do, do it very cautiously. Now, there is this algorithm of replacement and redistribution, right? So, so you need to get, first you need to get the existing fluid or electrolyte deficits, then ongoing abnormal fluid or electrolyte losses, and then you redistribution at the complex issue. So this is going to be a little complex. So we'll go back to our patient, right? So this patient had liver disease, had edema, had diarrheal illness, right? Calculate ideal, this patient is obese. So calculate the ideal body weight because the patient is grossly edematous as well. And check the fluid status. The patient is, whether the patient is, this patient looks a little hypervolumic. Calculate the daily requirement of fluid electrolyte. So just see, calculate the fluid requirements and identify the existing electrolyte abnormality. So this patient has got diarrhea. So there are a little bit of in, insensible losses also, right? Then maintain a meticulous input output. So these are the patients who need a very precise input output, which you need to push the nurses and the carers to maintain a strict input output chart and prescribe crystalloid or colloid depending on the patient's requirement. Sometimes the patient might need a combination of crystalloids. So you need to give a little bit of electrolytes, like something like saline, uh, isotonic saline, and you might, the patient is hypoalbuminemic and there, are, there is a site, if there is significant ascites, you might need to give a colloid preparation like albumin, right? So these are the things that you should do and you need to reassess the patient, preferably at least twice a day the fluid status have to be ma maintained to make sure that there is uh, there is no fluid deficit or fluid excess of this patient. Right. In conclusion, what I would say is uh, understand the basics of fluid and electrolyte balance in patients with normal physiology and during illness. So usually what is the practice is when the patient is get, get admitted, we just uh, get a ask the nurses to put a cannula and then give fluids, right? So, but you need to justify yourself why you decided to give and how much you decided to give and type and duration, right? And also when you prescribe IV fluid, you need to know the composition of common use IV fluids and bearing in mind that you might add a lot too much of chloride if, chloride if you give isotonic saline, right? And we are, what we have seen is actually the balanced crystalloids are far superior to isotonic saline. And also you assess the risk benefits of and harms of IV fluid administration, right? Sometimes you, it might be beneficial. Sometimes it, it is risky and you need to see the harms of fluid administration because that might cause a lot of side effects, fluid overload, infection and other things. And remember, always remember the five R's in fluid administration, resuscitation, routine maintenance, replacement, redistribution, and reassessment. So four phases are very important. The categories of four phases, whether the patient needs in resuscitation, whether they're needing a routine maintenance, whether the patient needs in replacement, replacement redistribution is going to be a little complex though, but you need to keep in back of the mind because most of the sick patients in the ward are falling into this. Resuscitation is usually in a under emergency setting. Routine maintenance is, is the majority that we give and that you need to make sure that there is a justification to give IV fluids. And each and every phase, after you give a, your intended duration, you need to reassess the patient to see whether the patient's IV fluid need is ongoing or whether you can take the patient off intravenous fluids. And also ensure medical and nursing staff in IV fluid prescribing and administration are trained to these principles. So that is one of the 
objectives of today's talk as well because when you become house officers you will be the first contact of a patient and then you need to decide on the patient's intravenous fluid requirement the physiologic you need to do the physiology and the patient's pathological status and decide on the type and duration of fluids thank you i think i just finished on time i suppose roshan is there anything that i any time left for questions Yes, sir. Uh, if uh, we can take this few minutes to answer some questions. If anyone's having questions, please type in. Or... Right. I think, uh, Roshan, uh, we might. Uh, yeah, are we running on schedule, Roshan, at the moment? Yes, sir. But there's about 10 minutes. Eight minutes rather. Uh, spare time, actually. I see. No, I thought it's a half an hour. I started at 10 20. I just rushed through some slides. Uh, uh, yeah. Any questions? Uh, right. So, uh, if anyone having questions can type in. Uh, so that thank you very much, sir, Dr. Krishanta Jayasekar, consultant, senior physician at TH Karapitya on the theme of uh, fluid management. Thank you once again, sir. Okay. Uh, shall I stop share and then? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, next up is uh, approach to unconscious patient by Dr. Bandusi Ratnayaka, uh, consultant physician at uh, PG Ratnapur. So are you there? Yes. So you can start. Uh... All right. Uh... Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Roshan, for the kind introduction. Actually, okay. I'm. Uh... I'm consultant physician from uh, PGH Badul. Eh? Oh, my, sorry, previous, sir. my previous patient was uh, teaching hospital Ratnapura. It's okay. okay. Uh, so my topic is uh, clinical approach to unconscious patient. Uh, so I have put it as a clinical approach to a patient with altered level of consciousness. So this is the outline of my presentation. So definition, courses for the altered level of consciousness evaluation, management, and the prognosis. Right. The first question arises uh, when we are talking about the unconscious patient, what, what is consciousness? Consciousness, we can define it as uh, being awake and uh, aware of both one's self and one's surrounding. Or else we can define it as uh, it is the human awareness of both internal and external stimuli. I think that is uh, easy, right? It is human awareness of both internal and external stimuli. We call this as a consciousness, right? So if there is a level, yes, definitely there is a level. So level of consciousness is a measurement of a person's arousability and responsiveness to stimuli from the environment. It is a measurement. Right? Measurement of a personal arousability and the respons responsiveness. So, uh, 
there are different terms used in this field uh, confusion lethargy obstantation coma stupor i will quickly go through what are those uh, the definitions uh, confusion mean disoriented to surroundings may have impaired judgment may need some cues to respond to commands what do you mean by lethargy it simulate light sleep the patient is arousable by touch or noise and can maintain all or alertness for a period of time that we we'll define as a lethargy what is obstructed obstantation respond slowly to external stimulation and need repeated stimulation to maintain the attention and re response there are some patients so it's uh, they wake up and they sleep but you need a repeated response okay awake awake hello how are you how are you so you can say that okay uh, wake up wake up like likewise uh, you have to give some uh, stimuli so what is stupor stupor is a can be aroused only by vigorous stimuli the previous one is a can be stimulated by the just verbal com com commands right so the simple touch okay wake up right hello open your eyes open your mouth right so but then suddenly patient will fall into a sleep but stupor is a can be aroused only by vigorous stimulus you give a very uh, you press over the sternum right you give a sharp uh, stimulus effort to avoid the, stimu the the stimulation are displayed little or no no spontaneous activity and show little motor or verbal activity once aroused so after even after the deep or the vigorous stimuli even after they wake up so there is a very slow little motor or verbal activity once they arouse so coma is the the worst scenario worst case of uh, unconsciousness so the how do you define coma the patient is not arousable at all right the patient is not arousable at all to verbal or physical stimuli and no attempt is made to avoid painful or noxious stimuli sometimes you know that when we apply a painful stimuli our body the reflex arc is operating and the body part is try to withdraw right so but in a coma patient there is no response like that so individual in coma have an absence of both wakefulness and the awareness those are just uh, to get an idea what are those terms in the unconscious patient so uh, the level of consciousness is a spectrum of status what do you mean by spectrum it's like a um, right you know what is spectrum so ischemic heart disease is a spectrum of disease now one then there is a stable angina then there is unstable angina then non st elevation mi st elevation mi then last one is a ischemic cardiomyopathy in between two in between these two end stable angina and ischemic cardiomyopathy there are different uh, status uh, the, the spectrum of disease but the altered level of consciousness is a spectrum of status so one end is a normal the other end is a coma in between normal and the coma there will be a confusion or delirium lethargy obstantation stupor the last one is a coma right so that is the the, the subjective the, the level of consciousness may be vary to person to person one person will look at uh, the patient will say that okay this patient is semi conscious right your sho will say that no 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 this no the patient is unconscious the somebody will uh, the your co house officer will say the patient is confused right so but there is a, that is subjective uh, variation but there should be a objective assessment of the level of consciousness so that is the objective the, the this objective uh, the assessment is made by by applying this scale called the glasgow coma scale so it is very very important a scale right so there are three component eye, eye component verbal component and the motor component right so i there are four uh, the more mo verbal there are five uh, the motor there are six you know this uh, from the medical student days so what is glasgow coma scale why glasgow coma scale is important in clinical practice you all are going to be a house officer 
how how the gcs is important for a house officer where is the most important thing is uh, transferring a patient say suppose there you want to transfer a patient you can your consultant decide transfer patient from a badulla to national hospital kalambu so patient with a head injury right for a neurosurgical or the neurotrauma the unit so then from badulla you have to clearly document this patient level of Uh, consciousness by using a gcs right i response is this motor response is this verbal response is this right so gcs is uh, 10 at the badulla so receiving a doctor who is at nhsl if the gcs drop up to 6 or 7 so then uh, he he should know that there is something happened on the on the way on the in between transfer so then the, it is easy for the communication that is one of the important thing if you document in the transfer form okay this patient is semi conscious or patient is confused right so confused patient if you come to the uh, the national hospital if the patient is uh, the totally the, the the gcs is 3 or 4 like so then uh, they can't understand what has happened and then the what is the previous gcs so please 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 practice this thing and then when you are transferring a patient write down the what is the gcs uh, uh, on uh, during transfer or uh, where the uh, the patient start to transfer where is the other important thing is when you are presenting you have to present to your cases to your sho you have to present to your consultant so when the patient uh, come with a reduced level of consciousness you have to assess what is the gcs and what are the component what is verbal i and so then when you are presenting to a consultant okay so this this patient is uh, presented with these things and gcs is this right so one day i can remember one house house officer presented like this so this patient brought by the police found on the road uh, his gcs is 3 what is the first question i ask with the patient alive or dead so what that is one of a drawback of this uh, glasgow coma can you see that even a no eye response no verbal response no motor response you carry a one mark one mark one mark gcs3 mean in a dead person uh, gcs uh, would be a three so that is a one of a drawback of this glasgow coma scale so but you have to specifically mention when you are the trans when you are presenting uh, the reduced level of consciousness patient and when the other important thing when you are handing over to your colleagues right so your house officer working in a medical ward or the surgical ward your shift is over you want to hand over to the night touch up and then you have to hand over this patient okay this patient admitted with this thing gcs is this mark and then the person who is accepting the patient know that the what is the level of consciousness right what are the causes for the reduced level of consciousness there are multiple causes hypoxia trauma nutritional deficiency medication electrolyte abnormality strokes infection pain and the seizures this uh, chart again shows that the some common causes for the reduced level of consciousness either under the cause of infection it could be the meningitis or encephalitis sepsis uh, urinary tract infection especially elderly patient become confused with uti pneumonia isotoxic is one of the common thing and the, in the common thing in a medical practice drug toxicity alcohol uh, over, overuse alcohol abuse and is one one common thing in a medical the ward uh, you will get unconscious patient drug withdrawal in the young patient with uh, some heroin addicts or the some alcohol withdrawal so environmental exposure like carbon monoxide trap but can happen in the medical ward so metabolic causes metabolic causes with reduced level of consciousness is very very common thing in medical practice so electrolyte disturbances like a sodium and the calcium endocrine deficiencies like a hypo hypoglycemia can present with altered level of consciousness hepatic encephalopathy is a common thing in uh, with the background of honest reason is alcoholic allergy uremia with uremic encephalopathy so environmental exposure such like hypothermia in this to cardiac failure pulmonary embolism those altered level of consciousness will be observed in these conditions and trauma related uh, like uh, sdh or sometimes uh, cerebrovascular accident like uh, the, the hemorrhagic or the ischemic stroke so those are uh, causes for the uh, altered level of consciousness evaluation of a patient uh, uh, 
uh, with the altered level of consciousness. Now, when you get an altered level of consciousness, now the unconscious patient, the first thing is uh, you have to assess the GCS. That is must. Right? If the GCS between 12 and 15, we have to investigate. But 8 to 12, urgent investigation to be done. If a GCS is less than 7, uh, need resuscitation and uh, the urgent investigation is an emergency. Right? So it could be a uh, the clinical examination and you have to do some blood work and the imaging, right? So initial evaluation of a comatose patient. So if you give a patient at the low level of the coma patient, how are you going to approach? So coma is an acute life-threatening condition. It's a medical emergency or surgical emergency. And evaluation must be swift, comprehensive, and it, it, will, it is included... Uh, resuscitation of, uh, you know, that the ABC, ARV breathing circulation, and uh, you have to check the blood pressure where the patient is having hypotension, and the glucose, IV, thiamine, and oxygen, I will come to later, and you have to quickly diagnose and evaluate and the therapy and the continuing of care. That is an article in uh, the evaluation. So coma is a medical emergency. In the emergency situation, so you have to act emergent way, right? So your adrenaline must be secreted heavily. So during emergency, you can't uh, uh, take time and do slowly and these things, right? So you have to understand, okay, this is an emergency. You have to take a quick history. As you all know that the triple gem in medicine is a history, examination and the investigation, right? But uh, sometimes you have to do these things together history and the examination. It should be a quick history. Sometimes the patient is uh, the gasping, right? The patient is a very the, in a poorly situation, but uh, you take times uh, to go through the old notes and the patient, the relatives come and say that, doctor, doctor, my patient is in, in dangerous situation. Kindly look at. So you can't shout at them, wait, 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 I'll have to collect information, but you should be quick. Right? It should be a quick uh, history. Gather all possible information from this relative. If the relatives are there, so you have to ask. Paramedics, if they are brought by the uh, 1190, then you have to ask about the, what are your observations, how was the patient. And in ambulance crew, right, it was brought by the ambulance without any medical person, you have to ask about the some sometimes ambulance crew people, what, how was he on admission to the, to the, 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 admitted to the ambulance, how was he in the ambulance, right? So, or if the bystanders available, so you have to, it should be very quick, right? So, the important thing is that the gradual onset. So, that's a, one of the important things in the history, whether this is so much of acute thing. So, the onset is one of the important things. The patient will come and say, the doctor patient was up and about and he was talking and then uh, he had uh, the, his breakfast and all of a sudden uh, he became unconscious. So that is abrupt in some onset. So sometimes the patient will say that, okay, 70 years old, the, the, the gentleman. So the gradual deterioration if level of consciousness over the few days. So that is different. So any suicidal note uh, is important. Um, think about, okay, this is a drug order. So the, whole, the suicide uh, thing. So the seizures, any head injury, headache, recent illnesses, and the past medical history of diabetes is one of the important things in a medical practice if a patient altered level of consciousness. Liver, because liver can be hepatic encephalopathy, renal diseases can cause a uremic encephalopathy, seizures, infection, alcohol, drugs, and the psychiatric disorders is important, right? And the check medication, right? So medication history. So sometimes the, you might have to check uh, with the help of a nursing staff. Right, miss, come, 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 come and closely look at this drug chart. Sorry, I don't know this medicine and I can't identify. It doesn't matter, but this is teamwork. When there is an emergency going on, and it should be your, your, your team should get together and uh, try to sort it out as early as possible. So with, uh, with the limited history, and then you quickly examining the patient. Sometimes while you are examining, you take the history. While you are examining, you, are, you get the other people's help. Right? So, okay, miss, come and uh, the, the put up the uh, pulse oximeter. Uh, you call the other house officer, come, come and check the CBS, right? Bl capillary blood sugar. Okay, you check the um, uh, blood pressure of this patient. Somebody uh, put up a drip. So, it's a, it's a kind of an emergency, miss. It's a teamwork. 
so you are the team leader because uh, you are the first contact person so when you get an unconscious person as a house officer you are the first contact person so you have a huge responsibility to identify them to sort this problem out right so so you have to be some something of a dictative ability authoritative ability so you have to be a tactful to get the other category of the people to get into the involved and the, for the benefit of the patient right go through the general examination so look for the skin where the patient is cyanose and where the patient has some rash like meningococcal rash or dengue rash where the patient is pale patient is sick is important in the hepatic encephalopathy whether there are needle marks right so for example drug addict TGL hemorrhage, right? so meningococcal septicemia is uh, one of the important stigmata of other disease like CLCD. You know that there are several peripheral stigmata like uh, uh, spidonemia, gynecomastia, diputrans, and the parotidomegaly, CKD stigmata, right? and the DM, needle prick, uh, the needle marks, and the evidence of the chronic wounds, right? Okay, and the smell of the so you have to have a good smell for, to work as a doctor. Your your the um, nose, uh, your taste and the smell is uh, one of the important things. So you should be able to what is alcohol smell, what is hepatic feet, right? This is a characteristic smell coming from the patient with the hepatic encephalopathy. Ketosis. Right? So when there is a diabetic ketoacidosis, you get a, a special type breathing called uh, the cosmal breathing, and they get a characteristic smell coming from the mouth. So you should be familiar. If you are not familiar, don't worry. It's okay. During your clinical practice, the medical student day, you might have not observed because uh, the, 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 the persons who are not working in the medical order, the, you might have not observed, find this thing, but never mind. So when you are starting internship and with the help of your seniors, familiar with this thing, uremia, uremic encephalopathy, uremic uh, smell is uh, one of the characteristic smell. So patient febrile is an important thing. Right. Hypothermia, yeah, okay, signs of trauma, hematoma, bruises of the laceration, right? So again, some clues uh, to etiology, right? So with some clue, you can think about differentials. In medicines, you have to think always differentials, uh, possibilities. In medicine, right, okay, for the presenting complaint, you think, okay, these are my possibilities. For the physical examination, these are my possibilities, right? Now, you then you anchor, anchor correct anchoring, then you can come to a quick diagnosis, right? So, hello, patient level of consciousness, uh, altered level, the patient is pale. Cerebral malaria is rare, but the reported cases still in the northern province of Sri Lanka, right? So, intracranial bleeding, patient is pale, BCS3, right? So, HUS, hemolytic urinic syndrome. So, patient is sick, I told, hepatic couple of the leptospirosis, complicated malaria, Right, so the patient is having rash, right? Meningococcal septicemia, dengue rash, measles rash, the clusteristic rash in the measles with complex spot, right? Recurrent diseases, DFI rash, and the characteristic eshka or arboviral infections, right? So, petechial, dengue, meningococcal, or the hemorrhagic fevers like leptospirosis, dengue hemorrhagic fever, and the hunter virus, right? So, head and the scalp hematoma, so traumatic, the non accidental injuries, and the dysmorphism, the neurocutaneous. What are neurocutaneous disorders? It's the disorders which involve the brain and the skin. Neurocutaneous, neuro means DNS, cutaneous means skin. Neurocutaneous, what are the neurocutaneous diseases you know that? Right? Sturge Weber syndrome and the tuberous sclerosis and uh, uh, one nipple Lindau disease and the neurofibromatosis, right? So abnormal order, I think that the DKA and the hepatic coma, right? So uh, the vitals are also important. Vital gives some clues to what is underlying, what is happening to your patient. So if the temperature, one of the important thing, you can't measure that, you get the result of this. Come and take the temperature and kindly let me know the infection. Endocrinopathy like a thyroid storm, right? So environmental infection like hypo, the hypothermia and the psychology. There's a thing called neural management syndrome, lay by blood pressure with a swinging temperature. In a psychiatric patient coming with low reduced level in the high temperature, the lay by suspect in MS, right? So symptomatic uh, overdose. The respiratory rate is important for this thing, psychology. And then the blood pressure, hypertensive encephalopathy or intracranial hemorrhage, heart rate, 
is important in these conditions and in the hypoxia right so neurological examination is a cornerstone out of after the general examination quickly you have to go to the neurological examination in unconscious patient the neurologic examination is a cornerstone of assessment so define the nature of the coma so descriptive and the systematic neurological examination that is ability it's art of medicine you have to practice so how to examine unconscious patient right that you have learned right so depending on the available uh, the, the clinical finding you have to interpret facial asymmetry whether there is a facial drooping and the with the cranial nerve the, the facial nerve has gone turning to a head to a one the turning of the head to a, uh, one side right those are observation unilateral or hypotonia asymmetrical uh, deep reflexes the unilateral uh, the extensor plantar response or the babinski sign or the unilateral fit those are the one of the important thing in the neurological examination that is a cornerstone of the assessment right so there are four pathological variables are helpful in the assessment of the neurology the respiratory pattern pupillary light reflex and the spontaneous eye movement and the motor response right we'll skip this thing and this uh, the uh, the depending on the damage of the uh, site of the lesions you can have uh, different different size of the pupil for example when there is a pontine damage you can get a pinpoint pupil when there is a midbrain damage you get the mid position fixed pupil when there is a third now uh, nuclei damage you get a dilated fixed one side is a dilated pupil right when there is a pretextual damage large fixed uh, pupils likewise depending on the site uh, you can decide the the site of lesion depending on the pupil so pupil examination is one of the important thing in the neurological examination in unconscious patient you should practice in the eye movement in the in the light stage of coma roving side to side movement is occur so that is one of the things you have to practice and you open the eyelid the patient can't open because in patient is unconscious now right forcefully you have to open the eyelids and see there's a side to side moving of the eyelids so persistent deviation to a one side right so the sometime you you may have to observe i wall is moved move the deviated to one side it could be two things irritative lesions and the paralytic lesion right irritative lesions always the eyeball is move away from the lesion suppose patient got epileptic seizure in the right frontal lobe right so the your patient i will be moved deviated to the left side Paralytic lesion towards the lesion. If there is a damage in the right frontal, the right parietal lobe, the eyeball will be deviated to the right side, same side. Structural brain stem lesion abolish the conjugate eye movement, right? So that is I will repeat it. Structural brain stem lesion abolish conjugate eye movement. So that, when there is a structural brain stem damage, no eye movement. Conjugate eye movements uh, will be lost. So oculocephalic reflex that is we call a dull side. All eyelids open and rotate uh, side to side. See the movements of eye, and the normal or positive mean the conjugate deviation of eye away from the direction of head. So this is, uh, and then there is a ocular vestibular reflex. We call it as a caloric test, right? So uh, this is uh, you can perform. Right. So this is uh, the diagrammatic representation of the oculocephalic uh, reflex or the dull side. and the caloric response and so the motor examination in neurologic examination so the bulk of motor is important whether is at whether there are fasciculation that is in the lower motor neuron lesion the tone for will rigidity so rigidity is one of the important in the examination of the unconscious patient spontaneous movement just observe what part of the limbs is moving why it is not moving whether there is a stroke whether there is a pain whether there is a fracture Asymmetrical the stimuli and the hyperreflexia, which are usually in the upper motor lesion, and the hypo usually in the paralytic medication, sometimes the myasthenia. Right. So, the, what are the lab investigation you perform for the patient with the laboratory investigation in the patient with unconscious? Glucose is one of the important thing, right? 
So this is uh, nowadays very, very commonly used the CBS capital blood fever. So any unconscious patient, you have to start with glucose, right? Glucose, because hypoglycemia is a treatable thing and it's a silent killer, right? So it's a one of the important things. If you have not practiced, practice, practice, practice it, right? So hypoglycemia. That's why I have put it as a one, right? Even a ETU, even OPD, you just uh, enter into the word. You have to, you can't do, but if you can do yourself, that's marvelous. But you let others which make a CBS check, then likewise, you have to ask the kindly uh, the nursing staff. Electrolytes or hyponatremia, one of the important things is a common thing in medical practice. The renal function, osmolality, hypersmolar, uh, the ketotic coma, the arterial blood gas analysis, one of the important things. As a house officer, this is one of the uh, the technique you have to practice, one of the things you have to do. Troponin to exclude the, the, the CS, full blood count CRP for the infection and to look for the thrombocytopenia. Coagulation profile is important, especially alcoholic patient, calcium, magnesium patient who are having seizures, LFT, toxicology screening if you are suspecting any drug orders. You have to take a urine sample as soon as the patient enters not 24 hours, 48 hours later. So you have to send to the uh, JM office for the uh, ur urinary toxicology. It's done in the most of the, uh, the big hospital. EFT, it's all urine analysis and the blood. What are the other CT scan and the MRI? De depends on not all the patient need a CT. LP might need to exclude the meningitis, encephalitis, some subarachnoid hemorrhage to look for the CSF xanthochromia, EEG, uh, to diagnose uh, the post or the non convulsive status of epilepsy and the easy and the state management. So the goal of the medical management is to prevent brain function and to prevent further damage, right? So I will repeat it. The goal of the medical management is to prevent brain function, preserve brain function and to prevent further damage. That's it. That is the goal, right? So assure oxygenation. That is why you take the saturation. If the saturation is low, you have to assure oxygenation. Maintain perfusion. What's the blood pressure? So put up a drip. And with the help of other people, other category of people, put up a drip. Give glucose and thiamine. Why it is I, I have highlighted here? Glucose, so that is the, the CBS monitoring is important. If alcoholic comes with a hypoglycemia, so first you have to give thiamine and then glucose. Thiamine. So you know, I have few patients over the last three, four months, and then the binge alcohol drink, and the, with the background of CLCD came with a severe hypoglycemia detected four or five hours later. They have a, a neuroglycopenia and the brain dead. So waited for a two months, one patient in my ward and dead. Right? So it's a such important, simple thing, but you have to know the important uh, the importance of taking CBS and uh, giving time in for the alcoholic. When so evaluation, so stop seizures, anti seizure medication. Resto acid base balance and the correct electrolyte abnormalities and the glucose control. If it is high, you have to institute the insulin and the treat infections, so all the antibiotic after blood culture and the early nutrition is one of the important things. And the DVT prophylaxis and the antipyretics and the cordial protection. So intubation indication in such situation. So you have to always discuss with the seniors and to get the intubation. So you have to improve as a house officer. And not a house officer, it's a one of the important skills to be developed by a doctor. So current doctors, they are reluctant, right? So even at SHO level, they call the anesthetic doctor always to intubate the patient. No, practice, practice, practice. Now onward from your intern, right? And uh, important to take the entire clinical before uh, intubation. That's a good decision. You can't decision. Support the 80 years old uh, CIA with the advanced COPD, CKD. Are you going to intubate and put into ICU? No, never, right? Due to the precious bed and the, this uh, cost uh, of the ICU care. Yeah. Inadequate ventilatory support is an indication. Impending airway loss from the neck or the pharyngeal injury, yes. Poor airway protection due to decreased level of consciousness, yes, you have to intubate the patient. Potential for the neurological deterioration, yes. Earlier GCS 10, now GCS 7. So you have to protect elective intubation. Rule of thumb is when the GCS is less than eight, you have to uh, do an elective intubation and put into the ICU. In the absence of other indications, defer intubation, right? So, prognosis of the coma, 
<clears throat> recovery from the coma depends primarily on the, uh, on the cause rather than on the depth of the coma, right? On admission, GCS is three, right? So underlying things you have to, so patient is hypoglycemia, you treat, patient recover, right? On admission, GCS is seven, a patient met with a severe road traffic accident, right? So, but his recovery delayed and delayed and patient stay for three months and passed away with a uh, pneumonia. So that is why recovery from coma depends primarily on the cause rather than the depth of the coma. Understood? Right. Okay. Intoxication and metabolic causes carry the best prognosis, right? So metabolic causes, best prognosis. Hypoglycemia, you can treat. Hepatic encoblet, you can treat. Diabetic ketosis, best prognosis. Coma from the traumatic head injury, far better than those with coma from the structural causes, right? And the coma from the global hypoxic ischemic carries least favorable prognosis. Recently, when I was in Ratnapura, there was a pregnant lady transferred from uh, the Kahamat Hospital. So uh, the patient had got a cardiac arrest, and anyhow, they couldn't uh, intubate, and the proper intubation not done. And then the patient, the tube was in the stomach, and then the patient transfer. We kept that lady for uh, three months in the ICU, hypoxic brain damage, so passed away. Right, so ischemic, hypoxic, ischemic carrier state. Length of the coma and the increasing age are the poor prognosis. So if it is young patients are potential to uh, recover. So if you get a young unconscious patient and eight years on unconscious patient, at the same time, you are the receiving house officer in the medical ward, you should pay more attention to the young patient with, because young recovery is uh, recovery. It's a, it's a case by case, case by case, right? Okay, so brainstem reflexes early in the coma are important predictor of the outcome. So in summary, uh, approach to the patient in a coma requires systematic examination that will then direct diagnostic test, right? I will repeat it. Approach to the patient in coma requires systematic examination that will then direct the diagnostic testing, right? If the GCS is four, are you doing CT on admission? No, it's a pathetic situation in most of the low GCS in ETU, they do a CT and before they come to the, right? Actual diagnosis is a hypoglycemia. So just give a glucose and recover rather than the wasting CT, right? So that is why systematic, that is why you're trained, you are having MBBS, that is why you have to use your brain, right? You are not a technician. So house of is a medical doctor is not a technician. So you are not the investigation interpreter. You are a scientific person. Use your this science, the beauty, admire the beauty of this medicine and plan investigation and, and it should be a methodical approach. The GCS score is a helpful in providing a baseline for the comparison, but it not prognostic and non-traumatic brain injury. I call GCS how it is important. It's helpful in providing the baseline for the comparison. Right? So earlier GCS is this one, now GCS is this one. This is important, but it's not a prognostically in a non-traumatic brain injury. Prognosis is better with toxic metabolic rather than the structural damage. I told it. I always detect the, the, the toxic metabolic cases and the, the speed fast and then you can do a quick uh, recovery. The clinical examination and now EEG may be the best predictor, right? So clinical examination is the best predictor. Who has the, going to do a clinical exam? You are the, right? You are the best clinicians, right? So you should master your examination technique and do your best for the patient. With that, I will conclude. Thank you for your patient listening. Roshan, if you have a, a time, uh, the audience yes. can uh, give questions, but if the time constraint, I can hand over to the other lecturer. Yes, sir. we have given you extra 10 minutes with, for that important lecture, sir. Right. Okay, so anyways, Roshan. very interesting lecture, sir. Uh, I hope they didn't lose any conscious during the time, but uh, <laughs> if you all have any questions, please uh, type in. Uh, so I would like to answer them. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will go to the next lecture by uh, Dr. V. Sujantina, uh, consultant physician, on the topic of approach to AKI. So, uh, thank you, sir, uh, Dr. Manushri Ratna, consultant physician at uh, PGH Badul. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Most welcome. Most welcome. Hello, Roshan. Can you hear me? 
Yes, Madam Kenny, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that brief introduction. Um, hope they are all awake and listening to the lecture. So, um, so the uh, topic I'm going to do is an outline on the approach to a, a patient with an acute kidney injury. So I'm not going to discuss in detail about the individual cause of the acute kidney injury or its uh, investigation or management. This is just going to be an outline where the intern medical officer should know when a patient comes to the medical ward or surgical ward or, or option gynae or pediatric ward, they should be able to suspect acute kidney injury and uh, appropriately take the history and the examination and then um, do the uh, immediate management. So that is the task or the goal of this lecture today for the um, doctors who are going to start on their uh, internship very soon. So my topic will be um, under these subheadings, a brief introduction about the acute kidney injury, uh, types of the acute kidney injury, few case scenario for different types of acute kidney injury, the clinical features in overall for all the types of AKI and the investigations in general, management, and few words about the management of hyperkalemia because you know that is an emergency where a patient with AKI can present to you and you should not miss the diagnosis of hyperkalemia. If you miss, as a house officer, the patient may end up in developing the cardiac rhythm disorders and the cardiac arrest. So that is one of the important complications where everybody should be able to diagnose it, confirm it by the investigation and treat appropriately. So as you all know, AKI uh, is actually defined as an abrupt deterioration in the renal function over hours or days. Okay? It is very common in if you take the hospitalized patients, around 15% of the all hospital admission patients can develop AKI during either an admission or during the course of their illness. So this is such a common uh, clinical problem you may encounter in any wards. It doesn't need to be a medical ward. It can be any ward. And you all know when you say it is AKI, the first thing comes to our mind is the oliguria. It's often a feature. But remember, there are AKI where the urine output can be normal or or closer to normal, but still they can have AKI where you label them as a non-oliguric acute kidney injury. And the most important thing is you need to identify it as AKI because most of the time it is reversible or at least you can prevent the progression of the disease. Uh, the other clinical presentation is they can, as I said earlier, they can come with hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, fluid overload, these are complications of AKI, but the presentation may be with one of these things. And you need to identify these complications immediately and manage. Now, there are many causes for AKI. We will discuss uh, for different types of AKI uh, in detail later. But remember the sepsis-related organ failure uh, sepsis related AKI and organ failure related AKI, such as the cardiac related or the hepatorenal AKI, those have a high mortality. So, they, those are very complicated. You don't need to know in detail about uh, these management. But remember, sepsis, one of the important complications is the acute kidney injury. Okay, before we go into the Types of the AKI, few terms, as I said, oliguria is very common. So what do you mean by oliguria is definitely, you know, that the urine output is less than 400 ml per day and, and it has a worse prognosis. Okay? So the causes, it could be either a pre-renal failure or, as I said, an organ-related um, AKI like hepatorenal syndrome. And urea, there is almost no urine output, or at least less than 100 ml per, uh, per 24 hours. And remember, if the anuria is of abrupt in onset, always you need to suspect whether there could be any obstructive cause for the AKI. That is very important. 
when a perfectly well patient comes with an anuria with few hours duration, you need to suspect whether the patient has developed any obstruction and that is the cause of AKI. Or it could be a catastrophic injury to both kidneys as in a rapidly proliferative glomerular nephritis or uh, acute cortical necrosis that may be the cause. Non-oliguria, as I said, where the urine output remains above 400 ml per day, but still they have acute kidney injury. These are very common with acute interstitial nephritis, especially drug-induced acute uh, interstitial nephritis or abdomyolysis or contrast-induced AKI. So always remember, now we go with the urine output, but there are certain causes where the urine output may remain stable, but still patient can develop AKI and the other complications related to AKI. I think during your MBBS course, you all are familiar with this classification of AKI with the rifle and the KDIGO um, classification. Uh, I'm sure you don't, I don't need to go through this again, but the two criteria they get for this classification is the creatinine and the urine output. But as you know, both have their own advantages and disadvantages. Remember the the severity of the creatinine may not actually reflect the severity of the AKI at times. Okay? And the urine output also, as I mentioned, there are non-oliguric um, AKI as well. So this is a standardized classification system. You all know already where you categorize as risk, injury, failure, loss, or leading to end-stage renal disease. The KDIGO is the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcome AKI classification. And it also uses the same um, uh, factors like serum creatinine and the urine excretion um, level. And it classifies into uh, three severe cases, grade one and two and three. So I'm not going in detail. You all are aware about these classifications. Why this is important? So you can assess the severity and the prognosis of the AKI based on these things. So we will move on to the types of AKI, which is very important as an intern house officer to suspect whether this is a pre-renal AKI or it is an intrinsic or a renal AKI or a post-renal AKI. It is very simple. Because you know pre-renal, pre-renal then structurally the kidneys are normal. There are some other issues with the circulation of the volume. In the renal, you have structural changes in the kidney. And the post-renal is following the kidney whether, whether there are some obstructions. So that is easy for you to understand and easy for you to identify the etiology as well. So this is the common causes I have tabulated here. So pre-renal is generally due to a hypovolemia. So hypovolemia can be due to any reason. It can be a GI loss, a renal loss, or loss from the skin or a third space loss. So there are many causes of hypovolemia. We will go through that later. Or it may be organ-related, as I said, cardiac failure with very low ejection fraction, with the poor renal perfusion, you can develop AKI, liver failure, or renal artery occlusion or sepsis with the poor perfusion. So those are, they all will come under the pre-renal AKI. Renal, as I said, there is damage to the renal parenchyma, either glomerulus, tubules, or the ducts. It can be an RPGN or any other glomerular nephritis. Acute tubular necrosis due to drugs or toxins, or interstitial nephritis, again, due to drugs or infections. Post-renal, there could be obstruction, starting from the calices in the pelvic region to the uh, meatal or up to the meatal stenosis or ure external urethral orifice, you can have obstruction at any level causing a postrenal AKI. So I'll take you to these three types of AKI with a uh, few examples. Okay? So then it is easy for you all to understand the clinical presentation and the management of each types. So now we have got a 50-year-old male who has presented with diarrhea and vomiting of two days duration with oliguria of 12 hours duration. On admission, patient is drowsy, 
Heart rate is 120 beats per minute and blood pressure is 80 by 50. We have requested an urgent invasive renal function test where it has revealed that urea of 25, here and creatinine is 320 micromoles per liter, sodium 136, potassium 2.8. So the question is, how will you manage this patient? So I think for the, because of the time factor, I will keep on discussing this. Now you can see this is a, a otherwise healthy patient coming with the diarrhea and vomiting. So there is a GI loss with oliguria and there is an AKI. And patient is tachycardic and hypotensive. So there is definitely there is hypovolemia, likely a hypovolemic shock also. The investigation shows that urea high, creatinine high, but there is a discrepancy. The blood urea is slightly higher than the creatinine uh, for the level of creatinine. And then there is hypokalemia as well as mild hyponatremia. Okay, so this is all compatible with the GI blood GI loss, fluid loss, causing hypovolemia and a free renal type of AKI. So here you know your task is to give the fluid appropriate fluid resuscitation and also to look after the electrolytes because that may lead to again arrhythmia. So you need to look after both the fluid, need intense fluid resuscitation as well as the electrolyte correction that will recover the patient's acute kidney injury. So it is not a magic at a house officer level. You should be able to diagnose this is as, this as a pre-renal AKI and you should be able to request electrolytes as one of the important investigation other than the renal function test and manage at your level with the fluid as well as the electrolyte correction. So few things about the pre-renal AKI, as you all know, this is either due to uh, inadequate uh, perfusion due to a circulation issue or an intrarenal vessel motor constriction, you can get the pre-renal AKI. So as I said earlier, here the nephrons are structurally normal or intact. Okay. And it is the most common form of AKI in many patients, especially in hospitalized patients. And remember, if you don't treat the pre-renal AKI on time, and it, it uh, persists for some time, it will lead to an intrinsic acute kidney injury in the form of acute tubular necrosis. So this is very important that you need to suspect this patient is having pre-renal AKI and start the prompt fluid resuscitation so that the complication can be prevented. If the patient comes very late, you may have seen already few patients that their recovery of, from the AKI is very slow or it may not be back to the normal level. So that is because of the complications they develop. So I have, I think, discussed the causes in general. The volume depletion, you all know, renal GI loss, burns, hemorrhage, or pancreatitis with third phase loss. Then the decreased cardiac output, you can get in any cardiac condition like heart failure, pulmonary embolism, acute myocardial infarction, valvular heart disease, or even abdominal compartment syndrome because of the increased abdominal pressure, then you can have reduced uh, perfusion of the kidney. So this is also one of the causes. And then sepsis and anaphylaxis, you all know, because of the systemic vasodilation, you have pre-renal AKI. And then there are certain drugs and uh, uh, hepatorenal syndrome. So those are the common causes. But out of all this, the thing that you should remember is the volume depletion, as well as the cardiac, uh, liver, as well as sepsis. And uh, those are the common causes for the pre-renal AKI. So how do you treat the pre-renal AKI? It is very simple. You treat the underlying cause okay? and you need to give fluid resuscitation. So that is most appropriate in cases where there is fluid loss, but it may not be very appropriate in cases of heart failure where you need to balance your fluid um, management very carefully. Okay? So that is why the treating the underlying cause also equally important in treating the pre-renal AKI. And you need to keep on monitoring the blood pressure, heart rate, and the urine output to see the improvement with, the, with your fluid 
uh, resuscitation. So these are, this is very simple. You give the fluid resuscitation appropriately and also treat the underlying cause. So moving on to the second case, this is a 65 year old male with preceding symptoms of blood outflow tract obstruction, presents with a new area of 18 hours duration. The blood pressure on admission was 150-90, lungs are clear, patient has suprapubic tenderness and swelling noted on admission. So here again, the blood urea and creatinine are high. How will you manage this patient? Again, simple. Now you can see the patient is having preceding obstructive symptoms and has come with anuria, which is an abrupt in onset. So always you need to suspect an obstructive uropathy. And on the clinical examination, you could see there is a suprapubic tenderness and swelling, which is indicative of a distended bladder. So obviously, you know there is an obstructive pathology. And in this patient, the immediate thing that you need to do is to catheterize the patient because there is a distended bladder and relieve the obstruction. Sometimes still you can have this uh, obstructive uropathy, maybe at a higher level, whereas both kidneys may be swollen with uh, bilateral hydronephrosis. In that case, an urgent ultrasound abdomen is needed before you go on to uh, do any intervention. So bedside quick examination as well as an ultrasound abdomen is helpful in this patient. So, so this is a post-renal AKI. So as I said, the obstruction can be from calyces to the external urethral orifice. Common in elderly is prostate, stone disease, or stricture, or stenosis, or sometimes the neurogenic bladder as well. So the important information you should know is any unexplained acute kidney injury, you need to do an ultrasound KUB to exclude the obstruction in these patients because, again, obstruction is a reversible thing you can do, and you can do immediate intervention. Okay, So the treatment is based on to find out where the obstruction is and then do the appropriate intervention. As well as you need to treat the complications of AKI. If the patient is having hyperkalemia, acidosis or fluid overload, you need to treat appropriately. So the third case is a 25-year-old female, a known patient with SLE, uh, with mainly a dermatological manifestation on hydroxychloroquine presented with reduced urine output, hematuria, and shortness of breath. So on admission, she has a malar rash, pulsate is 96, blood pressure high, 150, 100, and there were bibasal crepitations. How will you assess her initially and manage? Now, this patient is not a straightforward case. You know, patient is having an underlying systemic disease, SNLE, but during uh, initial period, she had mainly dermatological manifestations. That is why she was put on FCQ. So now coming with reduced urine output, hematuria and shortness of breath, obviously you should suspect whether the patient is having a renal involvement now with or without a pulmonary uh, involvement. Okay. So in this patient, as the house officer, you should be able to suspect whether it could be a locus nephritis and your task is to appro do appropriate investigation. So the investigations, you know that you need to ask for an urgent UFR to see for red cells, protein, red cell cast. Okay? And if appropriate, you need to ask for a urine protein creatine ratio. You need to have the renal function test. You need to have full blood count and ESR, CRP to see other manifestations of SLE and so on. The rest will be carried out with the teamwork because you know this patient is likely having a lupus nephritis and may end up in having a renal biopsy urgently and appropriate treatment for the lupus nephritis. So as a house officer, you should be able to alert the team about this patient because this patient is, is a young patient with an underlying disease and coming with the renal manifestations which need urgent attention and sometimes an urgent renal biopsy and treatment. So these are the things that you need to pick up when these patients come to the ward and, and pass on these messages to, the, to your seniors. So few things about the renal or the intrinsic AKI. So the whole mark is structural and the functional damage to the nephrons. Okay? 
the most common cause is the acute tubular necrosis. It may be due to cytotoxic ischemic or inflammatory insult to kidney. And as I said earlier, if you don't treat the pre-renal AKI and if it prolongs for a certain time, it may lead to an ischemic ATN, which again is a renal type of AKI. So this is a brief outline on the causes of intrinsic uh, causes of AKI. So you can classify them as vascular causes, glomerular causes, tubular causes, and interstitial one. The vascular causes are, you know, that is uh, mainly the renal artery occlusion or vein occlusion or microangiopathic conditions. The glomerular causes, that is what we discussed in the case, immune complex mediated glomerular nephritis or anchor associated vasculitis or anti dbm disease. Tubular causes are mainly due to the drugs and the toxins. So you can see many drugs can cause tubular damage, heme pigments or crystals. Okay. Interstitial, again, due to drugs and infection and systemic diseases. So this is a general outline on the causes of intrinsic AKI. So that now we have gone through the different types of acute kidney injury. We will go through the clinical features in general for all the types. So as I said, the common presentation could be low urine output, hematuria and proteinuria you may suspect in renal causes. Patient may have features of dehydration in the pre-renal causes due to hypovolemia. In addition, they can have dry skin or dry mucosa, tachycardia, and hypotension. Patient may have features of complications of AKI, like fluid overload, acidosis, that is very common. Sometimes they may come with hypertension, as in the case we discussed in SLE, it could be a manifestation or they can come with a uremia with uremic features. Or the patient may come without giving the history of AKI, they may come with the history of the underlying etiology. So as the intern medical officer, your task is to find out all these, the clinical features of AKI, as well as the complications of AKI, as well as the etiology of AKI. That is what we know from the medical student period. We, we analyze the presenting symptom in that way. So how are we going to investigate the patient with AKI? Again, you know, you need to have the renal function test. That's the most important thing. And at least daily, in some instances, you may need to do even twice a day. So blood urea, creatinine, and the renal function test, along with the electrolytes, because they, they can lead to a life-threatening complication. ABG is important to assess for metabolic acidosis. You can have a brief idea before you get the serum electrolytes to have a uh, look for hyperkalemia. UFR is important in case of infection as well as the glomerular pathology. UPCR also the same. Full blood count, DSR, CRP, again, infective causes as well as the systemic connective, connective tissue disease. You ask for an ECG especially in cases of AKI, when you suspect hyperkalemia, you need to look for features of hyperkalemia. You all know what are the changes you will see in ECG in hyperkalemia, that is tall tender T wave with a broad QRS complex and a prolonged PR interval. And in severe cases, you may get sine waves as well. Test X-ray is helpful to find out pulmonary edema or if there are any conditions causing pulmonary renal syndrome, you can see hemorrhage or even infiltrates. Blood and urine cultures are important in conditions of sepsis. And then you can, these are the basic investigations you need to do in any patients with acute kidney injury. But then certain investigations you can do to identify the cause of AKI. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the renal ultrasound scan is very important to cases of the post-renal AKI or an obstructive cause. Black picture is important in cases of sepsis, uh, especially you can confirm BIC or other conditions like hemolytic uremic syndrome or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, CPK levels are helpful in rhabdomyolysis. Autoimmune screening is helpful in cases with glomerulonephritis, HIV, hepatitis, serology, also the same. 
and remember renal biopsy as i said rpgn is one of the catastrophic injury that can happen and can come with aki uh, due to a renal type of a renal parenchymal injury so in those instances renal biopsy is important now as an intern house officer you should know what how to prepare a patient for renal biopsy and how to care a patient following the renal biopsy so first of all you should identify what is the indication for the renal biopsy you should know any procedure you need to get the informed written consent you need to uh, get a full back count and ptinr to assess for any bleeding diathesis you need to send for blood grouping and cross matching and make sure that you exclude the contraindication especially uh, bleeding disorders or single kidneys or sometimes uncontrolled hypertension those are contraindications you need to look for so the procedure is done by the nephrologist or the radiologist or the physician so you need to observe how they do but the post procedure care is under you again so the patient should be in the ward and monitored for next 8 to 24 hours patient fluid intake needs to be maximized but you need to assess not in all cases if the patient is already having aki with fluid overload you may not be able to give otherwise generally if the patient is not overloaded you can maximize the fluid intake to prevent clot colic you need to keep on monitoring these patients especially for blood pressure if there is a sudden rise in blood pressure you always need to suspect whether there is any perirenal hematoma causing the rise in blood pressure so you need to watch for evidence of any complications so vital monitoring any hematuria all these things you need to monitor and you need to advise the patient to avoid heavy work for next two weeks so management in brief so you know you need to keep on monitoring the fluid balance so this advice you need to give it to the patient as well as the uh, nursing staff daily weight lying and the standing blood pressure always look at the drug chart and make sure that the nephrotoxic medications are with this is one of the important thing in your career looking at the drug chart and make sure that the nephrotoxic medications are stopped in a case of aki okay, you don't want to continue losartan or metformin or nsaid in these patients where they have already aki so if hypovolemic hydrate the patient and you need to hydrate with the crystalloids or appropriate fluid and make sure that patient uh, hypovolemia is corrected if fluid overloaded you need to restrict the fluid hyperkalemia identify and treat it if there is acidosis you can treat with sodium bicarbonate if there is pulmonary edema you can consider giving prosimide infusion if failed go for the dialysis if there is infection treat the infection appropriate antibiotic is essential say pyelonephritis needs treatment sometimes leptospirosis can cause aki so patient needs treatment antibiotic for leptospirosis so restrict the sodium potassium you need to consider hemodialysis but you know these are the indications but the decisions can be taken by the treating physician so symptomatic uremia uncontrolled hyperkalemia resistant to medical treatment pulmonary edema severe acidosis sometimes just for the removal of the drugs you may do the hemodialysis as well so the hemodialysis can be done in any form intermittent hemodialysis or continuous venovenous hemofiltration or pd whichever is found to be appropriate so you need to get the nephrologist advice as, as needed urologist when you suspect a post renal aki and you need to relieve the obstruction you need to hide that is what i told about the rpgn so you do the renal biopsy and pending the renal biopsy report the patient will receive the treatment but this decision again will be taken by the treating physician but you are part of the team okay. one important message i want to give you is that sometimes um, you may think any patients with low urine output give prosimide that is not correct okay remember prosimide is not helpful in increasing the urine output when the unless the patient is hypovolemic so in the other cases don't give prosimide don't give prosimide in a ca case of hypovolemic patient where it will lead for the lead to a dangerous complication so patient with to appropriate treatment will recover 
So recovery may take around one to three weeks. Renal function may slowly improve. And you may see there is an increase in urine output with the improvement in the kidney function. And it may go into a diuretic or diuretic phase as well. So don't worry about that. You may have to increase the fluid in intake slightly, but it lasts only a few days and a, a patient will recover. So the prognosis depends on the cause of the injury, presence or absence of the pre-existing kidney disease, as well as whatever the duration of renal dysfunction prior to the therapeutic intervention. So as I said before I wind up my lecture, few things about the management of hyperkalemia because it is one of the dangerous complications of AKI. So all of you should know how to manage hyperkalemia. So first, stop all the potassium-containing food, drugs, or potassium-retaining uh, any uh, components. So that is uh, number one, you all should know. And then if there are ECG changes of hyperkalemia or if there is a significant hyperkalemia, you need to start on calcium gluconate. The dose, everybody should know, 10%, 10 ml over 5 to 10 minutes, and you can repeat, and it is given to stabilize the cardiac muscles. Insulin dextrose infusion you can give as 50%, 50 ml dextrose with 10 units soluble insulin over 10 to 15 minutes. Again, you can repeat these doses. Nebulization salbutamol is given as 10 milligram nebulizer over five minutes. These are the initial treatment, but sometimes you may consider giving sodium bicarbonate. It is not to reduce the potassium. If there is associated acidosis without pulmonary edema, you can consider. Similarly, if there is fluid overload, you can give prosimide. Okay? If the hyperkalemia is refractory for all the above measures, then you have to consider hemodialysis uh, in those patients. Okay? And if hyperkalemia is persistent after even with all these treatment, even with the dialysis is recurring, you may consider giving potassium binders, but this is mainly for CKD patients because AKI, we have discussed most of them recover completely and you need to treat the underlying cause appropriately. So this is the last slide for you all to think about. There are cases you see AKI on the background of CKD, very common. Many CKD patients in stage three or four coming with an acute kidney injury. So you need to suspect in all the patients you see with CKD, always suspect with the history of AKI, whatever we have discussed. And also look at the duration of symptoms. Compare with the cu current uh, renal function with the previous renal function and see whether there is an abrupt deterioration on the renal function test. So likely that could be due to AKI. So rapid change in the creatinine, or rapid change in the estimated GFR over days or weeks, always suspect whether there is an acute insult in the CKD patient. So the acute insult is whatever we have discussed so far will come. So I'm not going in detail, but just make you aware, this is very common in the medical wards to see an acute on a chronic kidney disease. Okay? So they may have other manifestations of CKD in the history and the examination. So to summarize, as intern house officers, you should be able to recognize the AKI from the history and examination, and you should be able to request appropriate investigations to confirm AKI and also to look for the causes of acute kidney injury. And you should be able to give the prompt early initial therapeutic intervention to have a better outcome. I hope this is of use for you all uh, when you start in the intern uh, period. And if you have any doubts, I think we don't have time, you can write in the chat box, which I can respond. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vijaninta, uh, consultant, senior lecturer at Teaching Hospital Jaffna on the theme of approach to uh, AKI. So uh, if you'll have a question, as Madam says, type on the chat box. So. We will start the next lecture by Dr. Chamar Dalugana, consultant physician, uh, on the approach to SOB. Over to you, sir.
Um, all right. Okay, um, good afternoon. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes, what I'm going to discuss is how uh, you as a house officer would approach to a patient who has shortness of breath. So for the next 30 minutes, of course, I'm not going to discuss uh, COPD, bronchial asthma, or interstitial anxiety, so heart failure in detail because of two main reasons. The first reason is, of course, 30 minutes is not adequate to at least discuss individual disease in detail. And the second thing is, you as house officers, you are the first encounter doctors and the patients will not come and tell you, doctor, look here, I have a bronchial asthma exacerbation or I have interstitial lung disease and I think I have got an infection on top of that. But simply what they will come and tell you is either they will tell they have shortness of breath or else they will be too unwell with breathlessness. So you will have to find it out, right? Therefore, uh, so the, my talk, the next 30 minutes, I will mainly focus on approach into a patient who has this general complaint of shortness of breath. And the other important thing I want to specify is that as house officers, you need to sort of get out of the mentality of a medical student because as house officers, you will be the only person in between the life and death of a sick human, right? So in that case, you need to act smart, act fast, and you need to attend to all these medical emergencies, right? So of course, when there is an emergency, you can ask for help, but the problem is that when the help comes in one minute, two minutes, or in 15 minutes, that may be too late. And as a house officer back many years back, what I remember is the brain cells and heart cells, they hardly can regenerate. They can't regenerate. So if there is a slightest delay in attending to the patient or else making a right diagnosis and giving the appropriate management in a timely manner, you are going to kill those. And then patient is going to have a lifelong suffering. So keeping that in mind, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to reflect a couple of common or very authentic scenarios that happened in a medical ward, right? So basically this is not to find fault with anyone, but this is what you call to go for a reflective thinking about a problem, right? So whenever we do something, if it is not right, we are supposed to sort of think about that thing, which is called reflective thinking. So that immensely help you to sort of improve your practice, right? So these are two scenarios which I'm going to discuss that happened. Uh, and so I didn't actually take photographs of the BHDs because I thought that is not that professional. So this is basically the summary. So the scenario one is, this, this is the house officer's clerking, right? So the house officer has put his name, very good, time and date. And then this is a 65 year old male with a history of heavy and active smoking. And when you go through his clinic book, it says, in the first cover, he has COPD. And actually, when you turn the pages, there are multiple admissions with exacerbations. For this year, for this particular patient, he has been admitted to the same ward, same site, three times and managed as COPD exacerbations. And then the HO writes, okay, worsening shortness of breath for one day. And these are the house officer's examination findings. So he's dysnic, pulse rate is 100, blood pressure is 100 by 70, and the saturation is 84%. And this actually, I got a photograph. This is about the lung examination. So you can hardly see the, this is a lung. Yeah, both lungs. And there's an arrow which says, can you read this? What do you see here? Yes, it is written as Krebs. So not specified which lung have been Krebs and whether they are fine or cause, whether they disappear, that's all right. So there are some Krebs. So the impression of the house officer was that whether this is a COPD exacerbation, right? So he has planned investigations such as text was ordered, full blood count, CRP, electrolyte creatinine, and liver function tests, right? The authentic case I'm discussing. And then documented ABG. Actually, that time, the hospital was not doing ABGs because we were not getting cartridges. Right. So that was the set of investigations he has ordered. And then the management was the standard textbook management. Good. So the patient was getting nebulizations with salbutamol and Ipravent, had prednisolone, IV coamoxiclav, and was started on oxygen via venturi 28%. Right. So this patient was in the ward. Luckily, he survived until the next day morning. And this is actually when the consultant or the senior person doing the ward down, there were a few missing points in this initial clerking of the house officer. The first question was, where is the history? 
Yes, there is only one sentence, worsening sugar, shortness of breath for one day. And then where is examination? Of course, yes, there is something, this snake, pulse rate, blood pressure, saturation. I mean, this thing can be done by even a nurse or even a minor staff person. The basic observations and this one doesn't give much of information, right? There are a few crackers in the lungs, which you would always expect in a COPD patient. And then the, regarding the investigations, yes. Just, just text your order. Okay, that's fine. Full blood count CRP, but LFTs. So why? What? What are you going to make out with the liver function tests? And finally, now he has ordered a chest X-ray, and patient attended for the X-ray in the middle of the night. But did you chase the chest X-ray, or did you see the chest X-ray? For all these questions, the poor house officer was like this. Actually, yeah, I mean, these questions were asked in a very constructive manner, but he was. Confused, right? So where is the history? Where is the examination? Why I have asked for LFTs? And I, yes, I ordered a chest X-ray, but did I chase it? Right, so we'll go to the history. So we were taking, a, I'll minimize this one. Uh, right, so this was the history of the patient. So patient was a heavy smoker, progressively worsening breathlessness over five to six years, cough and wheeze, he's on inhalers. And yes, true, he has admitted three times in the in this year with increase in shortness of breath and increased sputum. And what happened today morning was something different. So today, today morning, he had acutely worsening breathlessness with right-sided pleuritic chest pain. But he does not complain of fever, no increased sputum production, right? So this was the history, right? So this taking this sort of a history by a house officer is not a tedious task, right? It's very simple things. As Professor William Mosler said, you talk to the patient and he's telling you the diagnosis. So you need to spend at least a couple of minutes sort of digging into what really brought the patient to the hospital this time, right? So for need, for this thing, you need not to be the, in the top of the merit list, but any, any student with MBBS, with some common sense, should be able to extract this history, right? And then the examination is, again, I'm not going into sort of very specific things, but he was breathless at rest, rate was 30, and trachea is obviously in the left side, deviated to left. And the chest was not expanding in the right. It was hyperresonant, and breath sounds were absent in the right hemithorax, right? And then the question was the chest x-ray. The X-ray was done 12 hours back, and we had to send the minor staff to the radiology department to get the X-ray and come back. And this is what we saw in the X-ray, right? So there's a fairly large pneumothorax. Yes. So this patient, maybe patient was lucky, survived overnight without any complications, but this was missed, right? And then the other thing is doing this AST, ALT, the liver function tests, how does it help the diagnosis and management, right? Okay, so if you just reflect on this case, what are the things that we could have done better, right? So, I mean, this is why how a house officer has approached the patient with shortness of breath, right? So you can take a few minutes and reflect on this and think how could you have improved on this? So I just want to highlight a few principles. One thing is history is the most important thing, right? So unlike in medical student days, as a house officer, you have access to all the patient's records, right? So when the patient comes and sits by you, the first thing you might take is a clinic book. There's no wrong with that, right? And you open the clinic book and you find something. You see very recently patient was admitted several times with the COVID exacerbation. And you might ask, he will say yes. So then... You make your diagnosis, there oh, must be a COPD exacerbation, and you do the standard. But this is not what is expected, right? So always spend some quality time, spend some quality time, at least a couple of minutes, to get a good history from the patient. And also, you don't have to examine the patient as in a short case, but the basic things, right? The rate, the trachea, and then the auscultation and the percussion. That would tell you the diagnosis. And very importantly, as house officers, you need to be accountable and responsible, right? So I will never blame anyone else if the investigations are missing. Because if a house officer has ordered the investigation, it is not the responsibility of the nursing staff or the minor staff to chase it. It is your responsibility. So you need to remember, if you have ordered a chest texture for a patient, you need to chase it, right? So in this patient, he survived. But what if the next day morning when you come for the ward round and if you find the patient is dead and gone, 
right? Then you get the chest X-ray and you see there is a tension pneumothorax. Just imagine how you would feel, right? So sometimes you might remember this for the rest of your life. But this is a simple thing that you can do, right? So always, if you forget, you just make a note. Keep a small handbook with you. Make a note for this particular bed number 31. I ordered the chest X-ray. So before I go at 10 o'clock, maybe the on-call person is coming. Either you chase it before that or you hand it over. So in house officers, this handing over job should be very well streamlined, right? Okay. Right. So we'll go to the next scenario, right? Okay. So next scenario, again, a house officer, and the time is 3.50 in the afternoon, right? So it's a stat admission, right? So you have been already had lectures, no? stat admission is you are basically supposed to see the patient as soon as possible, right? And so usually the stat admissions come through the OPD, and the OPD doctor has put an out, yes, shortness of breath with chest pain, and he has queried MI with heart failure. Possible, right? So when you talk to the patient, so this house officer took a brief history, a 57-year-old lady with diabetes and hypertension. Coming with personal shortness of breath for last three days duration. She's orthopnic and having paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And you ask about chest pain, yes, on and off, she's having chest pain as well. Right, so this is the observation examination of the house officer. Yes, found that there is ankle edema and heart rate is 106, uh, 120 beats per minute. And blood pressure was 150 by 90. And lungs, yes, there are some crackers, right? So these few crack crackers, scattered crepitations, crepes plus plus is something that we often see in the bed head tickets clocked by the house officer, right? Okay. Then what happened? So ordered the ECG, and these were the investigations ordered by the house officer. So ordered a full blood count, blood urea, serum creatinine, and a serum electrolyte, a 12 lead ECG, and a troponin, right? Right, so ECG was done and this good house officer has chased the ECG then and then he found there are some uh, T inversions, right? So one, two, three, A, B, F, and then there's V, four to V, six. They're not deep symmetrical T inversions, but there's ECG is not normal, I would say. It's abnormal. There are some strain, there's some T inversions. So we have ischemic looking ECG. And then these investigations were ordered and that period, our hospital was not doing troponin. The regions were out of stock. So the house office has given the troponin to be done from a private laboratory. And then the basic investigations were ordered from us, right? So the private laboratory, they took the blood immediately and the patient's uh, husband came to the hospital with a troponin report, which says 56, there's a small uh, typo, 56 uh, the units per liter. The cutoff is 70. So the only available things are patient has a bit of on and off chest pain and a troponin is high, elevated, is positive, and the ECG looks somewhat ischemic. So our house officer made a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, right? And particularly a non STEMI and started loaded with estrogen statin, inoxaparin, crusamide, and losat. Right. And then the next day morning in the ward round. Now the patient had enough suffering in the night and the following day ward round, the patient was looking more breathless than unwell. And by that time only, the nurses have attached the previous day lab reports that you have sent to the hospital lab. To see lab reports, yes, what will happen is the hemoglobin is 4.5, right? Okay. And the AST, ALT, AST was slightly raised and creatinine was normal, electrolytes fine, and the platelets are also in the upper normal, upper limit. Right. So what do you think? What has happened? Right. Yes. So this is something again that should not have happened, right? So if you have ordered the investigations, it is your responsibility to chase them. Right. So then... We went back to the history. Yes, patient is having, yes, the initial history is okay. That's correct. Worsen in shortness of breath for last three days. Orthopnic, paroxysmal, nocturnal dyspnea is there. On and off chest pain is there. And the exercise tolerance of the patient has reduced dramatically. But the important history is this patient was having bilateral osteoarthritis, severe osteoarthritis. And she has been taking over-the-counter NHAIDs for last three months. And the patient was having one week of tarry black color stools with this dyspepsia. But she was compensating. But what brought her to the hospital is the worsening symptoms of heart failure. Right? 
So when you ask from the patient, what is the problem? I mean, our patient, they're lay people, right? So they come, with, come up with the, the biggest problem they have. The, the patient was complaining of shortness of breath, but this part of the history came only by prompting, right? So whether you're on NSAIDs, whether you had any tarry black color stools, so which of course is an important part in this sort of a patient. And then when you went back to the examination, in addition to the four examinations made by the house officer, patient was paper white, right? Right, okay. So then the patient was managed with anemia and probably we might have worsened the problem by giving dual antiplatelets and inoxaparin to a patient with a bleeding peptic ulcer. So this patient was also very lucky, survived until the next day morning, was aggressively transfused, resuscitated, and the patient got better, right? Okay, but imagine this patient again finding in the next day morning, exsanguinated to death. And then you find the hemoglobin, initial hemoglobin that you have sent to the lab the previous day evening is 4.5. Yes, you can't get rid of that gait. Always, there are not, I mean, they are, these are not very huge, big things, right? You don't need like so much of thinking. These are basic things that you have to practice from the first day as a house officer to be a good house officer, right? Okay, so, right. So before I continue to the rest, rest of the things, before you fall asleep, the take home messages in patients with shortness of breath, don't always get carried away with the existing diagnosis. Like the patient might tell I have COPD, or the patient might tell how the pump of the normal, the killer, killer, you know, something like that. And don't take carry, carried away with that. Always you need to take a targeted history and a focused examination. Don't always have an open mind, right? Don't think what in the clinic book is always the right thing. And you have to be smart and use common sense and always be accountable and responsible. For whatever the investigation you order, you need to chase it and attend to that, right? Okay, so now coming to a bit of theory, uh, I think I have another 10 minutes, yes. So the initial assessment. So whenever you have a patient with shortness of breath, as a house officer, you need to triage because you have so much of work. So you have to eat, you have to, uh, so that's again important. You can't work for six months or one year without having your meals. No, so you need to eat and you have to write diagnosis cards. You have to attend to other things. But when you, whenever you see a patient with shortness of breath, you should have your own way of triaging to see whether you can see this patient immediately, whether you have to see this patient immediately or is the patient too stable that you can at least have your lunch at three o'clock in the afternoon and come and see the patient, right? Okay, so the initial assessment is basically to assess the IRB patency and listen to the lungs. This you must do, right? So if the patient comes and talks to you, that means the IRB is patent. And always listen to the lungs, which I will discuss in one of the other slides. And observe the breathing pattern. See how distressed he is, whether he uses accessory muscles, whether he has abnormal diaphragmatic breathing, abnormal abdominal breathing. And then always monitor cardiac rhythm, right? So patient may be breathless because he has a SVT with a rate of 180, right? And also monitor the vital signs and check a saturation. And then, you know, whether the patient is too unstable, stable, or need to, I mean, you, you can sort of triage your patient. And then you can ask about cardiac pulmonary disease, is your trauma, and also evaluate the mental status of the patient because hypoxia as well as hypercarbia can make a patient confused. Right, so if you see these patients, a patient with breathlessness, with hypotension, altered mental status, low saturations, unstable arrhythmias, or patient with breathlessness who has a strido, something alarming, there is upper airway obstruction, or patient with breathlessness who has tracheal deviation, unilateral breath sounds, yes, tension pneumothorax, patient can't wait until you have your lunch and come, and also patients who are in severe respiratory distress, Right, more than 40, retraction, cyanosis, low oxygen saturations. Yes, you need to triage and you need to see them as, I mean, not as soon as possible. Immediately, you need to see these patients. And always call for help because patients with breathlessness sometimes might end up with needing intubations, might need the next minute patient can arrest and need cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So you need help. But until the until you get the help, you need to attend to this patient to have a breathing and circulation. Right. But for stable patients, yes, you have time and you need to get a targeted history, right? Particularly the onset, acute, subacute, chronic, the progression. 
whether the patient has good or bad days and other associated symptoms. So in the first case, if the HO has picked up that background shortness of breath is there, but this today the problem is sudden onset within minutes. So then he could have thought that this could be something else other than a COPD exacerbation. And then the examination is again important, right? So when you take the history, one important thing is to have this basic concept, right? So this shortness of breath can be coming from the lungs, coming from the heart, coming from the blood or from the clots. And it may be a problem with your pump, kidneys, liver, or sometimes after including all these things, this may be a panic attack, right? So lungs, examination, you will look for these cough and sputum. And for heart, yes, patient will be having orthopnic. And yeah, I have mixed both history and examination and blood and clots, the, uh, the diaphragm whether there's any type two failure, give the urine output, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we'll briefly go to the examination. So when you examine the patient with shortness of breath, talk to the patient because that helps you to find out whether they are is patent or not. And get an idea about the patient's baseline, right? Because sometimes your seniors might ask because the patient might need invasive ventilation later on and you need to have some idea about the patient's baseline, whether the patient is a fit and well patient or whether this patient has been bed bound for last three years and developed contractures, no family support, and patient is suffering a lot. So that baseline will be important when you take advanced treatment decisions. And then in look at the respiratory distress, whether the patient is pale. In the second case, the patient was obviously pale, severely pale. So that part was missed, right? So which would not uh, like if the HOS pick that patient is severely pale, he wouldn't have gone with aspirin, copied and inoxaparin, and cyanosis, the breathing pattern, and the ankle edema. And then the other important thing is lung examination in a patient with shortness of breath, right? So this is a simple strategy that I used to practice where the trachea is very important, whether the trachea is central, whether it's grossly deviated to one side. And then I mean, you don't have to examine the lungs as a short case as an undergraduate, but the two important techniques, percussion and auscultation, which will help you to come to most of the diagnosis. So in this, you find whether your findings are bilateral or unilateral, right? So if your findings are unilateral, you find there is stony dull in the lung base, but no breath sounds. Yes, it can be an effusion. It is dull and you find, you hear a lot of coarse crackles or bronchial breathing, that may be a consolidation. And unilateral lung findings, lung is resonant and breath sounds absent. Yes, that could be a pneumothorax. So this is a very easy way at a house officer level within minutes to come to a simple diagnosis of the lung pathology. And if the lung findings are bilateral, very carefully auscultate the lungs and see whether the lungs are clear or whether there are lung signs. So clear lungs with dyspnea, right? So it could be due to anemia. Or it could be even due to a pulmonary embolism, right? So the patient is tachypneic, dyspneic, and the saturations are low, and the lungs are clear. Think about pulmonary embolism. And if you find the lung signs are bilateral, so that's V's, it could be due to anything. It could be COPD, asthma, heart failure. And then you look for crackers. So if you find fine crackers, it could be heart failure or interstitial lung disease. You ask the patient to cough and see whether the crackers get cleared or not. And if the crackers are false, you have to consider things like bronchiectasis or bronchopneumonia. So in this approach, you will not end up making note of the examination as I have shown in the first slide, just drawing a lung and putting arrow and write Kreps plus plus, right? So, I mean, few things, unilateral, bilateral, and whether it is dull, and what are the breath sounds you hear, whether there's bees, there are crackers, and see whether there are fine or post crackers. And then the cardiac examination. Again, the heart rate, JVP, and the apex, and whether you can hear the heart sounds clearly or not. So if it is not, it could be a cardiac tamponade or a pericardial effusion. And then you can look for murmurs. Here, yeah, you can look for murmurs and any galloping of the heart. Right. So then only after history and examination, you need to consider investigations. And at the moment, the country is in an economic crisis. And most of the time, you will find as house officers, you can't order each and every investigation, what your textbooks tell, and even what we have told you as undergraduates. Right? So you always have to think globally. But when you act, you have to act locally. 
and very locally according to your hospital, right? So a patient with shortness of breath, the full blood count may be important. So then whenever you ask for investigation, you need to see what you are expecting in that investigation. So in the previous patients, the LFTs were requested for patients with shortness of breath. So LFTs, the lab might do the ASTs, ALTs, bilirubins, albumins, globulins, everything, which will be completely useless if it is not within the clinical context, right? So I'm not going to go into detail because time is almost yeah, 30 minutes gone. And then the ECG is again important. And the most important thing is you ask for ECG and you don't wait until the next day vote round to find the ECG, right? So we always find the ECG is done and it's put into a paper packet and the, that is been stapled into the BSD and you can't even take that packet open and get the ECG out because no one has looked into the ECG. Then there's no point, right? So you order the ECG, always make sure you look at the ECG. Sometimes the ECG might look very simple. So I'll just put one ECG. So what do you see here? This is a patient who has come with shortness of breath. Right, so yeah, so I will just keep on talking. So you see small complexes, right? Small complexes and very nicely you can see some complexes are long and some complexes are short, the QRS. So this is a patient who was having a pericardial, tamponade, uh, pericardial effusion with a cardiac tamponade and this is called electrical ultras. This is just for the sake of interest. And then the chest X-ray, yes, that is again very important. So you order the chest X-ray, share the chest X-ray and then see, what is there, right? So if you have any concerns, always you can contact your seniors. Now there's enough technology. You have smartphones, you can always take photos. You have WhatsApp groups. Your what team may be in one WhatsApp. If you post it, so anybody would respond, right? Okay. And then the blood gas. So these things will be very important when it comes to a patient who has shortness of breath, right? All right, so that brings to the end of my talk. Actually, in this 30 minutes, I did not want to sort of go into details with underlying COPD and discuss the gold guideline because that is pointless. You all will forget that. But I just wanted to give you the fact that you will be practicing as house officers in a couple of weeks time. So always be responsible, be accountable. And then whenever you see a patient with shortness of breath, start from the basics, get a history, examine, the basic things and then order investigations intelligently, right? Okay, so that brings to the end and thank you very much for your kind listening. And if you have any questions, you can post in the chat box and we'll see if time permits, we'll be able to answer those questions. Right, I'll stop share then. Right, uh, thank you, sir, for that uh, detailed lecture. Uh, as if you all have any questions, please type on chat box. In the meantime, we will go to the next lecture by Dr. Priya Malajaya Sekara, consultant physician on snake bites. So, over to you, madam. Thank you, Roshan. You must be hungry, but just another 30 minutes. Not really, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, management of snake, but actually you may have learned it in your medical faculty days, but now you are going to be a house officer. So you will be a first person to treat these patients and you are the first person uh, to meet these people. So that is why we are going to tell you. I'm not going to teach you everything about this, but I might take you through the kind of a tour, how you analyze the things, how you treat the patients. Mostly, the to, uh, like uh, doctors who are going to periphery will see snake bites, but the people who are in Colombo and suburbs might see just, but we might also see half nose wiper, so scale wiper and all. Uh, not the... Uh, original uh, Russell Swiper bite in this, uh, this part of the country.
Madam, your mic is muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'm going to take you through the venomous snakes in Sri Lanka and snake bite management steps. How do we do the plan of action and antivenom therapy? And uh, treatment of uh, a bit of the anaphylaxis. Give me a second. Sorry about it. Okay, so we'll start with this uh, uh, two MCQs actually. It's a best of five. A 66 year old farmer presented five hours after hump no swipe bite. His ankle had fan marks, his urine output was good, his hemorrhagic is stable. Which one of the following action you would take as priority? So and administer tetanus toxoid, start oral antibiotics, reassure and send home. It's uh, immediately admit to a nearest hospital for observation, administer vitamin K. We'll see at the end of the thing whether we'll be able to answer this. And the second question, the 66 year old man was admitted after Russell swipe bite. He was treated with antibiotic and serum and reassessed after six hours. Which of the following is an indication for repeat administration of antibiotic? So these are the answers. Okay, so, so starting with this, not all snakes are venomous. You can see, you know, very nice python here. Okay, so the venomous snakes, I'm just briefly going through. I will not explain how to recognize them. You should know with the cobra and uh, Russell's viper. This is Indian trait, Ceylon trait, so scale viper, hump nose viper. So these are the, uh, because they, those consist as a venomous snakes. Uh, earlier hump nose was not under the venomous, but now is also under the column of venomous. So how do we manage? So when a patient present with the history of snake bite, sometimes they just bring the patient without anything. We have to do the some first aid, admit, reassure, and assess general condition, resuscitate if necessary. So you assess the signs of adminimation, then identify the snake, antivenom, tetanus, toxoid, monitor. Those are the things, whatever the uh, snake bite comes. So the first aids we usually do and these actually people do in the, not even in the hospital, but in the outside, remove the patient from safer, say, whatever safe area, immobilize the beaten part, wash the wound with soap and running water, remove any rings, bangles, tight clothes from the beaten limb, only the paracetamol for pain, so the patient should immediately come to the hospital. The time the patient hospital will come to the hospital, you will be there, but they may have not removed the rings or bangles and things, you may have to do that. So, don'ts are these things and they might bring and they might come with the bottle of king coconut drinking because the Vedamata the might ask them to go with the devil baby yarnakir. So you, are, you have to see whether they are on that, just stop that. Okay. So what can kill your patient? Is the respiratory arrest with hypoxia and the respiratory muscle paralysis? Usually after the cobra and trade bites, maybe the trade bites, hypertension, anaphylaxis or other complications secondary to antivenom and snake bite. So why do they get hypertension? So it is hypovolemia as a result of widespread vasodilatation or the direct effect of cardiac toxins. Venom induced anaphylaxis. So these are the reasons that our patient can go into hypertension. And then you resuscitate. So uh, you know whenever we ask a question, you used to say ABC. So you, we should know what is ABC. So airway, maintain and clear airway. The breathing, you just assess the breathing whether weak, uh, cough, ask patient to cough, can the patient talk, coughing, you can just assess them. Then the circulation, so the low blood pressure, weak pulse and capillary filling. 
So uh, you had to just then and there just have IV access and start normal saline bolus if the patient is hypertensive. These are the signs of envenomation. So you can see this um, swelling, blistering, tissue necrosis. And some people might come with ptosis, myoglobinuria, bleeding. Okay, so there are systemic effects as well as local effects. So it depends on the uh, species of a venomous snake. So the early non-specific features are abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, hypertension, and high white cell counts. The specific features are neurotoxins, spontaneous systemic bleeding, rhabdomyolysis with myoglobinuria, and coagulopathy. And if you see the Russell swiper, usually they come with a local swelling and they are having neurotoxicity plus hematotoxicity both with the dark urine, increased whole blood clotting time and all. But the cobra also, they have local cell, but specifically, rather Russell spike, they get tissue necrosis. And they have more neurotoxicity, and they can have myocoagulopathy. Great, you might even not be able to find the bite mark. You might not be able uh, to find out where the patient uh, has bitten. But there will be neurotoxicity, might come with the respiratory paralysis sometimes. These patients, now usually the uh, areas in the no northern province, northwestern, north central provinces, patient, people might bring the person without anything. The respiratory areas may be the reason they're coming with the great bite. We can't find because the whole blood protein time is also normal. So this is the most important test we do for our patients who are suspected to have a snake bite, you know, even for a centipede bite, we used to do that. So it is, uh, we do this, we collect this 2 ml of blood into a clean, dry test tube and gently rotate and leave it undisturbed for 20 minutes. So at the end of 20 minutes, you turn it around, tilt it and see whether it's clotted or not. So if it's not clotted, it is uh, blood flows, coagulopathy, that is patient is envenous. If no coagulopathy, not enough. If any doubt, we repeat it. So you identify the snake. So then we know what tells to, what is the next thing. So if the whole blood coating time is high and you are with the history, everything you are suspicious of, even you have not seen the when, uh, snake. So we have to prepare for the AVS. So we start monitoring the patient, starting with the level of consciousness and usual parameters and urine output. And always we have to have a uh, fluid balance chart. And avoid NSAIDs, including aspirin. Just see whether the patient is on already on aspirin, maybe ischemic heart disease patient, just stop it for a while. And don't rush for a tetanus stock. So at that time, don't give IEM injections. And um, we usually don't give like other serum things like FFP and things together with the AVS one at a time because of the anaphylaxis and allergy. And even though patient is uh, struggling, you might feel, shall I give something to sedate the patient, but don't give because anyway, patient will get a respiratory depression due to the venom itself. So better not to give any diazepam or bidazolam or anything. So the, our usual plan of action should be, if there are no signs of inhalation, we just observe. If still no signs, we will just discharge. Then within 24 hours, if signs of systemic envenomation, then antivenom. If the patient is coming with the signs of envenomation, obviously systemic envenomation, you go for antivenom. If local envenomation, you observation for at least 24 hours, so you see whether anything is developing, then signs of systemic envenomation, go for ABS. So indication for antivenom therapy are the systemic envenomation and local envenomation in cobra bites or extensive bite of other snakes like cobra bite if you think the two third of the limb is affected so that is one of the indication for uh, an AVS rather systemic envenomation and especially the severe abdominal pain in fade bite in the absence of neurotoxicity. So 
commence antivenom therapy immediately for the bite. So usually this red color things are for the four. Russell swipe, cobra, crate, so scale. We can give antivenom. For the hump nose, green feet season, we don't give antivenom. Actually, people are developing antivenom for hump nose, a separate one, but we are not giving the current this polyvalent one. And uh, so you don't like, uh, it depends on the when the patient presents and if the patient is having any systemic inflammation, we can give antivenom. There's uh, no hard and fast rule that patient has come with K within 24 hours or 48 hours. So how do we give? So it is usual the dose is 10 to 20 ampules, but it is it depends on the uh, on the snake. Now, if you think like the snake is uh, Russell's viper, usually we start with the 20. So if you start with 20, our life is much easy. But if it is cobra bite or a crate bite, 10 miles will be enough. So we those. Next, those two we might give 10 wires, but for the Russell's coffee, we can straight away start with 20. Might have to give another a few sets of antivenom for the Russell's. But usually, with the copra and trade bite, we might not be needed to do repeated uh, wires. So, the end point of antivenom uh, this ABS is reversal of coagulopathy. So we, once we give AVS and you repeatedly do the whole blood coating time six hourly to see whether to give or not. But remember, do not continue AVS for persistent neurotoxicity, provided the coagulopathy has reversed. Because now, as I have already told you, cobra and trade bites, one dose AVS is sufficient, that is the 10 wires. And then, uh, uh, Russell's, we have to give uh, serial doses. And we have to observe the while giving antivenom, the biggest problem is not the antivenom anaphylaxis. So we have to monitor the patient. You can't just hang the uh, ask nurse to give and go away. You have to stay with the patient until you finish the antivenom. Even sometimes, uh, even sometimes uh, after 30 minutes, okay? And always keep the adrenaline available at the bedside. So then those are the those are our uh, venomous snakes. So you identify the venomous snakes and you start treating the patient. So that is not a problem. The problem will be your hump nose swiper. So you should be able to recognize the one. And uh, if you are not, because you know sometimes whole blood they have some coagulopathy. But depending on the way up, now imagine patient is from Kaduvela or somewhere in Savile, it's very unlikely to have a Russell swipe. You should be people knows which particular uh, snake is available in their territory. Okay. And now hump nose swiper now taken as a venomous swiper because we have a lot of hump nose swiper death in this country. So, and uh, Now, in the, uh, initially, patient might present without any signs and symptoms with the hump nose, but you have to observe. So, what we say is perform whole blood protein time six hours for 48 hours, as for the other venomous snakes. And if the positive whole blood protein time is there, we have to specifically give them FFP. The reason is what they have found, they can correct the coagulopathy. If once we correct the coagulopathy, they can correct the AK. Some studies done in this country, they have found initially if we treat the coagulopathy with the FFP in half more soil, but we can prevent them going on to AK. The killer is acute kidney injury. So if we treat them, that is fine. And we have to adequately hydrate them and make the urine output fine 5 ml per kg per And But the, remember, this our available antivenom is not for hump nose soil. Only thing what we can do is we can do the whole blood cut in time. We can't just ignore half nose swipe a bite. I don't, don't worry about it. You have to keep the patient for 48 hours, do whole blood cut in time. If possible, just give FFP and watch for the reduced urine output. 
So if the acute kidney injury develops, so immediately you have to go for a dialysis and they can develop thrombotic microangiopathy. So that is the one case for a plasma paresis. So as I have already told, if the coagulopathy, we give FFP. And the local tissue, there's a blister, you have to pound tank, a star prophylaxis IV antibiotic for these patients because they also can have necrotic limb as uh, cobra. And the sea snakes, they are painless and usually no local inflammation. They get like, you know, the tetanus, like st stiffness, aching and pain of jaw, neck and trunk, and the myoglobinuria. And uh, we don't have this other antivenom is not for this uh, sea snake. It is not available, but we do give supportive therapy. So how do we manage the allergic reaction to antivenom? So you just first thing is you have to stop the antivenom infusion temporarily and treat all reactions immediately. So what we call mild reaction is blood pressure is normal, moderate to severe reaction, patient might get hypertension and anaphylaxis. So you should know the dose. I'm not going to tell you because now this is the bread and butter of medicine. You should know that. So we give adrenaline. In that case, you can, if the patient is collapsed, you can even give IV, then IM, if not. So clofendramine and hydroportion we are giving. And then you manage the minor reaction with this and moderate reaction. Give the uh, IM and if the patient is not responding, you may have to repeat the same <coughs> adrenaline dose. And severe reaction, you repeat it and you may have to nebulize the patient with uh, adrenaline and sometimes what happens, now the problem here is uh, even though patient having anaphylaxis, patient might die with the anti, uh, snake venom itself, so patient need to have antivenom. So what we do is we initially manage the patient and then with the, we, might, we take the patient to the ICU or HDU care and might start adrenaline infusion and then you restart your antivenom with very close monitoring because patient might die with anti, patient might die with both. So we have to be very careful. I have just given the dose for the, uh, the children dose but the pediatric people might teach you that. So this is it. And uh, this is what I have been telling you. And just, uh, even though I'm not a pediatrician, I'm, I always uh, like to tell this uh, sentence to the, my student uh, when I do the teaching. The usually, uh, the adults, they come with ptosis, the proximal things. But the children, they can have weakness of trunk and the ptosis. So that is, you have to remember. The, the small child, they can't have cough and also you have to look at the chest expansion and the older child can cough. So we'll come to the uh, this question. What is the answer for this question? It's a 66 year old farmer presented five hours after hump nose wiper bite. So we had, they have uh, recognized the hump nose and there are hand marks. Will not put his good. He seemed like his table. Which are the following action you would take as priority? Now imagine um, this patient, like uh, what are things you do? Imagine this patient is in OPD. I know you are not going to be in OPD, you will be at uh, board. So somebody might think, okay, shall I give tetanus toxoid? Shall I start some oral antibiotic? This may have to do both, but we are asking what is the best out of all five? So yes, you and send home, just, this is just a uh, hump nose wiper bite, not the Russell, don't worry, go home. No, no, nothing like that. And immediately admit to the nearest hospital for observation and administer vitamin K. So, uh, what do you think? So, I have anyway highlighted what, uh, what is the correct answer. 
it is we have to immediately admit to the nearest hospital if the patient gets the opd we have to admit to the medical ward and observe the patient for 48 hours as i have told you you admit this patient to the 48 hours and imagine patient has necrotic limb or a if there is cellulitis, then you address that cellulitis by giving, imagine that time you might think whether to give IV coamoxiclave, IV metronidazole, or a cloxacilline, or a clindamycin, whatever the relevant antibiotic is, you can start. Don't in a hurry to give tetanus toxoin. You can leisurely give tetanus toxoin. There is no hurry to give tetanus toxoin within one or two or three days, you can give them. And anyway, you have to reassure the patient, but don't send the patient home. As I have already told you, just do the whole blood cut, cut in time, six hours. If it is prolonged, call the blood bank and get some FFP and start transfusing FFP. Okay? And uh, there's no way we ask to give administer vitamin K. It just, you just gives up FFP. In sometimes when the patient is bleeding, what happens? Not in hump nose viper bite. Usually this happens in Russell's viper bite. I told you. Now we'll go to the next question and tell you that. Okay. Now this one, the, the second question I told you. If the uh, patient presenting with this Russell's viper bite, you have already given the first set of uh, antivenom. So what is the indication for second set of antivenom? Is it uh, whether because patient is in respiratory failure and you have to, patient is already ventilated, intubated, imagine, or oh, the swollen limb or a reduced urine output, or anyway, if the patient is ventilated, patient can't complain, is it diplopia? So it is uh, nothing else, but it is 20 whole minute whole blood cutting time, which is more than 20 minutes, okay? So when it is uh, Brussels fiber, when the second dose, we have to decide on this. But what happened is, uh, sorry, what happened is, um, then in the Brussels fiber bite, because usually we start 20 vials or 30 vials. So when we start 20 or 30 vials, then in six hours time, you do a whole blood for a prolong, then you give another 20 or a 10 another six hours now you are giving that but by the time you give two or three or usually after second time anyway second third time whole blood protein time going to be prolonged what is the reason patient may have gone into dic by that time so if you check the patient's inr patient's uh, bleeding time protein time everything may be high because of uh, it's because we have already given antivenom, uh, due to the antivenom per se, plus Russell's venom itself, patient can go to DIC. So usually what we do is, if the, we usually give three, four times every six hours after checking whole blood cutting time, and then we send a blood picture to see whether there is any hemolysis or anything there. Then if, if the, this whole blood cutting time is so long, so continue to DIC, no point of giving this. Isn't it? Rather, managing patient. In that condition, even though there are no guidelines, does not say that to give vitamin K or a trinoxamic acid, if someone is profusely bleeding, we will try to stop all the pathways. Might be vitamin K. So we don't give IM vitamin K, okay? We will give IV vitamin K in that case. And uh, you think the even platelet might go low, so you may have to give some trinox. That is fine. You can just give, but the life saving things are different things, okay? Then when they are profusely bleeding, yes, you start that. Another thing is, we have to mainly remember about this. Uh, now this is about the Russell's viper. So it is usually we give for 48 hours, like every six hours. But even before 48 hours, if you think, if your patient is, uh, this is not due to venom itself. This is going to be something else. DIC or something, then you check it and you might not give antivenom, but might uh, start treating patient like uh, treat symptoms, signs, uh, investigations. So you looking out your patient by giving the rest of the supportive treatment. 
if the patient has gone into renal failure, you start dialysis. Likewise, you start doing that kind of thing. But uh, I have already told you that, but I will repeat that. If the cobra bite, if there's no systemic anonymation, and if the half of the or more than two third of the limb is necrosed, it is indication for antivenom. And uh, uh, those are the things you have to remember when you are a house officer. And always remember to keep the adrenaline ready, keep the because the hydrocortisone pilitin won't uh, do job do their job with it second they will take time but the adrenaline is a lifesaver always remember which dose what you have to give tell, tell your nurses look we have got these things and you are going to stay with the patient for whole one number when we are giving the antivirus okay so i will uh, i have uh, one second i have another four three minutes i will tell you uh, this uh, the preparation of that Okay, dissolutancy is very difficult to dissolve that. So it is you take if it is 10 wires, it is 100 ml, 20 wires, 200, 30 wires, 300, whatever in normal cell line. So you took the rest of the things and put it to the normal cell line and do it in one number. If the patient develop the anaphylaxis or something, you stop the drug, treat the anaphylaxis, take the patient to HD or ICU. Once patient is stabilized, you restart your antivenom because that is. Necessary. And the other thing, even the patient brings you a Russell's wiper or a cobra or a crate, if there are no evidence of systemic anonymation, don't, you don't need to give AVS. Because and if you think the whole body type normal, no other things, don't. Because even, the, even there are bite marks, sometimes these venomous snakes, they usually, after they have a meal, uh, they release their venom to that particular meal. So after that, if that particular snake is, uh, someone was bitten by that particular snake after the heavy meal, they don't have any venom in their, uh, uh, in a for them, and patient might not get venom, even though it is a, uh, this venomous snake. So we have to be very careful because uh, these are uh, life and death matters. So that is what I have to say. I think you understood something. Um, and uh, I wish, all, wish you all the best for your internship. Thank you, Madam, uh, for your lecture. Um, next. Uh, this is from the uh, DGA office. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your lecture. Okay, I will just answer a few questions. Uh, if I have one minute. Uh, uh, yeah, they can uh, they can uh, type it in the chat yeah. box. I can just give I have answered the second question. Even after reaction, once you stabilize the patient, you have to give antivenom, even ICU or HDU setup. Third question. Yes. Even non-venomous snakes, you can you have to give tetanus, uh, but uh, not immediately. You can wait few uh, even twenty-four hours, and just if you think uh, you need to give, it's no hard and fast rule. Not for a centipede and all other rest of the venom, uh, venomous venom, rest of the non-venomous snake, you can give it tetanus. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are uh, now we are uh, having the lunch break. Uh, you can join the next lecture at one thirty eight p.m.
good afternoon madam uh, this is from the dg office uh, good afternoon uh, this is from the dg office uh, i made you as the co-host uh, you yes. can uh, start the lecture at 1 30 all right okay fine i have already uh, shared my screen yeah, yeah. presentation no oh, okay uh, yeah okay. okay thank you very much okay Uh, has everybody joined? Can we start now? Can any one of you uh, uh, voice? Have all of you all joined? Or should I wait two, two more minutes? Can one of the participants uh, uh, answer this question? Can I start my lecture? Madam, they can uh, chat with the chat box. They can't uh, speak out. Oh, really? It's okay. okay. It's okay, madam. You can start now. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So, welcome everyone after the lunch. So, you'll are not any more hype glycemic. So, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine and the Ministry of Health for giving me this opportunity. So, in my talk, I'm going to discuss uh, two topics actually, one with the management of a uh, patient with a very high blood pressure, the other one is a, a management of patient with acute heart failure. So I will discuss the first the management of patient with a very high blood pressure. So we start with a uh, case history. Uh, is Miss, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> is Mr. A, a 60 year old man who was admitted with a headache and uh, his blood pressure is 190-120. So how do you manage this patient? What's the problem of this patient? I'm sure that you know that the patient is having a very high blood pressure, 190-120. So patients with a very high blood pressure, there are actually some categories are there. You can divide it into uh, mainly the one category is hypertensive crisis. Where the systole blood pressure equal or more 180 or diastole equal or more 120. Under that category, there are again two, two uh, uh, forms, the hypertensive emergencies, where that you get with a very high blood pressure, there will be acute end organ damage. I will discuss this in detail later. And the other category is hypertensive emergency, where you have only the high blood pressure, but they don't have the uh, uh, any evidence of acute organ damage. So in my lecture, I will discuss the management of these two mainly. And there's another category of patients. This is called ZOD emergencies. Actually, these patients do not have the uh, hypertension. However, their blood pressure is elevated because of this catecholamine surge in certain situations. For example, if they come with a pain, distress, fear, anxiety, their blood pressure can go up. However, they are not having hypertension. Remember that. So always if a patient is having high blood pressure, you must find out whether they belong to one of the hypertensive crises or whether they are having the pseudo emergencies. This is very, very important because your management is depend on this. For example, if you treat a patient at the ETU who has come with some pain with the blood pressure elevated, if you give a antihypertensives there, by the time the patient, when the patient reaches the ward, the blood pressure is almost uh, very low. So we may have to treat the, the patient who is having low blood pressure rather than treating his underlying problem. So actually, which patients actually need uh, uh, admissions uh, because of the high blood pressure? Definitely when they are having hypertensive emergency where they are the acute organ damage, you need to admit those patients because those patients need intravenous antihypertensives. 
at the same time, if their blood pressure is very high, suppose that the systolic blood pressure more than 220, so if you think the patients, there's a sudden rise of blood pressure as a pain, impending uh, acute organ damage. In that situation, it's better to admit the patients, even though they are not currently having the hypertensive emergency. Otherwise, if the patients do not have these two categories, you don't have to admit patients to just to control the blood pressure. Remember that. So what are the categories of hypertensive emergency? For example, I do that there's a organ damage. So what are the organs that could damage by the hypertension? The brain, that is the uh, ischemic or hemorrhage stroke, the heart, acute coronary syndrome, acute heart failure, aortic dissection, so kidney, acute kidney injury, pregnancy, severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. The other categories like malignant hypertension, hypertensive encephalopathy and also hypertensive thrombotic microangiopathy. You should know all these conditions by name. So when you have a patient with a very high blood pressure, so first and foremost, you have to find out whether the patient is having acute endorgan damage. How do you do that? You need to get a history examination and you may have to do certain investigation. For example, if you think the patient is having the, uh, the ask for chest pain, see whether this is ischemic type chest pain, acute coronary syndrome. So confirm by doing an ECG and the cardiac troponin. Patients with acute aortic dissection, the history that they give is the pain in the back of the chest and there will be unequal pulses. And the, you may have to confirm by doing certain investigations, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. Like your heart failure. So this I'm not going to discuss in detail here because the next part of my talk on this. So again, the, there will be clinical features of heart failure. You can confirm by doing the X-ray or point of care ultrasound scan. What about the acute stroke? They have the focal neurological sign, the history and the examination, and you can confirm by doing the NCCT brain. So acute kidney injury. They will give the history of oliguria and urea and do the serum creatinine that it should be elevated. So hypertensive encephalopathy patient, they have the headache. Remember, Mr. A also had headache, but as for the other symptoms as well, patients with hypertensive encephalopathy, they are usually having the blurred vision, they are drowsy, they are irritable, and also sometimes they may have seizures also. That you can diagnose this clinically, and later you can confirm by doing the EEG. What about the malignant hypertension? They have visual changes sometimes. Or if you look at the fundi, there will be flame ray shape written uh, hemorrhages and papilledema. So this is the classic fundi of malignant hypertension, papilledema, flame shape hemorrhages and the exudates. Remember this fundus. So how do you manage uh, treat, treat a patient with hypertensive emergency? Remember, as I said earlier, these patients need admission. Why? Because they need the intravenous antihypertensive. Ideally, if you have the ICU facilities, you can send the, them there because uh, if you manage to monitor the patients in intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring, that is the idea. But most of the situation in our hospital, we don't have that much of ICU facilities. So you have to manage in the medical wards. So if you have the HDU, take him to the HDU and manage there. So in the first hour, in most of the hypertensive emergencies, you try to control the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, by 25% of the mean arterial pressure. How do you calculate the mean arterial pressure? It's a summation of systolic blood pressure, and the two times of the systolic blood pressure, divided by three. So in the first hour that you control by 25% of the mean arterial pressure, and the next two to six hours, you try to take the blood pressure to 160, 100. Thereafter, in the after first 24 hours, you can keep the blood pressure around this level. You don't have to drastically reduce blood pressure uh, below that. So after 24 hours, subsequent blood pressure reduction, you can do or 
uh, several days. So next I'm going to discuss a few, uh, actually the um, situations in the ischemic strokes. Again, the end organ damage is a brain. So however, if your patient is having acute ischemic stroke, we don't usually treat the hypertension unless in certain situations. Even though if you treat it, not like in other situation, you bring the blood pressure in the first hour only by 15% of the mean artery pressure. So indications for treatment when the blood pressure is very high. So if suppose it's more than 220 and the 120, that situation you may have to bring blood pressure down a little. And the other causes like the if the patient is having additional uh, hypertensive emergency worry, on top of the ischemic stroke. For example, this patient is having acute coronary syndrome also, or he may be having aortic dissection. In that situation, you need to control the blood pressure. So if the patient is awaiting thrombolytic, blood pressure is very high. That situation, you need to bring the blood pressure less than 185, 110. So otherwise, in a stroke patients, even though they have the acute organ damage, you don't treat the hypertension. I know that you all know the reason. So what about the hemorrhagic stroke? Not like in the ischemic stroke, you need to bring the blood pressure down, remember. So if they are not having any increase in intracranial pressure uh, features, that uh, you have to bring the blood pressure. The first one to two hours, systolic blood pressure to 130 to 150 millimeter of mercury. So otherwise, if they are having the features of increased intracranial pressure, for example, if they are having the headache, or if they are having feet, so if they are having the um, confusion, drowsiness, or if the pandai shows a papilledema, those are the features of increased intracranial pressure. So if their blood pressure is again very high, if they are having a very large hemorrhage, in that situation, you control blood pressure in modest amount. Keep the blood pressure less than 120 or the next 24 hours. What about the other uh, conditions like aortic dissection, acute coronary syndrome, acute pulmonary edema, eclampsia? In these situations, you need to bring the blood pressure immediately, not uh, within hours. So, uh, aortic dissection, not only totally the blood pressure reduction to 120, that you try to bring the blood pressure down, uh, heart rate also down to less than 60. So, labital IV is the drug of choice here. What about a patient with acute coronary syndrome? Again, need to bring the blood pressure somewhere around 140. So, the drugs of choices are the, the beta blocker IV, the labital oil, and the IV. Uh, if you have the other beta blockers, that's all right. But what is available for us is the labital oil. So IVGTN is the other drug that you can use in uh, acute coronary syndrome because these drugs will give the beneficial effect for the uh, myocardial infarctions. What about the acute heart failure? The drugs GTN, IVGTN, IV fusamide. And the eclampsia or Eclampsia, you try to bring the blood pressure down to less than 160, 100. The drugs that you can use, the IV hydrolysine and IV labidolol. And the, the drugs, actually, the three, four, three drugs, drugs I have listed here, sodium nitroprusside, uh, IV nitroglycerine, and the IV labidolol. However, the commonly used drugs in the medical wards that we commonly use, IV GTN and IV labidolol. Uh, although the sodium nitroprusside is there, we don't use it often. One thing is that that can lead to cyanide poisoning and also you need to cover it uh, because you should not expose to the sun, sunlight. It's because of these things that we rarely use the sodium nitroprusside nowadays in the medical wards. But you have the facility of using the labidolol, which is a very good drug. Most of the situation, you can use the labidolol IV. Unless the patient has the bradycardia or the patient is having acute pulmonary edema. So this is a very important drug. Most of the situation that you can use. What about the IV nitroglycerins? As I said earlier, very useful in the acute heart failure. 
and also acute myocardial infarctions. However, remember that you should not use when the uh, end organ damage in the brain. For example, if it is hypertense, uh, uh, ischemic uh, stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, don't use IVGTA because it can increase the inter increase intracranial pressure. And also the other problem with the uh, IVGTA is after 48 hours, it can cause tachyphylaxis. That means the drug is no more useful. It's not active anymore. So remember that these are the downside of the uh, IVGTA. So that's all about the uh, hypertensive emergency that you need to admit the patient to the cube uh, intravenous uh, uh, antihypertensive and the monitor and the control and the initial, the first hour that to try to bring the blood pressure in certain situation to 85% of the mean arterial blood pressure. In certain situation, you need to bring the blood pressure immediately down like within minutes. So uh, other situations like acute kidney injury and the hypertensive uh, encephalopathy and the hypertensive malignant hypertension, again, the same management, you can bring the blood pressure down by 25% of the mean artery pressure. So what about the management of the hypertensive urgency? Where there is a no acute end organ damage. They have only the high blood pressure. These patients, actually, you don't need to admit these patients they can be treated as outpatients. So you don't need to use the IV and hypertensives. So you can reduce the blood pressure over days using the oral medications. And But however, bring the patient down to your clinic uh, next 24, hour, 24 to 48 hours just to see whether the blood pressure is reasonably controlled. And at the same time, think about the underlying etiology. There could be underlying secondary etiology for the very high blood pressure, which I'm not going to discuss here. So antihypertensive use here is usually oral antihypertensive. It could be AC inhibitor, ERB, calcium channel blockers, or thiazide, or thiazide like diuretics. And you can, if the patient is already on antihypertensive, you can uh, up titrate their doses or you may add another antihypertensive and the control blood pressure. Remember, do not use IV antihypertensive and also don't use the sublingual nifedipine to bring the blood pressure down quickly. That actually can lead to organ ischemia with a sudden drop of blood pressure. Remember that. So take our messages with regards to uh, 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 management of a patient with very high blood pressure is the, uh, you need to identify the cause for the high blood pressure, whether it's a hypertensive crisis or whether it's a pseudo emergencies. Only patients with hypertensive emergency need IV antihypertensives and control of blood pressure over minutes to hours. In patients with hypertensive urgency, use oral medications and control blood pressure ODs. Do not treat pseudo emergencies with antihypertensive. I hope that you have understood how to manage patient uh, with a high blood pressure. Next, uh, we'll move to the next uh, part of my topic, the management of patient with acute heart failure. So there's another uh, case scenario, a uh, 65-year-old uh, mm, patient with a hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, presented with a sudden onset shortness of breath and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea. You know, these are the, the clinical actual features of uh, acute heart failure. So one day duration, so an examination is tachypneic with a respiratory rate 30, and his saturation on AI is 86%. And his heart rate is 100, so he's tachycardic. And the blood pressure is around uh, 100 by 60. And his jugular venous pressure is elevated. And the lungs, they are by basal crepitations. So what is your likely diagnosis here? No doubt that the patient is having acute pulmonary edema or acute heart failure. So how do you manage this patient? So 
Before that, I will move to the management part. Remember, there are some causes of the acute heart failure. One thing is if the patient is having the chronic heart failure, the forgotten medications is the commonest cause. So otherwise, it's a medication, some medications also can lead to the worst in of heart failure. For example, drugs like non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids, and the uh, pyoglitzones. Okay, we, these dry, drugs can cause for water retention and can lead to heart failure. And the causes like arrhythmia, anemia, think about these things, and the ischemia, that is acute coronary syndrome, or if the patient is having any underlying respiratory tract infections. So lifestyle changes like salt, alcohol, and the upregulation of cardiac output with the pregnancy and the thyroid diseases, thyrotoxicosis actually. So this uh, failure is actually uh, that you can remember, but don't worry about this. Common things are the, the medications, arrhythmia and the myocardial infarctions and the uh, drugs which can cause precipitate heart failure and the salt and the alcohol. So how do you evaluate a patient with heart failure? So initially, check for the airway, breathing, and circulation, very important. And uh, correct it uh, before that you get the history and the examination. And then uh, try to get the quick history because you have to get the targeted history because uh, in an emergency, you can't take a detailed history in that. So always get the symptoms of heart failure like uh, shortness of breath. Already patients is having the grade four heart failure symptoms is having shortness of breath at rest, and having also the orthopnea is very orthopnic, he can, cannot lie down. And also they are having the, if you ask from the history, they are having the features of paroxysm and nocturnal dyspnea. Sometimes they will have the uh, leg edema also, and also JVP is elevated. So we did get this examination part, those things, and also get the history of previous ischemic heart disease history, and the, the cardiac respect factors like diabetes, hypertension, and the, the identify the etiology like uh, ischemic type chest pain, palpitations with regards to arrhythmia, anemia, the medications which I have already discussed. And the, again, go for a targeted examination. We don't, you can't do the detailed examination in an emergency here. Check for the heart rate, blood pressure, jugular venous pressure, saturation, and the oscillate the lung basis. So diagnose the patient is having acute heart failure with these features. So you need certain uh, urgent investigations to LED CG, chest X-ray, and the, you do the point of care ultrasound scan if you have the facility or in your uh, ward or sitting. Nowadays, most of the uh, hospitals do have the ultrasound scan machine. So you can check for the lungs also for the evidence of uh, interstitial edema. So uh, investigations like uh, troparin and the other basic investigation, full blood count, look for uh, anemia and the electrolytes and the serum creatinine, look for the renal involvement and the liver enzymes. So you can get the liver congestion due to heart failure itself. So ECG is very important to look for uh, evidence of myocardial infarction and also arrhythmia. Here I have listed the cause of atrial fibrillation. So the X-ray of a patient with pulmonary edema, you can see uh, upper lobe blood diversion with somewhat fluffy shadows, uh, which is suggestive of pulmonary edema. So this is the point of care ultrasound scan where you see the B lines, which is typical of interstitial edema due to when the patient is having an acute heart failure. So how do you manage patient? What is your immediate management? So as I said, it's a medical emergency that they take the patient to the HDU, prop up the patient, or if the patient is comfortable in some other position, keep in that position. So if there's a problem with the knee, problem with the airway, breathing and circulation, so correct it. So this patient is a patient whom I have discussed. He's having hypoxia. His saturation is 86%. So in that situation, need oxygen. If saturation is less than 90%, 
remember it's less than 90% in heart failure, you use oxygen, otherwise not necessary. Use the appropriate oxygen delivery method. It could be the nasal prongs or it could be a face mask or it could, could be a, a non-rebreathing mask. So whatever the methods, you try to bring the blood uh, oxygen saturation up, maybe to uh, around 92 levels, but not very high. Remember that. So insert an IV cannula and take blood for basic investigations and also cardiac troponin. And then with the you have now IV cannula in situ that you can use medication which can relieve the pulmonary edema. So what's the drug of choice to relieve the pulmonary edema? That's a diuretic. So what's the diuretic that you use? It's a available, the drug for us is IV frucimide. And uh, said if the patient, uh, you can start uh, uh, boluses like 40 to 80 milligram. If your patient is already on diuretic, suppose that your patient has been chronic, uh, chronic heart failure who has been on uh, 40 milligram IV uh, oral frucimide, that you have to double that dose. In that situation, you start the 80 milligram IV boluses that you have to give is two to three times daily. Or else you can use an IV infusion, 5 to 30 milligram per hour. But the remember, the efficacy-wise, you more or less both are equal. You can use, but most of the situation, when the blood pressure is uh, on the lower side, we used to give infusion. And if the patient is not improving, you can add thiazides or metalazone uh, if the patient has poor response. So how do you assess your diuretic response? Clinical response, patient will feel better. The respiratory rate will calm down. Lung basis will get uh, improvement. So uh, the other one is the diuretic, the assist urine output, uh, diuretic therapy by uh, a urine output. If it is less than three liters, that is not adequate. In that case, you may have to increase the dose of diuretic. So if it is three to five liters, that is the ideal uh, urine output that you expect that you continue the same dose. If it is more than five liters per day, that you need to step down your diuretic therapy. So if the patient is having low blood pressure, that is what you call the cardiogenic shock and heart failure. So uh, uh, that situation, you need to start IV inotropes, uh, uh, vasopressors. So W2 mean is the inotrope that you use here. Remember that you can cause the tachycardia and also arrhythmias. The noetrolene that you can start when the blood pressure is very low. Uh, however, that always you combine it with dobutamin. Why? Because the uh, no point is just bringing the blood pressure up uh, with a noetrolene that you need to give the, uh, the uh, dobutamin to uh, improve the cardiac contractility. That is the iron drop. Okay. So, Remember to continue the frucimide IV as well in this situation. Do not stop frucimide that you need to uh, control it, the, your pulmonary edema. So you can use the IV GTN also if the patient is having continued to have pulmonary edema. If their blood pressure is reasonably all right, if it is more than 110, you can use this. However, if your patient is not improving with your uh, diuretics and also IVGTN, that uh, you may have to use the non-invasive ventilation. I hope that you know about this. You have heard about this, but remember that you will see this when you are managing these patients in the medical wards. So if their respiratory remains high, if they are hypoxic, and you can use the non-invasive ventilation. So, however, if the patient is still at the poor response, you may have to intubate and the patient might need, definitely need ICU care in that situation. So, these are the medications or drugs, other modalities that we have, I have discussed so far. I have discussed about the oxygen therapy and the diuretic usage and the use of iron tropes, vasopressors, and the VGTN and the non-invasive ventilation. So there are other kind of management also. Remember about thromboembolism prophylaxis. Do you 
you have to give the deviated prophylaxis in patients with heart failure. So also uh, treat the underlying cause. For example, if it is acute coronary syndrome, you have to treat the acute coronary syndrome. If it is arrhythmia, you have to treat it. And also, if it is uh, the acetylmalonitin drugs, which can which has caused the heart failure, that you have to stop it. And uh, remember, nowadays we don't use morphine because uh, uh, don't use it unless it's really indicated because it can actually causes a myocardial depression and cause lead into the uh, uh, reduction of the cardiac output. And also, as I said earlier, do not uh, make the patient uh, hyperoxemia. That is, uh, oxygen saturation, do not uh, bring it uh, to a very high levels. Definitely keep it around uh, 92, uh, usually keep it around less than 94. Don't bring it more than that because the, it can do more harm than good. It will reduce the coronary blood flow and also reduces cardiac index. Remember it. So don't try to bring the blood pressure uh, saturation to 96, 99, avoid it. So 90, 92 is more than enough. So monitor with vitals, uh, you know, what are the vitals like uh, respiratory rate, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, and also the oxygen saturation, urine output. See whether there's clinical improvement. This, they are, symptomatically, they will improve. And there will be relief of congestion, the lung bases will be clear, and the blood pressure also will get the stabilization in the heart failure syndrome. So this is a summary of the <clears throat> acute heart failure. Uh, so initial management, you have to keep the oxygen and the NIV non-invasive ventilation. So the test that you do the ECG at the arterial blood gases or venal blood gases which I forgot to tell, that's very important in your management, just to see whether the patient is having uh, 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 hypoxia. And the chest X-ray and the focus I have already discussed. And uh, the treatment option, objective, see whether the patient is having the improved the, the dyspnea, the patient's clinical well-being improvement, maintain blood pressure, the relieve congestion, and the maintain saturation. So you need to adjust your medications, the frucimide, nitrates, and the antropes according to the patient, uh, the response. So always identify the underlying etiology and treat it. Uh, thank you very much. So we have two minutes for the discussion if you have anything. Uh, I'm happy to answer. So you are very welcome to the medical boards. I'm sure that... Uh, that definitely don't worry about the, the patient management is there. You have all the senior, uh, you can always get the senior opinion. So I will actually wish you all the very best. So I will see some of you all in the National Hospital Candy in our unit. So thank you very much for patients listening. Thank you, madam. Uh, uh, the questions they can type in the chat box. Uh, okay, right. Yeah, I think you can start the next lecture in that case. I will uh, message, message them if we, uh, they can uh, text. Uh, so, because I think Dr. Surang Manilgam, he need to start his lecture now, it's two o'clock. Yes, madam. Okay. okay, thank you very much, madam. Thank you.
then uh, Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, can, the presentation. Uh, can you share the presentation? Yes. Now you unmuted me. <laughs> yeah. I will. Sorry. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, from the DG office, we can hear you. You can start the presentation and carry on. Uh, yeah. I think uh, you have been listening to a lot of uh, acute medicine topics. So my topic is uh, diabetic emergencies. Yes, uh, we'll start with uh, case scenarios. I have three cases to present to you. And uh, uh, so you have a patient, 20 year old woman admitted uh, who, who's been drowsy and disoriented since waking up in the morning. And uh, she, um, when you ask her, uh, the, the, the bystander, they said that the uh, patient has, has been unwell for three days with fever, dysuria, and suprapubic pain. And she has vomited a few times, and, but she has been previously well. On examination, uh, she was a bit disoriented and confused because of that GCA was, uh, GCS was 14 out of 15. And there was no temperature. Her blood pressure was 80 by 60 uh, and saturation was 98. Abdominal examination was normal uh, despite except mild suprapubic tenderness and there were no neurological signs. So when you uh, see the case, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Yeah. So uh, when you see this kind of patient, you this could be a urinary sepsis with septic shock because patient's blood pressure is low and she has had suprapubic pain, tenderness. And this could be even gynecological problem because uh, she's um, in reproductive age. And this could be even a metabolic derangement or could be drug overdose. But uh, there is no such history uh, to suggest drug overdose. And uh, her last menstrual period was about two weeks ago. So when you see a patient like this, how do you manage? So A, B, C, D management. A, airway is not compromised here. And breathing, she was a bit tachypneic, but saturation was normal. And uh, circulation was in danger. So put large bow IV cannula and start with saline. Yes. So what is the most appropriate immediate investigations you would do? Uh, there are a few investigations. When you look at those, all are equally important but which one is more appropriate most appropriate is it ecg capillary blood sugar blood culture arterial blood gas urine urine full report full blood count or hcg yes it is capillary blood sugar so when you do capillary blood sugar it came as 510 milligrams a deciliter so what is your diagnosis this previously healthy patient coming with drowsiness yes yes so what are your differential diagnosis could this be diabetic ketoacidosis hyposmolar hyperglycemic state or hyperglycemic state with sepsis uh, as you have learned during your medical uh, school time you know these are the uh, differential diagnosis for a patient coming with hyperglycemia so uh, so when you suspect these three you have to do for more investigations what are those you need to assess blood analysis, blood gas analysis, uh, urine ketone bodies, uh, venous plasma glucose. You have to always uh, check your capillary sugar with venous plasma glucose and uh, electrolytes, creatinine. So what are the appropriate investigations? So uh, most of those investigations are appropriate except few. What are those? CT brain, you're not going to do at this moment. You know, this is due to some other reason, metabolic reason. That's why patient is a bit drowsy. And you are not going to do HbA1c at this moment. And this is not uh, going to help you. And dip dipitrophil, you are not going to do at this moment. But rest of the investigations are equally important because 
you need to assess all the complications and precipitating factors for the condition what we are going to discuss yes and the ketone uh, urine ketone bodies came as three pluses and blood gas analysis showed ph of 7.1 and uh, with uh, bicarbonate of eight millimoles per liter uh, by uh, the co2 was little wash out uh, uh, partial pressure oxygen was normal so when you look at the whole picture, what is the diagnosis? This is diabetic ketoacidosis. So what is diabetic ketoacidosis? It is a medical emergency with the biochemical triad of hyperglycemia, ketosis, and acidosis. It can occur with both type 1 and type 2. So what are the diagnostic criteria? Blood glucose more than 200 milligrams per deciliter or known to have diabetes. So this the the uh, when you diagnose, uh, the patient should have blood sugar level more than 200 or patient should be a known patient with diabetes. The second one is capillary or blood ketone level more than 3 millimoles per liter or significant ketone urea that is 2 or more pluses. Bicarbonate level less than 15 millimoles per liter and or venous pH less than 7.3. To diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis, presence of all three criteria are required. And so the, how do you assess the blood gas? It is venous blood gas. So uh, the uh, arterial blood gas is only indicated if patient is having low saturation level and if patient is comatose. Otherwise, you can go by venous blood gas levels. Yes. So what are the aims of management? You need to restore the circulatory volume and you need to clear ketones and you have to suppress ketogenesis and correction of electrolyte disturbances and reduction of blood glucose level. Uh, what are the important aspects of management of DK? The IV fluids, insulin and potassium replacement. Other than that, there are a few other correction of acidosis, close monitoring, correction of precipitating factors, and prevention of thromboembolism. But the restoration of circulatory volume is the priority. So, yeah. so when, you're man when you're managing a patient, you need to answer three questions. So when, you when it comes to IV fluids, you need to answer three questions. What are those? When to give, what to give, and how to give. Yes. So when to give? Yes, as soon as the IV fluids, as soon as DK is suspected, you need to give, you need to start them on IV fluids. What you are going to give is 0.9 normal saline. How do you give? It depends on the blood pressure at the outset. Yes, if blood pressure is less than 90, like in our patient, we were discussing, she has had blood pressure of 80 by 50. When systolic blood pressure is less than 90, you start with, you can give, bolus uh, uh, normal saline uh, 500 ml one pint over 15 minutes and you assess the blood pressure systolic blood pressure if, if, if it remains less than 90 you can give the second pint over 15 minutes usually if this is due to diabetic ketoacidosis per se then blood pressure level will the systolic blood pressure level will go up to more than 90. If it remains less than 90, this could be due to some other pathology going on at the same time, like cardiogenic shock or sepsis, so on. In that case, you have to ask for your senior opinion always. And when the systolic blood pressure is more than 90, how do you give? This is your medical student stuff. One normal saline, one litre over first hour, one litre over next two hours, one litre over next two hours, so on. So you have to add KCL from the second pint of second litre of a normal saline. And you need to add 10% dextrose, rate of 125 ml per hour uh, when the patient's blood pressure, uh, the patient's sugar level dropped to less than 250 milligrams a deciliter. So you need to add to normal saline. So when you are treating the patient, patient is already on normal saline. When it the when blood sugar levels drop to to drop less than two fifty, you need to add ten percent dextrose with normal saline. Okay, yeah. When it comes to insulin, when 
when to give once DK is diagnosed and only after fluid therapy is started. And you have to make sure your the patient's potassium is more than 3.5 before starting the insulin. If potassium is less than 3.5, you need to replace potassium first. How, what to give? Insulin, human soluble insulin. What is, how do you give? Here we give fixed rate intravenous insulin infusion. So we call it FRIII. So via insulin pump. What is the dose? 0.1 units per kg per hour. So how do you calculate? So according to the dose, this, uh, this uh, table shows uh, the weight and the dose of the uh, insulin, the rate. And how do you uh, prepare the insulin uh, infusion? You add 50 units of soluble human insulin into 49.5 ml of normal saline in a 50 ml series then you get the infusion then you can start the fixed rate infusion if patient is on long acting basal insulin already if patient is a known patient and on on long acting basal insulin like glargine diglodac determer or human is isoprene insulin twice a day uh, basal dose then you need to continue long-acting basal insulin at the usual dose at usual times. Is there an indication for basal dose, bolus dose? No, usually bolus dose is not recommended when you're managing diabetic ketoacidosis. It is only given, only, uh, the indication would be only if there is a delay in setting up FRI, that is fixed rate infusion is getting delayed, then only you can consider giving bolus. Otherwise, you are not going to give any bolus insulin. How do you replace uh, potassium? You all know uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis, patient might present with hypo or normal or hyperkalemia, but their body potassium level is low. Why? They are Washing out uh, the, the renals are uh, excreting potassium. Therefore, body so potassium is low. And again, another point is when you give insulin, there will be a uh, fall of serum potassium. Why? Insulin will uh, encourage potassium to go into the cells. Therefore, there will be low potassium when you replace, uh, when you give insulin. Yes. Uh, how do you replace potassium? Uh, add KCL uh, to one liter of normal saline. Uh, depending on the initial value, if it is more than 5.5, then you don't need to add initially. Then with repeated values, depending on the value, you can give add uh, 40 millimoles per liter. If it is uh, the potassium is between 3.5 to 5.5, 40 millimoles per liter uh, per, per liter. And if you're adding to uh, one pint, that is 500 ml, you add only 20 millimoles. And if it is less than, the, if potassium is less than 3.5, you can give additional potassium and you need to ask your seniors. Yes. How do you correct acidosis? Uh, usually, uh, the UAM is to increase your bicarb the patient's bicarbonate level by 3 millimoles per liter per hour. Usually, acidosis get corrected with adequate fluid replacement and insulin therapy. Is there a place for bicarbonate? No. In routine practice, when you are managing DK in a routine patient, there is no indication for bicarbonate. Take this message when you are managing patients. Okay, why? Why do I say so? Acidosis may be an addict adaptive response to improved tissue oxygen delivery and excess administration of bicarbonate may cause rise in the CO2 level, partial pressure in CSF. That will paradoxically increase the CSF acidosis and also may delay the fall in blood lactate and pyruvate ratio and ketones. Therefore, it is not routinely recommended. And how do you monitor? Blood glucose hourly, blood ketone, uh, or urine ketone, blood ketone hourly, but urine ketone is not useful for monitoring purpose and venous blood gas at one hour and then two hourly for pH. And depending on the 
availability of resources. These days, you all know the resources are limited. In that case, you may have to contact your seniors and you can tell them this is the, you can, you know, this is the uh, ideal in ideal setup. This is, this is what you have to do. But in resource poor setting, some investigations you may uh, not able to do. Okay, the laboratory plus my left guys will have to do four hourly. So other monitoring, uh, fluid balance chart, urine catheterization may need if a patient is not passing enough urine and you have to maintain urine output uh, around 0.5 ml per kg per hour. And you may have to consider NG tube insertion if patient is vomiting and comatose. And uh, if patient's uh, saturation is low, then may have to do ABG and put them on uh, pulse oximetry and monitor vital signs and look for complications of treatment. Yeah. Then uh, what are the precipitating factors? Could be infections, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, or lack of insulin, non adherence or not taking the insulin. So uh, precipitating factors, when it is uh, infection, how do you diagnose infection? And when there is clinical evidence of infection, uh, so evidence of infection, you have to treat for infection. In Like in our patient, patient has had some features such as a urine tract infection, you need to treat with antibiotics. But WBC, remember this, WBC is not helpful because it may be raised even without any infection, only with DK. And so how do you, what to give? Empiric antibiotics uh, is recommended broad spectrum antibiotics intravenously, depending on the uh, suspecting focus of the illness. If it is from abdomen or if it is from chest, depending on the focus, you can decide what to give. So these are the uh, severity assessment. If these are there, you consider them as severe decay and you need to consider level two care, HDU or ICU care. So what are the serious complications of decay? Uh, potassium, uh, problems, hypo, hyperkalemia, hy can get hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia and cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, acute kidney injury, other rare complications like rhabdomyolysis and GI bleeding. Yes, uh, the, due to the, the what, is, what is there, uh, there's a, a term called euglycemic DK. So you guys, in, in these patients, they would present with glucose level less than 250, but rest of the uh, criteria is uh, fulfilled. So they are, uh, they are, they are called euglycemic DK. If they are on SGLT2 inhibitors, they are at high risk of euglycemic DK. In that case, uh, you have to start with both normal, normal saline and 10% glucose at the outset because already their glucose is less than two, 250 at, at start. And they begin with 0.1 units per kg per hour. And if glucose falling uh, despite 10% glucose, you may have to reduce the insulin rate to 0 0.005. And when you're managing the uh, end stage uh, patient with having DK, so they might have high glucose level, high anion cap, and, but they, they are not that dehydrated because, because inability of osmotic diuresis, end stage renal disease. And they also can present with mixed picture of DK and hyposmolar coma. So those patients, uh, is there a, when you are replacing fluid, sometimes you may, you may not need to give them fluid, but uh, if there is uh, indication, you can give little, not like in uh, liberally, you can't give fluid, you can consider giving uh, 250 boluses when needed. So likewise, assessing the patient's uh, clinical condition. So insulin, the mainstay of treatment is insulin in a DK in end stage. So there you start with your usual rate, but if there is a risk of hypoglycemia, you can reduce the dose to half. Then the potassium, usually there is no indication for potassium because uh, they are already hyperkalemic. So depending on the level, you may have to decide what to do. If uh, there is hyperkalemia, you may need to do hemodialysis in those patients. So what are the uh, what are the uh, targets of metabolic targets when you're managing DK? You need to reduce blood ketone level by 0.5 millimoles per liter power, increase the venous uh, bicarbonate by 3 millimoles per liter power, and reduce capillary blood sugar by 3 millimoles per liter 
a liter per hour and maintain the potassium level from 4 to 5.5. Yes, so these are the uh, take home messages from DKA. There are three criteria to diagnose the priorities correction of fluid deficit. And until DKA is resolved, you have to continue normal saline plus or minus 10% extrose. And you need to continue fixed rate intravenous insulin infusion. And you need to consider potassium replacement and you need to monitor them closely and need to treat uh, precipitating factors and usually they resolve in 24 hours. So we are moving to the second case. So you get 70 year old woman uh, when admit, when uh, is admitted to a hospital, patient is unresponsive uh, and uh, she has been unwell for one week with generalized weakness and anorexia. Uh, when you uh, ask the patient, uh, when you ask the bystander, patient has had diabetes for 25 years on metformin and biphasic insulin. On examination, she was not responsive and GCAS was 11 out of 15 and blood pressure was 100 by 70 and saturation was 96. Lungs were clear, abdomen and abdomen was normal. There were no other focal neurological signs. Yes, uh, uh, IV, uh, the, like in other uh, the DK, we start uh, we can start them on IV access and start them on uh, normal saline. And the capillary blood sugar came as high index. The ketone bodies was nil, and blood gas analysis showed pH of seven point three five and bicarbonate of twenty four millimoles per liter. So what is the diagnosis here? So here, patient doesn't have any urine ketone, uh, and uh, pH is normal, no acidosis. Yeah, this is what? This is hyperglycemic, hyposmolar state. We call it HHS. So in definition, they have marked hypovolemia and they have increased serum osmolality and they have increased hyperglycemia, marked hyperglycemia without uh, ketonemia, without acidosis. Yeah, so... Uh, these are the differentiating features of DK and HHS. HHS patients are more chemotose, more hypovolemic. They, their sugar levels are very much high and ketone bodies low, less, and uh, pH is within normal, bicarbonate is normal range, and osmolality is more than 320, and they take up to 72 hours to resolve. And differentiating HHS and DK is more problematic in context of severe intercurrent illnesses due to they would have other reasons for acidosis like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors or fasting ketosis or any other uh, acute kidney injury or lactic acidosis. So what are the aims of management? Normalize the osmolality here, not like in DK, uh, additional uh, aim, normalize the osmolality, replace fluid and correct electrolyte imbalances, and normalize the blood glucose level. So how do you end? You need to treat precipitating factors. Uh, here, uh, the in big letters, prevention of arterial and venous thrombosis is important. Why? Patients are more, they, they have high osmolality, they have hyperglycemia, they are more uh, dehydrated. So the, uh, the risk of thrombosis is high. Therefore, prevention of arterial and venous thrombosis is important here and prevention of other complications and foot ulcerations. So what are the uh, management uh, uh, steps? IV fluids, insulin, potassium replacement, prevention of thromboembolism, close monitoring, so on. So when it comes to IV fluids, when to start uh, normal, uh, when to start fluid, as soon as DK is suspected, uh, Usually, the uh, expect, uh, estimated fluid loss is 100 to 220 ml per kg in DHHS because they are they are more dehydrated. Yeah. Uh, then what to give? Again, normal saline, 0.9 sodium chloride. Is there a place for half normal saline? Usually, there is no place. But initially, you need to resuscitate them with normal saline. Despite adequate positive fluid balance, if they are still having very high osmolality, then you can consider giving half normal saline. Otherwise, no. And initial rise in sodium is expected uh, 
when you are treating, but they, that is not a not an indication for half normal saline. So uh, how do you give first hour one liter, and you may have to give more uh, more fluid if uh, starting cystic blood pressure is than ninety, and uh, the, during the first six hours, uh, you, uh, you give 0.5 to one liter per hour and that uh, you can achieve positive fluid balance of two to three liters and you can achieve a positive fluid balance of three to six liters by 12 hours usually 50 percent of estimated fluid loss in 12 hours and remainder you can give during the next 12 hours and um, when uh, again just like in uh, dk when uh, blood sugar levels drop to 250 you need to give you start five to ten percent dextrose with uh, sodium uh, normal normal saline both together you have to give yes when it comes to insulin insulin usually the blood glucose is not long you insulin should be started when the glue blood glucose is no longer falling adequately with iv fluid alone usually you give them iv fluids then you check whether their sugar levels are dropping if they are Sugar levels are not dropping even after giving fluid resuscitation, then you start insulin. Okay, here you start with low dose insulin. And prior to giving fluid, if you start insulin, what will happen? They will get cardiovascular collapse. The here, the do, uh, the uh, how do you give the, here again intravenous insulin, a fixed rate insulin? The dose is less than DK 0 0.05. Okay. And uh, the differences are here you use low dose 0 0.05 and start insulin only after adequate fluid resuscitation. And precipitating factors you need to uh, check like in DK, if it is sepsis, you treat with an IV antibiotics. And if all patients should receive prophylactic uh, low molecular weight heparin for the full duration of admission. And what are the key messages? They have very high blood sugar levels, very severely dehydrated, high plus osmolality, and the gradual reduction of glucose and osmolality is important. Fluid resuscitation always prior to insulin, and normal saline is the preferred treatment. Normal saline 0.9 sodium chloride thrombophlegmatic is important to correct is important, and you need to correct and treat precipitating factors. Not like in DK, it, the resolution takes up to 72 hours. So this is the last case, 65 year old woman present to you. This is a common presentation with disorientation and abnormal behavior since morning. She's a known patient with diabetes, hypertension and ischemic heart disease on metformin, glibenkamide, losartan and losartan, aspirin and atovastatin in a drug history. So uh, she's even though a little bit confused, she is verbally communicating. GCS was 14 out of 15. Blood pressure was normal and saturation was normal. No other focal neurology. So what is the most appropriate immediate step in the management here? Yes, you check capillary blood sugar level. Yeah, so capillary blood sugar came as 55. So now what do you do? What is the most appropriate initial treatment? There are a few uh, options with uh, the dextrose in various uh, concentrations and uh, the all the a b c d all uh, all responses give intravenously the last response we give orally so what is your choice is it intravenous or is it oral replacement then what is the percentage answer is 25 percent dextrose 75 ml orally so I will come back to this, why I have selected 25%, why I have selected oral replacement. So hypoglycemia is uh, when blood sugar level is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, we call it hypoglycemia. Again, how to treat soon after detection? Uh, how do you give, what to give? If patient is conscious, cooperative and able to solo. If those all three criteria are fulfilled, then you can replace them with oral glucose like in our patient. Uh, the dose is 25% dextrose 75. If patient is unconscious, not cooperative and unable to swallow, if they we, if we, we have kept them nil orally, then you need to give them IV 
glucose. Yes, IV glucose, what is the dose? 25% dextrose, 75 ml or 10% dextrose, 150 to 200 ml over 15 minutes. The, the best thing is 25% dextrose or 75 ml intravenously. When you have selected oral arm, uh, so after giving the first, uh, first dose, you can check the capillary blood sugar in 10 to 15 minutes. If it is uh, more than that, uh, the required level, that is 70 milligrams per deciliter, then uh, if it's not achieved, then you can give the second uh, oral uh, glucose and uh, you can repeat it three times, three cycles. And if it is not going to recover, then you uh, automatically uh, change into the intravenous glucose. Yes. Uh, so once the blood glucose level has gone up to 70, if patient is, uh, you, if, pa you, if you need to keep them nil by mouth, then you have to continue with intravenous glucose, 10% uh, glucose, 10 hundred ml per hour uh, intravenously. And uh, if patient was on insulin before getting this hypoglycemic attack, you may have to reduce the initial glucose, uh, the insulin infusion level, and uh, you can uh, continue the IV insulin as well as 10% glucose, depending on the situation. And if, you, if patient can take orally, then you can give long-acting carbohydrate like 200 to 300 ml of glass of milk or any other normal meal. So in hypoglycemia, what are the key messages? Glucose, whether to give oral versus intravenous depend on the ability to swallow consciousness and the cooperativeness of the patient. Uh, you, when you're giving intravenous uh, glucose, dextrose, you every time you try to uh, have large pore cannula with large vein, but do not use 50% dextrose intravenously. Remember this in your ward practice. If patient has got hypoglycemia, don't give them intravenous 50% dextrose. It is very highly irritant and it is very difficult to give through the small veins. And uh, regular uh, monitoring is indicated even after hypoglycemia is recovered up to 24 to 48 hours and insulin don't omit next dose and relieve the insulin dose. If patient is on sulfonylurea, like in our patient was on glibenchamide this age, so you have to review the drug regime. Yeah, thank you. And this is my reference. If you have time, if you get time, you can uh, refer to these uh, guidelines, uh, the newly uh, newly uh, updated guidelines. You can refer if you have time. All the very best for your internship. If you have any questions, I can answer now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, still there. He's asking, he's asked for question. Absence of any questions, I think we can move on to the next lecture. Uh, Doctor. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shranga. Yeah, thank you. So I will uh, try to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra, a specialist in internal medicine at the National Hospital. Uh, so the topic I want to tackle now is uh, the essentials that you need for the medical internship. Now, actually, this lecture was planned for morning, but due to some unavoidable circumstances, it had to be shifted. Um, so um, I think you would have listened to uh, quite a few lectures on, on acute medicine. So I think you would have had the grasp of what's expected in wards. But let me briefly tell you 
uh, an outline of what is needed uh, for your internship in uh, general medicine. Now, the knowledge base, I think you all have. You don't have to worry about that. You, the final MBBS knowledge that you have gained is more than enough. Only thing is you may have sort of forgotten a few things. So you could refresh yourself with a basic textbook. You don't need uh, any uh, large textbook book for that. Just Kumar and Clark or Davidson should be fine. What is most important is the clinical application. I'm sure you'd have learned the clinical application during your professorial appointment. Uh, within those uh, uh, two months, I think you get to know uh, how the knowledge is applied in treating patients. But remember, the most important knowledge source is patients. So you will be learning on the job. So that is the thing that you have to keep in mind. Uh, and you have to be uh, very uh, uh, sensitive to uh, what's, going, what's uh, going on in the world and try to learn as much as possible. And you need a skill set, but don't worry, you already have those. You know how to take histories and you know how to examine and that's how you exam. So that will not be a problem for you. Uh, something important is ordering the relevant investigation. That is also a skill because you, you have to uh, uh, rationalize and ask for investigations. You know, in this current uh, state of things in the health sector, we have to be very... Uh, conscious about the cost factor. So you have to order, order the investigations in a relevant way. And um, more importantly, the, the procedural skills. So that is something that you're going to learn on, on your job. You're going to do, of course, you may have done certain things in the uh, professional appointment in your machine houses, but you get to know uh, how to do LPs, uh, parasynthesis, rural aspiration, and so on. So those skills you will be learning on the job, so we don't expect you to have all those skills when you come, but you should have a fair idea of how those things are performed. Investigations, now, the most important thing is that they have to be relevant to the patient that you're treating. So the investigation has to be specific as well. For example, there is no point in asking for liver function tests because you will be requiring certain uh, aspects of the liver function. So it could be just simply AST and ALT, or it could be PTINR, so it's something like that. So you need not ask for just, you should not ask for liver function tests. You must have a fair idea about the cost. Now, some tests are quite costly. So when you, uh, if you think that a test that is costly is needed, you should ask your senior and uh, see whether that is actually needed for that patient. Then the frequency. Uh, so that's also important. There's no point in asking for CRP every day. Maybe you could do a blood, full blood count every day, but not, not CRP. So you should have a, have a rational idea about that. The request form is very important. Now, this is one area where interns get into trouble with uh, lab uh, with labs because uh, there's a complaint often that the request form is not clear. Uh, the history is not uh, documented there. So it's very important that you write the request form well. And it would be a good idea if you could write those the previous day so that it would avoid the morning rush. And the other important thing is that you must follow up on the report. There's no point in asking for a report without you following it up. So, and it may be a very crucial investigation for the patient. And uh, if you don't follow it up, it may not be there when the water round starts the next day. Or, or, the, or the, on that particular day. Then always discuss with the lab and the radiology department. Uh, they are quite, uh, quite. Uh, uh, they, they, they welcome you. So in case of any issue, you could go to lab to to the. Document that you have asked for the uh, particular test in the BHT. Uh, come to uh, uh, the issue of how best to handle the BHT a bit later. So, but it's important that you you document that as well. I hope you can hear me. There was a slight break in the connection. Um, then, this is a very important thing that I want to highlight: the intern wardrobe. Now we all call, talk about uh, ward rounds, uh, the, the the major the main ward round 
on a given day, but the intern ward round is very important. That's, that's the safety net for the patient. So you uh, get to the ward early in the morning and then what you do is you, you have to see uh, the patients before the main ward round starts. So it's important that you prioritize. There may be many patients, there may be patients who are really sick and you, you would have to attend to those patients first. And then there may be certain chronic patients who, who you could see later. So prioritization is one very important thing. And the daily status has to be written down clearly, uh, especially uh, pulse, blood pressure, the saturation in certain patients. Uh, so uh, maintenance of daily status is very important. And then you must identify and highlight issues. Now, most patients uh, will have certain issues that are really troubling them and troubling the medical team as well for, for their care. So those issues you, you should be able to highlight because those are the ones that the main ward round is going to deal with. And order your investigations early so don't wait uh, 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 till late morning to order them. So order the investigations early. And as I said earlier, it's very important to trace the investigations done. For example, if you had sent an urgent serum electrolyte the previous night, if you don't check on that, that night itself or early morning, uh, you could be left with a, a disaster. It could be that the patient's uh, potassium was quite low or high and nobody would have known about it. The investigation report may also be lying somewhere. So it's very important that you, especially the investigation that you order on an urgent basis, you should check on the, on the uh, reports. And you must liaise with your seniors and also the nursing staff and the minor staff. Get to know their, their whole, uh, friends and uh, you, you should be able to get along well with them. Then the senior ward round will happen later. So at the ward round, you must participate actively. Now, depending on where you're going to do the internship, uh, you may even be asked to present uh, the patient's history. Now, for example, if it's a base hospital, it would uh, commonly be the intern who would be presenting the patient to the consultant. But if, if it's a teaching hospital, maybe the registrar would do that. But then you would also be asked for certain details. So you must. Uh, be attentive in the ward round. It's very important that you follow the senior ward round. Even if a registrar is there, you should follow the senior ward round. And um, you should listen carefully to what's being said, because as I said earlier, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of learning on the job. Uh, then uh, presentation of patients. So uh, feel free to uh, present the cases. You will not be penalized for making mistakes. So it's, a, it's an active discussion. What we're doing in the ward round is discussing the patient and uh, everybody's trying to get their uh, views in so that we could uh, come up with a plan to manage the patient better. And uh, so be supportive on the ward round, even to your SHO or, or, or the registrar. And the other important thing is that you must document everything in the DHO. Now that part you have to do. There's nobody else who's going to do the documentation and uh, your notes must also be clear. And you should make plans as well. You could also use a notebook separately so that you can jot down what, what is to be done for each patient. And always uh, clarify issues, question the questioning the seniors, even the consultant, there's no, no issue regarding that. Uh, uh, and it's always, I mean, you're the person who has, who has spent the most time with the patient. So you would probably be knowing about the patient much more than the seniors. So it's up to you to clarify if something is, is uh, something quite not quite right is being said in, on the ward round or something has been missed. So it, it's, it's your duty to uh, clarify and question. Now, this is one aspect I want to highlight, uh, prevention of medication errors. Now, uh, medication errors, uh, do happen on wards. And unfortunately, the wards are very, very busy. So these things would happen and they can be disastrous. So it's very important to identify what things, what how things could do wrong and try to uh, uh, minimize the chance of those things happening. So clear handwriting is very important because otherwise the nurses will misinterpret what you've written, especially in the drug chart. And uh, so that could have... Uh, 
pretty bad consequences. Write generic names, don't write trade names, and also the accurate dose, root and frequency. So those are important. And rewrite, uh, especially the drug chart, periodically. Now, uh, it's often seen that uh, you know, certain drugs are being continued sometimes without any basis. For example, the pa patient may be on, a, on an omiprazole -so and domperidone for, for more than necessary. So as the, the seniors may not have time to go to the drug chart carefully. So you're the person who, who's, uh, who has written the chart, so you should be able to find out and, uh, and question the seniors and discontinue drugs if they're not needed. And one other important thing is allergy. Now, that is something very, very um, crucial to the patient's management. The patients have lots of allergies to drugs, especially, and maybe even to food items and so on. Now, uh, and you must be uh, smart as well. I'll just relate an incident which happened in one of the major hospitals. Um, so, uh, for a, this was on a surgical ward. For a patient who had cellulitis, the patient had actually been uh, known to be allergic to penicillin, but the mistake the intern had uh, given IV cloxacillin. So he had, for some reason, forgotten at the point that cloxacillin also belongs to that particular group. So, and the consequences were pretty bad. So, uh, so it's, it's very important that you uh, think of allergy and also write in red. Uh, somewhere on the BHT, if a person is allergic, if a patient is allergic to a particular drug, and omit drugs at the earliest opportunity. I mean, whenever they are not necessary, when they are no longer necessary, you should stop those. And the other important thing is drug interactions. Now, uh, most patients are on multiple drugs, and uh, so those drugs interact, and uh, there are issues with uh, other things like electrolytes. So there's a complex. Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, interaction between the drugs, the, the, the patient's uh, system. So it's very important that you go through the drugs chart carefully. Now, in other countries, there are pharmacists who are on, uh, who are on wards, but here we don't have them. So the, the house officer uh, will have to perform that function as well. Unfortunately. But it's, it's, it's a learning, uh, learning curve for you. It's, it's good for you to uh, consider drug interactions and then uh, gets new opinion whenever uh, you're in doubt. And you must be very careful about prescribing to the elderly and patients with renal and liver impairment. Documentation. So that is uh, another very important thing. Uh, the BHT, the bid head ticket, is a legal document. So it's almost as a as a uh, as a document given by courts. It's, it's 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 a legal document. So you have to write on the first page uh, uh, very carefully. And uh, this is the document that is that will be uh, scrutinized by the ministry at a hospital inquiry and in a even in a court of law. And it's also important for uh, audit and research. Later on, you might want to do an audit, uh, uh, an audit and all want to do research. So in that situation also, the BHT becomes important. So the more detailed it is, the better it is. And that's our sole defense, only defense against potential litigation. So it's very important that you, you maintain it well and the intern medical officer, together with the other doctors, should, should have the responsibility. And what is done is only what is written. So there's no point in doing something and not recording that on the BHG. So that's a very common thing that happens at an inquiry. There may be a question and the doctors may say we did this, but if, if it's not recorded, uh, then uh, it is as good as not being done. So that important thing is when you make an entry in the BHG, uh, there are several things that you must mention. The date, so that includes a day, month, year, and time. Time is also important. The senior doctor's name with initial and your own name and the signature. So all those things have to be written at an entry. I know uh, on a rushed day, it might be a little difficult to do that. But still, if you if once you get into the habit of doing it, it's just a matter of uh, writing a few more things, few more letters. So it's not that difficult. So it's very important. and. Uh, 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 
there have, there have been inquiries where uh, health services and doctors have not uh, written the time correctly and uh, that had led to issues. Legibility is the other very uh, important thing. So I know it's something that you can't correct overnight, but if you, you, you could, I mean, if you could write uh, uh, clearly, that's, that's, that's a very important aspect. Now, communication, I know Professor Sarojaya Singh did a comprehensive lecture on how to talk to patients and all that. So just an outline, I would not go into detail regarding this. So you're the first contact doctor for the patient and you um, are the most uh, familiar person to the patient. So it, it's, it's very important for you to get a proper history and you will be the person who will dig out certain things which the patient may not tell the senior doctors. So uh, remember, you, might, you must explore the patient's uh, ideas, fears, concerns, expectations, because his, manage, his or her management will be successful only if you know the patient's concerns. Then breaking bad news, I think uh, Prof. Saroj, I think, dealt with this. So it's important. Of course, you could get senior help, uh, but if you're going to do it yourself, that's fine. But you, you should do it uh, in, in, in the proper way and uh, be very considerate towards the patient's uh, uh, view, the, the views of the relatives. Uh, so always uh, keep that person in touch. You could just hold the hand of the patient, reassure the patient. So those are very important. And handling of relatives. Now, that is one area where uh, the intern can play, the intern medical officer can play a big role. Because the relatives come in the uh, lunch hour, and at that time, maybe you may be the only doctor in the ward. Well, commonly others, senior doctors may also be there, but you may be the person the, the relatives uh, meet with. So it's important to just listen to them. They may have concerns, and mostly issues between relatives and the medical team happens happen when um, they have not been listened to. And sometimes the senior doctors don't get the chance to listen to them, but you do. So it's important to talk to them because the patient, it will, it will help the management of the patient as well. So uh, don't miss the chance to speak to relatives. And however busy you are, just uh, give us a few seconds of your time just to talk to the patient. Of course, if you are really busy, if you are attending to a very urgent patient, tell politely that you would uh, speak to the relatives later. And communication with the team is also important. So you must, uh, you must be able to uh, uh, talk to your team, uh, the senior doctors, the nurses, the minor staff. So that's also important. Diagnosis cards. Now, this is another area where sometimes some uh, internal medical officers uh, struggling. So in a diagnosis card, you must give the most likely clinical diagnosis. There's no point in saying investigated for chest pain, investigated for abdominal pain or whatever. According to what you have learned about the patient during that hospital stay, you should give the most likely diagnosis because that is going to be very, very important for subsequent uh, visits of the patient. I mean, it may not be 100% accurate. But that's the, your diagnosis at that time depends on the patient's symptoms, his signs, and the investigations available at that time. So it may later be proven to be uh, wrong, but that is a separate thing. The most important thing is that you must, uh, you must uh, give a likely clinical diagnosis. And uh, document the presenting complaint very, very clearly, because that's the most important thing in the history and the salient important things in the history as well, a uh, bit about the positive clinical signs, and then please write down the uh, reports of investigation. Now, ECG and chest X-ray. Now, imagine a patient who had come with chest pain and was found to be having left bundle branch block. And uh, if you didn't record that and the patient lost the ECG, the next time the patient presents to another hospital with acute chest pain, they would worry about the left bundle branch block and you know, their, their management would be affected. Uh, similarly, x-rays, because patients commonly lose those items and uh, uh, it will not be possible for you to uh, uh, get those reports. So important investigation findings you must write down. 
and sometimes serial values of blood tests may be the full blood count or whatever the serum creatinine, whatever serial values you got, you could document clearly. Um, then uh, highlight the specialized investigations. There are there are certain specialized ones like a CT scan or maybe uh, ultrasound guided aspiration. So some uh, specialized test uh, lumbar puncture results. So those are important things that you have to record because they will be very important in the subsequent management of patients. So the main management steps will have to be written down. And of course, uh, the intravenous, you may not, and, and the, uh, the, the intravenous drugs that were given. So you may not be able to do it on day itself. So I think it might, it's a good idea for you to start writing the diagnosis cards of uh, potential uh, discharges the next day. So you could uh, write them in detail and it would not be a, a huge rush on the day of discharge of the patient. And if there were any adverse reactions, allergies, and anaphylaxis to drugs given, please record that very, very clearly because that's vital information. And if patients are referred to other specialties or the consultants, then do make them, uh, do make those entries so that uh, subsequently your own unit or maybe another unit will know that the patient was referred to a certain specialty. The discharge plan should be there to be the discharge drugs. So you may have to use more than one card. So don't try to crowd in all details into one card. You could, you could uh, use another card or another, even two more cards and then uh, attach them properly. Um, these are going to be very important at follow-up clinic visits. Now, medical, a bit about medical clinics, of course, the duties will vary depending on where you are. In certain hospitals, uh, internal medical officers will have to run those clinics together with the uh, senior house officers. On in, in maybe teaching hospitals, there'll be registrars doing that, but you you will also be required to uh, uh, help out. So uh, it, it's important uh, to uh, to understand that the medical clinics are quite busy, and they actually um, uh, used to. Uh, uh, complete patients' uh, management steps because uh, there's a rapid turnover of patients involved who are very busy. So we sometimes do have to discharge patients a bit early than we'd like to. And then there are certain things that have to be done in the clinic, like say, for example, ordering for the investigation. So those have to be done in the clinic. Uh, and it's a good chance for you to see the progress of the patients as well. So when you see the, the follow-up patients, uh, uh, then you will get to know how they have... Uh, uh, progressed uh, under your treatment plan. And there'll be a clinical assessment, so always check the blood pressure and the important clinical things, and of course, the lab-based test. And get the senior's opinion on drawing up long-term plans. For new patients, new patients will be seen by them, by the seniors first, and then certain instructions may be given to you. And you will have to do the appropriate referrals across specialties. And of course, this is a good time to give good medical advice and instructions to the patients as well. So uh, the clinics can be busy, but there may be opportunity for you to meet relatives as well. And that's one uh, other instance when you get to meet the relatives so that you can get the help to and the management of the patient. A little bit about ethics now. I think you all know from your medical student days, uh, the ethical principles, autonomy, which include, includes uh, confidentiality, uh, informed consent, truth-telling. Beneficence is, uh, do, is, is doing good. Non-maleficence is not doing harm, injustice. <coughs> and sometimes these ethical principles can clash and there may be certain situations where you may have to get senior opinion on what to do, like say whether confidentiality has to be maintained in a certain case or whether certain information has to be divulged for the benefit of the society. So those things you 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 need to uh, 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 you may need to get senior opinion on, and uh, you may need to get informed written consent. So that has to be done properly, and of course there may be certain decisions made regarding. Uh, escalation or escalation of uh, of treatment. Certain patients, in certain patients who are not improving, you may de-escalate. So those decisions have to be taken. Uh, then there'll be uh, decisions 
uh, that need to be taken regarding end of uh, regarding resuscitation, so what we call end of life care. So those those of course you will not be asked to make decisions on by yourselves, but you will have to get your seniors help. Now this is very important. I think the the medical wards function if uh, only if you have the concept of team in the minds of uh, of team members. So it's 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 simply teamwork, and the internal medical officer, to my mind, is the most vital link in the team. So if there's a strong internal medical officer, there'll be a strong team. So that's that's very important. That's our experience over the years. So the mission of the team, of course, is to treat the patients well, uh, treat them optimally, and you must have good relationships with other members of the team, with your colleagues, uh, build trust and always seek uh, senior, senior opinion. And, and very important thing is to uh, have good relationships uh, with the nurses and uh, the minor staff because they, they will be doing things for you. You'll be asking them to do certain things, so it must be nice to them. And they usually help you out a lot. So uh, uh, I think you worked in professional rewards, you know the uh, concept very well. A little bit about internship in the COVID-19 era. Now, uh, unlike those days, uh, internship is a little bit more complicated uh, because of uh, the need uh, to wear appropriate PPE. Now, you will be guided by, by the Ministry of Health guidelines on this. Of course, I think you're a bit lucky that we are at the tail end of, of the pandemic, so things are not so bad right now. But still, there are certain things that you have to uh, follow you to wear masks, shields, uh, and of course, uh, hand care. Uh, those things are important and uh, be, be guided by the guidelines. And of course, one other thing, uh, uh, I, I think it's a good idea to get yourself vaccinated as well. May have your vaccination uh, up to date so that you will not be uh, uh, not be getting into unnecessary trouble. So finally, I think I've just uh, exceeded time a bit. So it's a, it's a, it's going to be a joyous time. You you must look forward to this because finally it's your 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 starting your first job, drawing your first salary, and remember there's a big team to welcome you. And I, I think we all uh, on all medical wards and all other wards for that matter, uh, we we do uh, uh, welcome you all. And we, we consider you, as, as I just said, very important uh, members of the team. So we'll be uh, treating you professionally. So, and you did not have any fears. And uh, uh, for anyone, I think uh, this would be uh, an experience of a lifetime. I, I can still remember my internship very well. So I think uh, you will, I'm sure at the end of the internship say that, that and maybe years later would say that that, that was perhaps the best time that you had because you develop uh, uh, close connections with your team members and, and you get to practice what you learn for so many years in the medical faculty. So I think I would stop there uh, and I, I would like to wish you all the best. And uh, 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 if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, so in the absence of questions, I think I would we would be winding up the program for today. Uh, remember, we'll be back with you uh, tomorrow morning as well. So please do join in, and because this is this program is very important for you to get yourself uh, familiarized with the with the internship that's going to uh, happen quite soon. Thank you, and wish you all. Okay. So, uh, 
join tomorrow at the same time at 7.45. So we'll start uh, the day two of uh, intermedicine. All right, thank you. Question. Uh,